Hello and welcome everyone to the 2022 Silverstone 500, the blue ribbon event in the Intelligent Money British GT Championship season. A 35 strong grid of GT cars is set for three hours of racing, but first let's take a look back to an action packed season opener at Alton Park. The new season started with a bang, quite literally for Richard Neary and Sean Balfe, who banged doors into the first corner whilst contesting the race lead, with the Mercedes eventually getting the better and leading the first half of the race. Back in GT4, Stella Motorsports' Audi was the race leader in the early stages, whilst in GT3, Alex Maliakin was grass-tracking at the first corner. The GT4 battling was very intense. Team Park Racing and Academy Motorsport would see an awful lot of each other, whilst Graham Davidson saw a lot of the Alton Park scenery with this spectacular accident from second place. The star of the show in the second half of the race, no doubt about it, was Jules Gounon carving his way through the field. Within a couple of laps of his stint, he made his way into second place and was chasing down the race leader, much to the delight of Ram Racing. Despite having his nose ahead as they start in the last lap, though, Gunon couldn't quite get the victory, and Sean Balfe and Adam Carroll got the race win in their Audi. It was Audi to the fore in GT4 as well, as Stella Motorsports' Richard Williams and Senan Fielding dominated to take the win. Adam Carroll delighted with his start to the season. Gunon and Carroll would resume their battle in race two from the front row, with Gunon getting the early advantage and leading the field through Old Hall Corner. For Phil Keane, though, things were not getting off to a great start. Contact with the two C's Mercedes at Old Hall Corner was followed immediately by more contact down at Cascades, sending the multiple race winner spinning and others scattering to the grass to avoid him. Sadly, there was no avoiding a DNF for Assetto Motorsport and Paddock Motorsport, whose GT4 cars were out at Shell Oils just before the rain arrived. Bang on halfway through the race, the heavens opened and cars started skating off the road. The 2C's Mercedes doing some significant barrier damage, while Sandy Mitchell collided with Marcus Clutton as the conditions got ever more treacherous. After a red flag period to fix the barriers, the racing resumed and it was immediately back into the action. Academy and Team Parker were again making friends. The Team Parker Porsche off into the gravel trap, the GT4 battling one of the real highlights of the day. At the front of the field, it was Ram Racing who won on the road, but with their success penalties added on post-race, Paddock Motorsport, who finished third, were classified the race winners. Back in GT4, it was the Century Motorsport BMW that came home victorious, continuing where they left off after a strong 2021. There are many new teams in the championship this year, but one of them stands out from the rest. After scoring points on their debut last time, Team Brit have high hopes for this weekend. This isn't your regular team, so Team Brit is made up of all disabled drivers. Uh, so that's a mix of uh, physical and uh, mental disabilities as well. So I'm a paraplegic and I use a wheelchair all of the time. And uh, my teammate has uh, very severe autism, so he's, he struggles with it. He get, has additional challenges placed in his life because of that as well. This is our first season in British GT, yep. First round was quite a learning experience, you know, coming to British GT school was quite a big step up from the championship we competed in last year. Um, we had a, a fantastic first race weekend of the year where we actually managed to get two second places in the pro and GT4 category. Where, where I don't have use of my legs, I, I as I said before, use uh, Team Brit's world lead, the hand control technology. It's a paddle that we use on the steering wheel. I operate that with my right hand. There's a paddle behind the wheel that I operate with my left hand to do the brake. And then we have uh, buttons in, just inside the steering wheel, uh, which operate with my thumbs, which go up and down gears as well. Some people you know, may, may say it gives you like a small advantage because obviously the dexterity you have in your fingers as opposed to your feet is, is much greater. But you know, I, I think, you know, as I said, it just puts on a completely level playing field to, to, be, to be on the circuit with them. Fantastic event, fantastic um, vibe here, you know. Made history last time out at Alton Park, you know, being the first all-disabled race team to compete in British GT. But not only that, you know, it's just amazing to be around so many competitive drivers. You know, this is the next step for the team. One more step closer to the ultimate goal of Le Mans 24. So, can't believe it. Absolutely looking forward to it, loving it. I suffer with severe autism, Asperger's and all that. We've got so many different types of people with so many different issues. So, like, one of the guys who competes in another championship in the team. He's um, got use of one arm. We've got a guy who's been in a motocross accident. He's, he's, he still uses the pedals and the gears, but he's not in a great shape. His name's Andy, he's a good lad. Luke is the guy with the one arm. We've got so many diverse, we've got drivers with MS as well. You know, so many diverse people with disability 
helps in the team and it's as motorsport is a level playing field with the team's fantastic hand controls it allows everyone able-bodied or not to compete on a level playing field because when when you put close the door and you're out on the track no one cares if you're disabled or not you're all doing the same thing and that's the beauty of motorsport in gt3 it's a welcome return for the 2018 british gt champions flick Haig and johnny adam while the championship is familiar to them, Johnny finds himself in very unfamiliar surroundings at the wheel of a Mercedes. Yeah, it's different, you know, first time in 11 years I've driven anything outside of an Aston. So, uh, but to be fair, with GT3 nowadays, the cars are all very similar in performance. So, uh, you know, the lap times are all quite close this weekend again. So it just takes a while to get used to it. And more importantly, it takes a while to just get the last little edge from the car. So, uh, but oh, so far it's gone really well. I think this weekend's the 97th race for me for British GT and all has been in an Aston Martin. So, yeah, this weekend's quite different. Uh, obviously driving a Mercedes this weekend, but um, really enjoying it. Enjoying the experience with Flick again. And obviously, we, we finished a great chapter, obviously, by winning the championship in 2018. It's just great to see her back out on the grid. And, you know, hopefully this weekend we could obviously learn as much as we can going into, obviously, a three-hour race. Um, but, yeah, the ultimate goal is just to get a, a good finish. Um, and the car's been going really well. You know, the team have been great, They're kind of welcoming them us into the team and, and really we've been working well together so uh, hopeful of a good result. I'm looking to do a full championship um, and I think that this year was an opportunity to get a few under our belt and see where I am and see if you know there's an opportunity maybe for next year to do a full championship. Obviously it's a new car for both of us actually so yeah there's some learning to do. The team's been great though and yeah we're, we're building towards a good, a good platform. Great to hear from all those drivers. And we are here at Silverstone for the epic Silverstone 500. It's glorious, glorious weather. And joining me on the grid to start this one, the voice, one of the voices, I should say, for the British GT, it's David Addison. Now, David, it is an epic, epic race at Silverstone 500, but what makes it such a, a big round, an epic round? I suppose one of the answers is that it's a great circuit, the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit. It's got so much to it. It's got fast bits, it's got twiddly bits, but also it's the strategy element of this. It's a three-hour race, but you've got to make three pit stops, and that means that the teams can be really creative on how they divide the three hours of racing. There's no pit window as such. Your only limit really is that only uh, the maximum time for one driver is 100 minutes, but there's more flexibility. So the brains trust up and down this pit wall really comes into its own in this round. Plus, it's a mega entry. You know, we've got well over 30 cars. We've got some guest entries, race by race entries, one or two names that we don't normally see on a British GT grid. Uh, it's going to be an awesome race. Yeah, 34 cars, 20 GT3s, 14 GT4s. You mentioned strategy. It really does come into play. We saw the team to my right, Barwell, doing something quite interesting last year where they had that uh, pit stop on the first lap. That's right, and they can win races from doing things like that. And also, you might, for example, put your gun driver in a bit light on fuel, but on new tyres to bring them back into the equation and compensate for that on a, another pit stop. So, uh, yeah, it's not just what's going on on the circuit itself. There's so much that's got to be considered in the pit lane too. And there's a lot going on off circuit as well. Let's quickly touch upon Alton Park then and that, that hangover, the legacy of Alton Park. Quickly talk us through what's going on there. Okay, so at Alton Park we had that red flag race. The success penalties accrued in race one were applied at the end of race two. Ram Racing won on the road, protested the result. The, the, that protest was thrown out on the day by the stewards. They have been given leave by Motorsport UK to uh, appeal to the National Court, but that has not yet sat in order to hear the appeal. So we can't have success penalties because we don't have a result of the first race yet to give them to the right cars so once the national court has, has met and it's confirmed the result of Alton Park race two the penalties from this race will be applied retrospectively yeah got that hopefully we'll, be we'll clear it up later <laughs> yeah we'll do a test later on now let's go and uh, chat to some of the drivers I know you want to do a bit of a grid walk so if we head this way and find Sandy Mitchell he was around and he's normally uh, quite quite good at being around oh there he is over there let's go for a quick walk and find Sandy Mitchell the pro driver in the Barwell car Sandy let's get a quick word with you if we can yeah. it's a lovely place to start this race isn't it pole position okay. and Absolutely. yesterday you put in an absolute blinder after Adam put in a decent stint as well in qualifying yeah definitely I mean Adam was right up the front of the 
jam session and it was so close uh, and tight, especially in the top five. I think it was just one or two tenths between them all. So yeah, he did an amazing job to be right up there. And then, yeah, it was down to me, pressure on. But um, no, we knew from FP2 that we had some good pace in the car in quality and uh, on the new tires. And I felt like we just absolutely maximized it, um, you know, driving and car performance. And uh, yeah, so that just all came. One of those sessions where it all comes together and uh, yeah, that kind of put us right up the front. So yeah, like you say, perfect place to start. And um, yeah, just got to see how the race pace is now and we'll give it a good go. Yeah, anything can happen in a three-hour race, as we know. Strategy is a big thing. You guys did something unusual last year. Are we going to see some curveballs from you? I know you won't tell me, but I... <laughs> oh, we'll see. I mean, uh, it depends a lot on what happens around us and um, if there's any incidents and that kind of thing. But, yeah, for this race, you always kind of come up with a plan A and a plan B, but normally that gets scrapped quite quickly. And, yeah, you have to just uh, react to what you see in front of you. So, yeah, it's the same for everyone. And, um, yeah, we'll be giving it a good go. And, like you say, strategy can be really important here with the three pit stops over three hours. It kind of um, leaves it wide open to pretty much do what you want, um, which, uh, yeah, can make it quite exciting and you never fully know where you are until kind of everyone's done that last stop. So, um, yeah, we'll be looking to, to be in the, fr in the front all the way around and, uh, yeah, see what happens. Well, best of luck, Sandy. There you go. David Allison is now going for a bit of a wander. David, who have you got? Well, let's start, Bryn, on the other side of the front row and let's sort of balance this out between the Lamborghini teams. Simon Leonard of Redline Racing is with a big grin on his face. You're very pleased, I would have thought, with, with Alex Malikin as well as James Dorlin yesterday. This is a really good grid position for your team. Oh, it's an amazing position. I mean, if you said to me, bear in mind, this is our first year in British mm. GT, uh, you're going to be on the front row of the Silverstone 500. I'd have said, yes, please. I'll take that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're here. You know, we're excited and. Um, Let's have a go. Yeah, but now the hard bit starts because it's not just on the track. It's your guys trying to understand strategy and outfox everybody on the pit wall. Yes, well, we've got a strategy and, um, you know, the guys have been practicing the pit stops, refueling. We're on it. We're going to be on it. Excellent. We'll see how you go. Simon, good luck. Right, I'm going to take cameraman Guy here for a wonder because one of the good things about this race uh, is that it is a massive grid. Uh, and the grid is also very busy, as you can see, because there are lots and lots of people, which is the other good thing about being back at Silverstone this weekend, because we are uh, with a full crowd. Let's thread our way, sorry, uh, through Mercedes land, go past James Cottingham, uh, and we'll try and stop off, if we can, at Sky Tempesta Racing, briefly, where Chris Froggart stands. Now, uh, Chris is a very welcome addition to British GT ranks this season, doing lots of races. Chris, can I interrupt you briefly? Um, another day, another Mercedes, another race, you're never out of the car. Yeah, no, I mean, it's great for me being new to the car. It's really nice to uh, drive as much as possible. Mm. And uh, I love Silverstone and not really an opportunity in the European Championships now to be here. So it's good. Excellent. Uh, what about Kevin? He doesn't know the circuit very well. Your co-driver, Kevin, say. No, I mean, but he's doing an amazing job, right? Qualifying yesterday <laughs> with him, for him was uh, amazing. And Alton Park also, a place he's been a couple of times and had good success. But I mean, he's just on fire at the moment. And he's showing he's a really good driver. Excellent. Good luck. Three hours of drama there for Sky Tempesta Racing comes. Let's try and find another Mercedes crew uh, because, uh, which way do we go? Let's go this way. Uh, number 75 is one of these race-by-race uh, -race entrants and back into the championship come Flick Haig and Johnny Adam. Now, they won the championship together and we've hardly seen Flick Haig since. And as for Johnny Adam, I need to have a word with you for cruelty to commentators because now you're making us use sentences without the words Aston and Martin. What are you doing to us? <laughs> Must feel really strange. It oh, does from it. the driving seat as well, <laughs> to be fair. No, it's, I mean, it's, um, it's nice to be back, first of all. It's nice yeah. to be racing with Flick. Yeah, last time we raced together was 2018 with the championship winning year. But um, it's different. It, you know, it's different to get used to the Mercedes, but it, it's enjoyable as well. So we're really trying to bank the knowledge today. You know, we're both improving as we, as we go on. I think, realistically, we could go forward from here, from P9. So, yeah, we're targeting a top five this afternoon. How's this deal come about? I mean, are you no longer part of Aston Martin's family? No, still there. Uh, still part of the family, and I have been for 11 years. It's just they've been so kind to let me and a few other drivers do little stuff away from the factory role that we've got. But, um, you know, it's been weird. 97 races in British yeah. GT, only in an Aston. So it's strange, but um, I'm happy to be here and ha happy to be racing this afternoon. Good luck, Johnny. Right, let's catch up further down the grid. Let's go back to Bryn. Yeah, thanks very much, David. I'm here with Senn and Fielding. We've given you so much screen time, it seems like, because, I mean, you guys have been unbelievably fast this weekend. To be fair, the team have uh, provided me and Rich with the car. The car's been faultless all weekend. Um, I think yesterday in qualifying, we managed to get it in the window, especially with these new Pirelli tyres. And, yeah, I think, obviously... That was only the start of the job. We've still got a long race coming up. Um, now it's over to the hard part. It's going to be a huge team effort. There's so many other things going on, and it's just a three-hour race. Um, 
obviously starting on pole, but a lot can happen in this race. So fingers crossed and fingers crossed we can get a good result at the end of the day. Well, look, strategy is a huge part of this race. We know there's no pit windows, but there are three mandatory pit stops. Yeah. Can you give us any inkling into your plan A, plan B, plan C and D? Like I say, there's so <laughs> many things that can go on in the race. You've just got to be quick to react to any situation, whether it's safety cars, uh, traffic with the GT3s and everything else. So I think we've got the best people around us to make sure they can have the quick pit stops. And me and Rich have just got to be on standby, whether it's quick uh, pit stop, driver change and whatnot throughout the race. So like I say, we've got our base plan and that could be changing on a lot through the race. So we'll see. Well, it's about to get started, so best of luck. There we go. Thank so we've you. heard from a lot of drivers just then and heard from a lot of drivers. Let's now hear from our commentator, Andy McEwen. Yeah, thank you very much, Brid. I'll tell you what, I haven't been this excited about a race for, uh, well, about three weeks, actually, since we were at Alton Park for what was a thrilling season opener. Uh, two one-hour races there, but this is the big one. It's the Blue Ribbon event, the one that everyone wants to win. We've got 30-plus cars uh, out on the circuit. The sun has come out at the perfect time. A big crowd. One of the greatest racetracks in the world in the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit. There is not a lot not to love here, really. This is uh, going to be a fantastic afternoon of racing. This is the venue then, the Silverstone GP circuit. As David was saying down on the grid, it's got a little bit of everything. Lots of fast corners, a fair few technical sections as well. But lots of these long straights down the Hangar Straight, down the Wellington Straight, where you can get a bit of a slipstream, have a go on the brakes into the next corner. So we usually see plenty of overtaking and lots of really, really good action. A spectacular circuit uh, to drive for the drivers. They all really enjoy it as well. I'm sure it's going to put on quite the show for us over the next three hours. Three hours of racing then, as they were saying, three mandatory pit stops. No driver in any of the cars can uh, complete more than 100 of the 180 minutes. But beyond that, you can pit when you like. And it's that uh, strategic freedom that really does make this race uh, rather special. We've got another three hour race coming up, of course, at uh, Donington Park next. But the Silverstone 500, always a special occasion there. David has uh, hot footed it through the gravel trap, uh, <laughs> up into the commentary box. Uh, you've caught your breath, I think. It might be the, your last chance to catch your breath for about three hours. It's going to be epic, this, isn't it? I mean, it absolutely, without having to think about success penalties in pit stops, it is an absolute what nots to the wall, flat out sprint in both classes and in all the subcategories, whether it's the Pro-Ams or the Silver Competition. So there is a huge amount to look for in this. It's a proper GT race, isn't it? Where, yes, there is a delta time for pit stops, but the strategic brains in that pit lane can make the world of difference. And that's what endurance racing should be about. Here is how they line up then. An all Lamborghini front row with Barwell Motorsports number 72. Car started by Adam Ballon on pole. Alex Valiakin alongside him for Redline Racing. Row number two then is an all Mercedes affair. James Cottingham's two C's Motorsports Car, you won't miss that one, with Richard Neary alongside, who led much of the first half of round one at Alton Park. Ian Loggy was uh, going well at Alton as well. He starts fifth for Ram Racing with Nick Moss alongside in the Optimum Motorsport car that he shares with Joe Osborne. Row four for Kevin Say in the Sky Tempesta Racing Mercedes and Assetto Motorsport. Decent effort that inside the top ten in the Sol Bentley. Mark Sanson at the wheel. Then it's Flick Haig returning to the championship. Alexander West for Garage 59 puts a McLaren 10th on the grid. Then outside of the top 10, John Ferguson for Ram Racing and Sean Balfe in the uh, car that scored more points than anyone else at Alton Park. The Balfe Motorsport Audi only 12. Morgan Tilbrook and Mia Fluitt have an all McLaren next row of the grid, row seven. Whilst on row number eight behind them, uh, we see Stuart Proctor in the Greystone GT McLaren and another McLaren of Nick Halstead for Fox Motorsport. Towards the back now of the GT3 field, Andrew Howard makes a welcome return, subbing for Kelvin Fletcher at Paddock Motorsport, whilst Betty Chen pilots the Century Motorsport GT3 BMW. Simon Watts next with Michael Igo. They didn't get out in the first part of qualifying yesterday due to a sensor issue. They will start 20th on the grid. Then into GT4, a dominant pole position for Richard Williams and Senan Fielding for Stella Motorsport. Marco Signoretti alongside in the Academy Ford Mustang. Josh Miller in the R Racing Aston Martin has Ross Wiley for company on the second row of the GT4 grid. Will Burns for Century Motorsport. Matt Topham for Newbridge. That is a car we'll talk about a lot. The leading pro-am entry uh, should be in the mix for the win come the end of the day. Tom Rawlings for Century. Freddie Tomlinson in the Assetto Motorsport Ginetta that he shares with Joe Wheeler. They are next. And then towards the tail end of the GT4 field, Jordan Collard in the Toyota Kazoo Racing UK Super, Jamie Orton in the Team Park Racing Porsche. And then behind them, we've got David Holloway's Century Motorsport, Aston Martin, and the Paddock GT4 car of Ashley Marshall. And then the back row of the grid is where we find uh, Ed McDermott, Motorsport Racing, and Aaron Morgan for Team Brit. 
Well, uh, that is quite the grid of cars, isn't it? What a <laughs> stunning sight they make as they make their way side by side, the sun glinting off the bodywork through the final couple of corners. Strap yourselves in, everyone. Make yourself comfy. Do not let your eyes wander from your TV sets for the next three hours because this is going to be one of the highlights of the season for sure. Adam Ballon on pole position for Barwell Motorsport. Alex Maliakin alongside him. It's likely that a Lamborghini will lead into Cops Corner, but which one will it be? Maliakin will want to try and get the jump here and escape at the start, but we know that Adam Ballon is a very experienced GT racer as well. It's going to be a real fight into Cops Corner. Look how close they get there as they come through Woodcote, waiting for those red lights to go out. The 2022 Silverstone 500, round three of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship gets underway now. Off towards Co Cops Corner they go, and it is going to be Ballon that holds the advantage. Maliakin will lose second, I think. They're four a rest in GT4 further back. That's never going to end well. Out of Cops we go, though. Ballon with the advantage, and look at the way that James Cottingham is on, it, on the attack. Going for second place, side by side with Maliakin. The Lamborghini on the outside line will hold on just about. Ballon leads there, Maliakin second, Cottingham third, Richard Neary there in fourth, and it looks like that's Ian Loggy holding on to fifth. So grid order at the front. And the most important thing in the sense, they all got through cops safely, didn't they, in GT3? Uh, we've had dramas on early laps in this race in the past, and GT4, despite, as you say, being four wide, uh, they all survived as well. Richard Neary then in the green, Abba racing Mercedes on the outside line of the yellow car. That has got James Cottingham at the wheel of it. Different teams, same base car, absolutely side by side. Richard Neary tries to go all the way around the outside at Stowe. It won't work there, but the road will come to him. He'll have the inside line for the next part of the racetrack into the end of Vale and he goes through and Loggy tries to get up the inside near he goes wide contact and around go both of those Mercedes oh. and Ian Loggy gets caught up in it as well this is what we rather feared on the opening lap and it lasted as long as club corner two Mercedes in strike uh, well three really because I'm sure that Loggy will have damage from that as well it was a big hit as he caught the rotating car in front of him and yes Loggy is slow down the Lewis Hamilton straight so Ian Loggy I'm afraid oh there's damage to the uh, that's the 76 uh, McLaren as well which appears to have a rear wing at a very odd angle so quite a few walking wounded halfway around the opening lap of the race uh, now let's wait and see whether those cars can all get going again if they can't then we could oh and that is a kevin say is it not in the yes. sky tempesta race mercedes not a good lap for the mercedes amg drivers absolutely right you took the words there he has to go <laughs> through the gravel to get back towards the circuit and again uh, Kevin say, what did Chris Froggett say pre-race? He's been on fire of late, but I'm afraid that is a copybook blotted. Right, so let's talk about other brands for a moment because <laughs> they have had a decent first lap. Lamborghini then leads first and second. It's Barwell from Redline. There is the wingless, almost, McLaren. Uh, Mia Fluid at the wheel of that car. That's going to have to pit. I mean, there's absolutely no question about that. And the two leading cars, and they've absolutely disappeared up the road because of all of the delays at club with the Eric Mercedes. And this is dreadful news for Ian Loggy because, of course, there's the Alton Park result with a question mark over it and points there that may or may not ever weigh. You can see the Neary's are still running and fighting back, but Ian Loggy's car is absolutely limping to the pit lane. Uh, somehow, Mia Fluid is still going as well and oh. did not pit. Oh, that dear. is the Cottingham car. That's going no further. Uh, it appears, though, to have... Uh, I think he's driven it as far off the track as he can yeah. so that we do not need a safety car. Um, uh, yes, there are not two cars in this race. There are over 30 entered, but you'd be forgiven at times for thinking it was just a, uh, an all land Lamborghini show here, Ballon and Maliakin with a six second advantage over Alexander West in third. He started 10th and he's picked his way through from the fifth row of the grid to be in third place at the end of lap one with Nick Moss for Optimum Motorsport next. Sean Balfe is there in fifth and still they battle on. And Kevin Say is trying to work his way through the GT4 fight, which is currently being led by this car, the Stella Motorsport Audi, Richard Williams at the wheel of it. This is his view. Now, of course, the GT4 car is that little bit slower, less powerful, less aero. They will drop away from the GT3 field, but, and there's the McLaren, another McLaren in strife, uh, the GT4 fight, very, very intense indeed. Richard Williams leading from Will Burns, the reigning champion, Josh Miller currently in third. Now, which of the McLarens is that that has parked at club? Because that's in a bad place. I think it's Fox Motorsport, potentially. I don't think that car came through on the first lap. Loggy is finally back to the pit lane. The car doesn't look that badly damaged, but the, the rate at which he hit the other Mercedes, it will surely have bent something in the right front corner. And the really, really slow pace that he's had to drag the car back at uh, would suggest that uh, he's worried about doing further damage. So he's in the pit lane, but with at least one car in a precarious position still, David, then we may... Oh, and that is... Would you believe it? Richard Williams from the lead of the GT4 category. They were dominant yesterday. I think I said words to the effect of if they have a clean race, they'll be hard to beat. Already on lap two, 
it's all started to go wrong for them. I can hear John Watson from Endurance Racing saying in my ears, calm down here, <laughs> because uh, it has been a frantic first couple of laps. So many front-running cars in trouble for various reasons. Now, Ian Loggy has made it to the pit lane, yes, but he's going to go a lap down, if not more than one lap down. And surely the team are going to call Mia Fluid in. And if the team doesn't, Bob Bassett, who is the GT Championship eligibility scrutineer, is going to want that car in because it ain't safe, surely. Uh, well, Mia Fluid begs to differ because she continues. She's being overtaken here by GT4 cars, which is not normal. That is clearly because she is uh, lacking quite a bit of rear downforce, you'd imagine, with that uh, loose wing. Uh, lest we forget, there's quite a good battle for the lead going on yes, here. Right. Adam Pallon and Alex Malikin, they've scarpered up the road, but Malikin on the previous lap was a few hundredths of a second quicker than Ballon. Now, early stages in the race, he's going to go for the dive on the inside. Don't make contact, they do! But a door banging Malikin goes through. This is a three hour race, right? It's not a 20 minute sprint. It's not three laps, no. <laughs> uh, so, elbows out, Alex Malikin goes through into the lead. Uh, Adam Ballon bounces off the similar Lamborghini Huracan and is down in second place. But this is only Alex Malikin's second season of racing. And not only has he hit the front and hit also Adam Ballon's Lamborghini, but he's getting away. Now, part of that is that in that contact, Adam Ballon was delayed. But Alex Malikin is absolutely storming away. Yellow flags wave up at the loop. Uh, now we go green, so there's a car possibly off the road there, just out of sight. So, dramas all the way around the first couple of laps. Alex Malikin has done the fastest lap of the race thus far. This was the move, down the inside. It was brave, it was late, there was contact, but from Adam Ballon's point of view, it could have been a lot worse. It, it could, definitely. He will argue, I think, that Malikin didn't quite make the corner. This will give us a better view. I mean, he's a car length or so back, signals the move early, goes to the inside, tells that Adam Ballon, essentially, that he's going to have a go, uh, and he does, and rattles down the side of the Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini. Uh, Bar, uh, Ballon, I think, very much aware that this is a three-hour race, and he's not going to win it on the second or third racing lap. So uh, Malikin then leads the way, first lead change of the day. This is what happened at the start. It already feels like a long time ago, doesn't it? Uh, down towards Cops they went. It was actually a pretty orderly start in GT3. Anything but in GT4. Look at that. Four wide action towards the first corner. Uh, but Ballon arrived at Cops Corner, leading the way in the GT3 charge. Briefly, James Cottingham uh, was actually fully ahead there of Malikin, but Malikin had a bit more momentum around the outside line, drug himself back alongside. There was a bit of door banging even there, I think. And again, from on door forward here with Ballon, we may see a bit more of that. Waiting for the lights to change. They change now. He goes up through the gears. Pretty even start, but he just had that small overlap, was just able to get over to the racing line. And Ballon, for that point at least, was the race leader. Now, uh, Richard Williams, that spin, just to pick up on that very briefly, contact with Will Burns. So uh -huh. the top two in GT4 making contact. Back to your start replays. Uh, right, OK, then. Uh, we'll uh, perhaps have another look at that in a moment or two. This is on board, meanwhile, with the 22 car, a bit further down the order. This is Sean Bell, who is currently fifth, but as you can see, was starting the race uh, right at the back of the top 10. And uh, this might show us a little bit of how he made so much progress. He comes carving up the inside into maggots. Hard to run side by side through here at the best of times, especially on low tire pressure on lap one. But Balf managed to make it stick. And then Kevin Say, right in behind Ian Loggy, who, of course, uh, his race, unfortunately, uh, did not make it any further than halfway around the last lap. But Kevin Say would later have his own spin as well at the loop. And it's just, you always think that Silverstone's quite a wide track, but when they all want the same bit of it, that's when the uh, trouble starts. And this is the GT4 view on board with Richard Williams. If you're wondering why he's already so far back, there has to be a gap it's in the regulations between the GT3 grid and the GT4 grids. Uh, this is losing McLaren number 40 and also the Mustang, uh, Marcus Signoretti in strife up at Stoke Corner. And this was the talking point of the first lap. So Neary on the inside, Cottingham on the outside. Here comes the contact. Now, that turns around the yellow map, but look at Ian Loggy to the outside, and bang, it was the front right corner, I think, that took the brunt of the damage. I fear Ian Loggy is out of the race, but uh, Brin is down there, and can have a word with Ian Loggy. Brin, he's all yours. Yeah, I'm with Ian Loggy in the garage. Uh, Ian, it was um, distressing for us to watch that, really, but for you, talk us through it. Yeah, I actually think I got a pretty good start, so it looks as if the race was going to be uh, calm down after like turn one, two, and three, but uh, I think people need to realise it's not banger racing and uh, turning people round in the first uh, uh, the first lap's just stupid. So that's what happened. One car turned the other round, and uh, I tried to avoid it and get collected and come out the worst. So yeah, uh, there we are. So the boys are working hard now to try and uh, put us back on track, see if we can 
I gather some points, but uh, yeah, really disappointing. Uh, really disappointing. So the idea is that if you can get the car back out, you can go for some points. It's not just going to turn into a glorified testing session for you. Yeah, exactly. So if we can get any points from today, then we'll, we'll be happy to take them. So I, at the moment, it's looking. Uh, it's looking pretty grim for points, but you never know what can happen in this race. You've seen what happened in five minutes with uh, a, that, that type of driving. And uh, yeah, there's another two hours and 45 to go, so anything can happen. Well, I know you're disappointed, but cheers for chatting to us. Not at all. Cheers. And Ian Loggy, of course, has come this year fed up of being the runner-up in the championship. He wants to win it. He understands the importance of points. That's been proved at Alton Park. And again, from what he was saying here, get back out. And if other people retire, they might salvage some points. Now, to nobody's great surprise, there is a meatball flag, the mechanical warning black and orange flag going out to Mia Fluitt, who is persevering with the wonky wing. Alexander West, who is a regular in Fanatec GT racing in Europe, uh, not a regular in British GT, but in third place in the McLaren. He's kind of best of the rest, Andy. He's over five seconds behind the leading Lamborghinis, but third in the McLaren, really good effort. Uh, and has actually got the gap down slightly, I think, to the leading Lamborghinis. It was over six seconds at one point. This time through, he's quicker than both of the two ahead of him, and the gap is down to five seconds. So actually, uh, he inherited a lot of free track position, if you like, on the opening lap. He's got the pace to back that up. Uh, Nick Moss there behind. Now, what's going on in GT4 land? Well, the class is being led by Will Burns. Uh, behind him is Josh Miller. This, though, is the Toyota up the inside of the number nine century BMW. That's the fourth in class, and uh, the Toyota uh, will go. In fact, the Toyota had been overtaken already by Tom Rawlings, and that was him getting that position back. There is your GT4 race leader. Speaking of GT4s, by the way, I did spot that uh, Jamie Alton has come in in the Team Parker Racing Porsche. That's an early pit stop. Could be strategic, of yeah. course. Uh, we, we have been discussing that as a possible strategy to use. We'll see how that one plays out. I think he's gone back out on track, but uh, pitting, uh, that was on the fourth lap of the race. So a very early stop for them. Josh Miller goes through in the R Racing Aston Martin number 90 then. Yes, as you say, Will Burns now leads in GT4, but it might well be after contact with the Audi of Stella Motorsport that that gets looked at over the course of the race. Uh, second in GT4, Josh Miller. Third then is uh, Jordan Collard, who goes through uh, first time out in this car. We've seen him in McLarens in GT4. Uh, Speedworks that operates the Toyota Gazoo Racing UK Supra is almost becoming Team Collard now because you've got elder brother Ricky driving in the British Touring Car Championship and then Jordan's uh, now now take oh. over and a puncher tire, I think, because the left, the right rear sits down through Beckett's and straight away Jordan Collard loses places and he's going to have to limp it back to the pit lane. But it just suddenly sat down on that corner, either a suspension breakage or a puncture. One hopes it's a puncture because at least that's fixable. I think I saw the tire off the rim, and of course, there are a few things that can cause that. We're early in the race. If you start uh, hitting curbs too hard when the tire pressures are low, then they don't like that. Also, a little bit of side-to-side -side contact, which is <laughs> understandable given the way the first few laps uh, went by. That could have caused it. Also, you'd imagine there's quite a bit of debris on the track at various points. So again, running over bits of carbon fibre, does the tyres no good? Will Burns is leading GT4. Will Burns is under investigation for contact with this car, the Audi number 42, and also under investigation for contact with number 61, the Ford Mustang that we saw in the replay from Stowe on the first lap. So, in other words, there are two investigations looming over the car that's currently leading GT4. And that story is set to rumble on over the course of the race. I suspect so. Right, OK. It might take uh, a while to work through all of the uh, investigations required uh, after the uh, opening lap skirmishes then. There goes Malik in, Ballon second, Alex West in third. The battle is about to be for fourth place, I think, because Nick Moss there in the Optimum McLaren has got Sean Balf and Mark Sansom and Morgan Tilbrook closing in. Uh, Morgan Tilbrook has come rocketing through the order, hasn't he? Because the Enduro car started 13th and he's just picked up another place because Sansom outbreaks himself at Stowe and so through will go the Enduro Motorsport McLaren uh, and that will now put Tilbrook into the top six. So uh, whenever there are losers at the start of a race, there are always winners and Tilbrook and Balf, for that matter, definitely gaining lots of ground early on. And of course, as this first stint unwinds, it won't be that long before Lapry becomes part of it as well. Uh, the other thing, just to briefly go back to Ian Loggie's travails, it's going to be interesting to see how long it takes to get that car out, because it's all very well going back out to try and score points, like the idea, but if they don't do enough of the distance, they're not going to be classified, and therefore points do become academic, and it does become what Britain was suggesting, just a big test session for them. Right, this is the view coming out of the loop into Aintree, speed building all the time at this part of the circuit. Right, let's have uh, more news from the pits. Bryn, what have you got? 
Yeah, thanks, David. I'm here with Toyota Kazoo Racing. They're going to get the car in now. They're not sure what caused the suspension failure, they think, but they are going to check it as soon as it comes in. They're not sure as to the cause or to what they're going to do about it, but I can tell you that Tom is going to get in the car no matter what. OK, brilliant. Well, the car is in now, so Jordan Collard has brought it back as rapidly as he can, but uh, while it's good information, I'm a little bit more worried now that you tell us it's suspension rather than a tyre, but, um, yeah, that's a, a, a big blow early in the race. Uh, it is indeed. Uh, right, Morgan Tilbrook uh, is looking to gain even more ground here, right on the tail of Sean Balfe for fifth position. Uh, we know that Audi is not an easy car to overtake. Just ask uh, Shul Gunon, uh, as he was driving past Adam Carroll late in the day at Alton Park. Tilbrook closing through Kopf, but then loses a bit on the exit. And this is the fascination uh, that David was talking about earlier on. Certain cars will excel in certain areas of the track uh, and perhaps fall back in others. There is the Toyota. There is the right rear corner. Tyre is off rim, but of course, a Suspension failure could lead to yeah, that, absolutely. I guess, couldn't it? Yeah. So um, they're going to fuel the car, get all of the mandatory pit stop bits un out of the way. So as uh, Bryn said, they're going to conduct the driver change as well, then start investigating what exactly happens to that right rear corner. I mean, until the team gets the car into the pit lane, its information comes from the driver. And it may have been Jordan saying, feels like the suspension's yeah. gone because that's how sudden it all went. But if it is purely a tyre, then that car can be back out and running with obviously far less time lost. So fingers crossed. Uh, the start was being looked at, but there's no further action about that. There's a whole raft of investigations going on, which is keeping uh, the uh, race control team and the stewards occupied. And we have Alex Malikin still leading from Adam Ballon. Uh, in third place, Alexander West in his McLaren. In fourth is Nick Moss McLaren. Fifth, Sean Balfe Audi. Sixth, this car, Morgan Tilbrook McLaren. Seventh is the Bentley, Mark Sansom. Eighth, Michael Igo. Now, unnoticed, that's been good progress from Michael Igo from the back of the GT3 grid. Ninth is John Ferguson's Mercedes, and tenth is Flick Hague's two C's Mercedes. Yeah, I would call 12 places gained inside the first seven laps. Pretty good progress for yes. Michael Igo. 20th on the grid, he started. Right, here comes the fight for fifth place. Tilbrook forcing Balfe to defend, tries to go right round the outside. Uh, Brooklands, now you can make that work, but it's a risky move to try and get the inside through Luffield. In the end, he bails out of it. Balfe holds on. Morgan just rolling through the centre of the corner a bit more quickly, but then he gets in the toe, coming off the corner. Flat out now through Woodcote corner. Less than a car length between the two of them. Balfe will again have to defend into Cops corner. And this perhaps could be Tilbrook's opportunity because the wide line into Cops will surely yield a bit more exit speed. Look, he takes the late apex. Balfe runs a little bit wide over the curve, but actually comes off the corner a little faster than the McLaren. It can be difficult to uh, follow uh, another GT3 car closely through the high-speed corners. They generate so much downfalls these days that dirty air has just started to creep in a little bit, and maybe that's where Tilbrook uh, was struggling through the high speed right hander at Cops Corner. He'll be keen to get on with this though, because he's clearly got good speed, but he's in clean air. He's one of the fastest drivers on the track. Uh, word about Richard Neary as well, 12th he's just got up to. So Richard survived the um, schmozzel down at Club on the first lap. Another word for Kevin Say, after his self-induced spin elsewhere on the first lap, he's got himself back up into 14th. So those two cars, I think, are going to be worth watching over the course of the three hours now to see what they can buy back out of a pretty poor start. Yeah, I agreed. I mean, Richard Neary is 29 seconds off the race lead. Say is 35 seconds off the race lead. So that's a, a big ask for the win, but a top five or six finish definitely uh, is not a bad shout. And for the Nearys, especially Team Abba Racing, you know, hoping to contend for the championship this year, any points they can salvage uh, will be gratefully received. In fact, Richard Purple in the first sector on this lap, fastest of anyone through the first few corners, uh, keen to make up ground. Now, losing ground there was Nick Moss as he tried to get up the inside of the Team Parker Racing. Porsche Cayman, which still isn't moving out of the way. It is not expected to move out of the way. It's the job of the faster car to make the overtake, even if it's not for position. Only now does he get alongside, but look at the ground. That costs him to Belf. So down they come, down Wellington Strait. The Cayman hops out of the way. Sean Balfe tries to weave through traffic, gain a place, defend the place. It's all happening. And the vast experience, very quick. Sean Balfe then heads up towards Luffield. The Audi that won the opening race at Alton Park comes now up through Luffield. Sandwich between the McLaren. There is a 12 second stop go penalty being given to number 65, which is the Alton Hopkins Cayman. So a 12 second stop go penalty being applied to number 65. They just pitted, and normally when it's a slightly random number like that, it's because of too short a pit stop, isn't it, by 12 seconds or so. But that is a, a lot to misjudge the pit stop time by. It is a long pit lane, of course, and that uh, minimal pit stop time includes pit entry and pit exit, so there's maybe a bit of scope to get it wrong, but uh, I can't think of anything else. And it was a genuine regulation pit stop right. in as much as they did a driver change. Yes. So, 
yes, it looks as though that is potentially the reason you arrive, that it's under the pit stop delta time, which for a GT4 car is 165 seconds, and if you're a silver uh, pairing, and they are, there's another 14 on top of it. It's almost like they forgot the 14 extra seconds. That's not a bad shout, actually, yes, because that, that yeah, 12 second penalty. OK, I'll go with that. Right, uh, back in traffic. Uh, they're going to be in traffic much of the rest of the race now, the GT3 cars, uh, because uh, obviously there was quite a separation already between GT3 and GT4. And now there is absolutely no separation between Morgan Tilbrook and Sean Balfe. Tilbrook up the inside through the second part of club. Balfe having none of it. Uh, that nice uh, runoff area has gone from the exit of club as well. So you need to get things sorted out a bit more quickly. Otherwise, you could end up in the gravel trap. They avoided contact, but only really because Tilbrook very rapidly uh, retreated from that ever-closing gap. So the Audi stays in front. This, I remind you, uh, the fight for fifth position at the moment. Uh, fastest lap of the race for Richard Neary. Not that surprised about that. He's running down in that 12th position. That at least tells us that the Team Avocar is undamaged after yes. that collision. But the one surprise is that it's not Malikin doing that with clear road ahead of him because Richard Neary has spent most of his time battling through traffic as we dart down Wellington straight now. So Tilbrook tries to come up onto the outside of Valve there. This is the fifth place. They're absolutely side by side into Brooklyn. Audi on the inside, Morgan Tilbrook on the outside. And how much has Morgan Tilbrook come on in the last 12 months or so as a driver for not starting the opening round of last year's championship with a spin on the formation lap to winning at the end of the year and now taking the fight for a place in the top five to Sean Balfe, who is vastly experienced, nose to tail, almost side by side. Adam Woodcut down towards Cops Corner, Tilbrook on the inside line, breaks as late as he dares, sends it up the inside, goes through! The McLaren is fifth, and Sean Bell slots in in sixth spot behind him. Not bad for a man who only started racing anything about three years ago. I mean, a real racing rookie he was when he jumped into the Funk of Endurance Championship uh, and then moved very rapidly into GT3 racing. He missed, he skipped the whole GT4 step, went straight into GT3, and here he is, one of the most impressive AM drivers, if you want to call them that, uh, out on the track. So you're right, he's into fifth place then. Now watch his pace, because he's only a second or so behind the orange and blue Optimum Motorsport McLaren, and that would be for fourth. I reckon it's not going to be that long before the Enduro Motorsport driver is right on the tail of the fourth place car. We need to come up with a better word than AM, don't we? Because it's almost being offensive to them now, because these are a very high quality group of drivers, even though in certainly GT3 parlance, they are class as they am, but uh, they're all operating at a very high level. Alex Malikin, then the race leader from uh, Adam Ballon. The incident involving all those Mercedes on the first <laughs> lap at club is going to be looked at after the race. There's so much else going on. Uh, there'll need to be uh, lots of different camera angles studied, and so that's going to be reviewed after the race. But for the moment, uh, Ian Loggy has been in the pit lane for 18 minutes. Uh, yes, indeed. So, uh, as you say, they need to complete a certain number of laps, but if he gets out inside the first hour of the race or so, I think he should be OK. Uh, there is the overall race leader then, Alex Malikin. And there is the second place car. We briefly saw Malikin just ahead of him. Adam Ballon still giving chase. 1.4 seconds between them. The gap ebbing and flowing slightly as they work their way through the GT4 traffic. One car, though, that they will not have to overtake on track is the Stella Motorsport Audi, which pits. So this is a pit stop. Uh, how far into the race are we? We are about 22 and a half minutes in, and the car that, remember, started on pole position in GT4, the Audi of uh, Richard Williams, is in for its first mandatory pit stop. There it is, up on the jack. Senn and Fielding runs over. Clearly, this is a planned pit stop. Uh, it is uh, one of the real fascinations of this race, as we've spoken about a lot. You don't just pit at the end of every hour, as you would in uh, some European uh, three-hour races, for example. You can kind of get one of those pit stops out of the way whenever you feel is best to do so. And this clearly is when Stella thought it was the best time to pit. And I think I've just seen Richard Neary come in as well. So uh, others taking this early stop. Quite often, the teams <laughs> hope there's an early safety car and that the kind of plan is we'll get one out of the way for free if there's an early safety car. That has not come. So now they have to go to the next page of the handbook uh, and try and work out how best to play this strategy. Of course, Silverstone, one of the good things about it is that as a modern day Grand Prix circuit, there are lots of access points to clear cars out of the way, lots of runoff area. And so safety cars actually not as common here, for example, unless a car is on the racing line as it would be at, say, an Alton Park or a Brands Hatch. Uh, yes, indeed. So it does tend to run un uninterrupted, this race, but uh, you never know. Certainly given the chaos that ensued on the opening lap of this one, wouldn't have at all been surprised uh, to see the safety car out on track. Right, Morgan Tilbrook on previous lap did a 2 minutes 1.8. That was almost exactly one second faster than the car ahead. In fact, the car ahead of him is no longer Alex uh, Nick Moss because he's already passed him. The team manager of the leading car is being summoned to race control. Oh, dear. So for Redline Racing, 
is this because of the contact on the Barwell Lamborghini down at the end of Vale? We will find out. So there's now a question mark over the leader. Adam Ballon runs second. Third and fourth gap is coming down between Alexander West and the charging Morgan Tilbrook, who's made short work of Nick Moss. Sean Balfe is down in sixth place. There is the pit stop for the uh, Stella Motorsport Audi. Remember, this is two minutes and 45 seconds plus 14 because they are a silver, silver pairing. And those 14 seconds were applied on each pit stop. Yes, which is one of the real uh, oh. points of interest. Now, that is uh, the Ram Racing Mercedes going back out. Uh, may still be in logging at the wheel, I suppose. That will update as he leaves the pit lane. So, uh, Brina was saying that they expected it to be about a 30-minute repair job. About 20, 25 minutes in the end was, well, we're 25 minutes into the race. They've had about 20 minutes to fix that and send it back on its way. It's a bit of a tank tape special, but he's back on track. Yeah, just under 21 minutes was the actual pit stop time for right. the... Um Ram Racing, Ian Loggy, Mercedes, and Callum McLeod has taken it out, so they've done a driver change, so Callum now tries to bring that into the mix. It is the incident with Barwell that is being looked at, we understand, for the race leader. Uh, more of that and on. As you see, 28 go through Nick Moss. Uh, Richard Neary is given away to Sam, by the way, in the ABBA racing car. So, because of the early dramas, they're, if you like, playing their own furrow now, trying to get back into the equation as the Marco Signoretti Mustang tries to fend off Aston Martin, but is lapped in the process by Nick Moss, who goes around the outside. Doing a decent job because Nick's not the most experienced racer. He's got Sean Balf in the Balf Motorsport Audi bearing down on him. Uh, that was actually a change for fifth in GT4. That was Matt Topham losing out to the recovering Signoretti. That Mustang has been fast all weekend yeah. long. And with those early dramas for Stella, they'd have liked to have capitalised on that uh, and uh, got into the race lead. But of course, they'd already had issues of their own. And now Matt Topham comes back at Signoretti down the Lewis Hamilton straight. That all going on just behind some of the leading GT3 cars that have made their way past the GT4 field for the first time. What a different picture it is out front as Alex Malikin has cleared the GT4. As you can see, the next car behind the Lamborghini is your leader in the GT4 category. That's still the Century BMW of Will Burns. Adam Ballon goes up the inside of him. And you can see uh, in a moment or two the gap there between Burns and Josh Miller behind him in the R Racing Aston Martin, which at the start of this lap was 1.7 seconds. Looks very similar as they come to the end of lap uh, 12. Interesting to see this lead gap, isn't it? Because initially they, having traded places, ran together. 23 Astons going to the pit lane, look at the background. But Alex Malikin now is being able to pull away. Now, whether somebody has said into his ear, we might need a bigger gap here because we might be called in for a penalty. I know not, but it's possible. But Alex Malikin, all of a sudden, to stretch that margin. It's gone up to 4.6 seconds. The other side of the coin, Adam Ballon might be struggling with any damage picked up after that uh, robust pass for the lead. 23 is in, Andy. Uh, yes, it is. So this is uh, Josh Miller handing over to Jamie Day, uh, two of the uh, real youngsters in the uh, British GT Championship this year. John Ferguson trundles past in his two-seas motorsport Mercedes to hand over to Jamie Caroline, who had quite a nasty off in the rain at Alton a few weeks ago. Uh, you're right, though, uh, Adam Ballon's car, I and mean, it looks OK. It's not crabbing at all. There's nothing hanging off the Barwell Lamborghini, but uh, if something has been knocked slightly out of alignment, that might possibly explain things, and, of course, might lead to excessive tyre wear as well, which deeper and deeper into the stint will start to show. A good view here of uh, some of the gaps uh, separating both the GT3 and GT4 cars. Tom Rawlings there uh, in the Century Motorsport uh, BMW, uh, the uh, Harriet Chariot car, carrying the sponsorship from... Ainsley Harriet, who was at Alton Park enjoying the day in the sun. He's a big fan of the British GT Championship. And uh, that car, at the moment, running reasonably well, third in class. Yeah, he just needs to keep out of trouble, doesn't it, to get to the end and back some good points. He's just got a, a place down on the road, being lapped by Michael Igo, who's got the number 18 WPI Lamborghini up into ninth place now. And again, that's another car just having to get on with its own programme, being way, way back on the grid. Flick Hague, they're just going out of shot with the blue Mercedes. Um, Game, ready to hand over to Johnny Adam. Flick's done precious little racing since she won the championship with Johnny, what, four years ago now. Time has flown by rather scarily, uh, so it's good to have her back on the grid as Ross Wiley here in the Beluga Racing Cayman heads into the loop, third in GT4. This is the car that he shares with Carrera Cup GB Championship leader Matty Graham. This is a really strong partnership. Uh, yes, it is. They are fourth in class, make that third now with the pit stop for our racing, so they're uh, yeah, running at the right end of the grid, that is for sure. There go the leading two with um, the uh, 
Ram Racing, Mercedes, they're closing in behind now in the hands of Callum McLeod. This then the fight for what is third at the moment. This gap continuing to come down. Morgan Tilbrook, this deep into the stint, we are nearly half an hour in, um, are still setting uh, personal best lap times. Tilbrook, the only driver really in GT3 to still be setting PBs. The race leader, Alex Malley, can head down the hangar straight, but David, we are starting to hear rumours of an incoming penalty. We understand that a stop-go penalty is going to be applied. Uh, so confirmation will come shortly from race control of that once the information goes on the screen to all of the teams it is official so Alex Malikin is going to get a stop go penalty but uh, it, it is for the incident at this part of the circuit uh, against Adam Ballard no time being applied to it it is a stop and a go rather than stop for a, a time but it was a gap that was it was sort of there but I think in fairness Alex Malikin was committed to the corner he had to try and get around it but the net result was it was a robust pass for the lead and he has certainly been able to gap Adam Ballon since but the stop go penalty because it's a long old pit lane here is going to throw him right back in the traffic and it will feel twice as long when you're doing 50 kilometers an hour which is a snail's pace compared to the speeds they're carrying on track uh, the, the saving grace I guess for red line is that they are yes five seconds ahead of Ballon but they're 12 and a half ahead of third place so uh, you know if the pit stop or the, the stop go penalty loses them maybe 30 seconds they could still come out just at the back of the top 10 which is not the end of the world we're two and a half hours from crowning a winner in this race yet so there's time to get back into this that is for sure uh, if i were them i would be pitting as soon as possible get that out of the way get back out on track and uh, continue to uh, get his head down he's clearly got the pace uh, to uh, start recovering some of that deficit yeah you've got what three passings of the timing line once it's official on the screen so it is this is the first and uh, now simon leonard and his merry men will give the news uh, alex malikin presses on goes down towards Cops Corner but hopefully he'll be in next time another good element of this we talked uh, touched on it in qualifying is the fact that Alex is actually racing because last week he would have been at Brands Hatch but was really really poorly all weekend high temperature and had to sit out the weekend uh, but it's good that he's on track now 5.6 seconds is the lead gap but Adam Ballon will get the lead back on that penalty uh, behind Alexander West has been reeled in by Morgan Tilbrook it was 0.367 of a second when they went across the line Morgan Tilbrook, he's on fire. Yeah, this car ran well here a year ago, but Marcus Klupp was involved in a bit of contact in uh, one of his final stints in the race. It was his final stint in the race, and uh, that took him out of contention this time around. Though Morgan Tilbrook is proving himself, I think, to anyone that doubted someone with three and a half years of racing experience could compete in the front of this championship, a championship that gets more competitive every year, and yet here he is charging after Alexander West, who's got quite a bit more experience than Morgan. They're both in the same car, both uh, McLaren 720S is run by different teams, of course. Garage 59 for the car ahead. The car we're on board with his run uh, by uh, Morgan's team that he uh, co-runs with his co-driver, Marcus Brooklyn, Enduro Motorsport. And it's clear at the moment which of the two is the fastest. Um, for the back, by the way, Sean Balfe has just pitted for the first time in the uh, Balfe Motorsport Audi to hand over to Adam Carroll. Uh, and we're also hearing that the uh, incident involving the Academy Mustang is going to be looked at after the race. Right, so uh, before this all kicks off, thoroughly on track, the fight for what will become second place. Uh, more news from the pits with Brim. Ah, well, we will uh, get in touch with them in a moment or two if we can. For the time being, let's continue to watch this battle develop for, uh, for second place. Tilbrook uh, has caught West. Where does he make the move? It's imminent, isn't it? He's creeping up onto the back, but Alexander West, yes, more experienced, but not by that many years. Uh, he has uh, certainly become a very, very rapid aim. He's got a lovely collection of cars as well, Alexander West. He's one of the investors within Garage 59. It's his, Andrew Cagotti and Chris Goodwin's team. As 42, Senan Fielding then comes up to attack now, number 23. This is for position. Uh, they were 27th and 28th across the line, and the Aston Martin was ahead, tries to stay ahead down at the end of Vale, and uh, goes through them. So back ahead goes now Jamie Day, and this is significant that he's being able to get ahead and stay ahead of the Audi of Senna Fielding, who we know is by no means slow. Now he goes to the inside, Senna Fielding. This is heading up towards Abbey. He gets, gets the place back on the inside line. Yes, job done. More experienced a driver is Senna, and he's done it. He's gone by. Uh, there's another yellow flag incident that's going to be looked at after the race. One of the cars involved in it, as you see the Audi hanging onto the place, is number 91, which is Betty Chen. And the other car involved in the yellow flag incident is number 8, which is the Neeris. 
indeed. Right, side Third. by side for second place, well, third place at the moment, yes, to the outside Tilbrook, to the inside West, he's hanging on. Uh, Alex Malikin also hanging on to the race lead here, hasn't yet been in to serve this stop-go penalty. He will surely have to come in this time now to the inside goes Tilbrook. It's all gone wrong here before when people have tried this overtake. Thankfully, Tilbrook pulls it off though. He goes into third place. Alex West, I don't think, fought that too hard. And so the Enduro car does now move through into third on the road. But as we've said, once Malikin does come in for the stop-go, this will become the fight for second. They are about five seconds behind Adam Ballon. Uh, credit to Alexander West for that because he mm. could see that Morgan Tilbrook was catching him. He knew he was quicker and he also gave him racing room and therefore did exactly the sensible thing. I can't hold him up forever. I'll let him go. I'll avoid contact. We've still got over two hours and change remaining in the race. Uh, and that's exactly how it should be done. You know, so the quicker car goes by, yes, but Alexander West stays in the fight. Uh, and that car will remain in contention, I would have thought, to the very end of the race. Alex Malikin continues to lead. He's not yet been in for this stop go has he yes he has he has now been in so uh, he led into the pits but he will not lead at the end of the next lap so the stop go has been done as you see number 90 another car with damocletian investigations uh, surrounding it and it is will burns at the lead of this gc4 leading century bmw uh, yes academy and stella motorsport by the way will also be investigated after the race for uh, a yellow flag incident so uh, even after the checkered flag falls there will be lots of uh, lots to be shaken out uh, to give us the final result i suspect for this race in uh, GT4 land though, still some good battling going on. This is Tom Rawlings in the number nine BMW, Ross Wiley in the number 51 Porsche. It is for second place in GT4. They are some 18 or 19 seconds behind the race leader in GT4, which as we say, is, has this uh, investigation pending. Uh, so that may well change as we get further into this opening hour. But a good battle here and the Cayman seems to have decent race pace. So every time we see Ross Wiley, he seems to be on the attack. He seems to be making progress. He does indeed. I'm a little bit worried about the Nick Halstead, Jamie Stanley McLaren because that's done its first regulation stop and was under by something like 46 thousandths of a second. Um, so by a tiny, tiny margin, it was just under on the pit stop. The Speedworks Toyota, by the way, is back in the race. Uh, it's gone out of the pit lane again. But uh, there is Alex Malyukin, who has stayed behind the wheel of the car. And you can see where it's dropped him to because he's now battling with the Audi of Sean Balfe. So that car is also, after a pit stop, ahead now. So Sean Balfe goes through, picks up a place. So a, a stop go and a regulation stop completed by those two different cars. Uh, so, again, the red line Lamborghini here has lost places and, of course, has still to serve its first regulation stop, whereas the Balfe Audi has got one out of the way. Uh, worth making the point, they are not on the same lap, those two cars, So uh, because, of course, the stop-go is significantly shorter uh, than the uh, the full pit stop for Balfe Audi. So, yeah. uh, yes, the Audi goes through, but uh, uh, we'll be on fresher tyres as well, of course, having pre presumably changed tyres at the stop, hence why that car has some good pace at the moment. Sam Neary showing decent pace as well. He's running down down the order having made his first pit stop and uh, trying still to bounce back uh, from the incidents early on. Now this car is in a genuine on-track battle with the Balfoundi, so Sam will want to clear Malikin as quickly as possible here. He will. Jamie Caroline, by the way, uh, has set the fastest lap of the race and the cars then now thread their way up towards the end of the lap. The race order, Adam Ballon leads from Morgan Tilbrook, Alexander West, then Nick Moss, then the Bentley fifth. Mark Sands and Michael Igo is up into sixth place with Morgan Tilbrook much, much quicker than the race leader. It's not going to be long before Tilbrook takes over the lead of the race because he's brought the gap down already to 1.8 seconds. It does give the impression that the leading Lamborghini is hobbled in some way. Richard Neary's car, now Sam Neary at the wheel of it, hustles on, on the tail now of Malikin. But it's, of course, Alex Malikin eighth and then a lap down after the pit stop uh, is Sam Neary and... Sean Balfe, even though it says on pit out, Sean Balfe, uh, another timing page, says that it's Adam Carroll behind the wheel, which would make more sense. Yes, it should be, shouldn't it, because they have made their first uh, stop of the race. Uh, yeah, Morgan Tilbrook, three seconds quicker than the leader on the previous lap. Traffic, I guess, had something to do with that, but they're almost together on the circuit now. This battle is still very much together. Tom Rawlings second in GT4, Ross Wiley third, and Marco Signoretti there in the Academy Mustang, trailing a bit of uh, rear trim after its opening lap incident, uh, is fourth in class. Now, I know a few people are pitted from GT4, but that Academy car, we saw it was strong, qualified second for this race, remember, it's got good speed, it's catching these two cars, and could find itself into a podium position once the first lot of pit stops 
have been completed. Uh, Rawlings, not for the first time, I've spotted, running wide there onto a new little bit of tarmac run off area. It's only a few feet wide, that bit of tarmac, exiting uh, Chapel Corner, but uh, give racing drivers a bit of tarmac to use, and they will always use it, and maybe just a little bit of the green stuff as well, which is exactly what Rawlings has done uh, on a couple of occasions there. We have another team manager being summoned to race control, Nick Halstead and Jamie Stanley's team manager. Remember I said that was slightly under on the pit stop? Oh, yes. Well, the message is, get, is getting through. Uh, so they were only under by 46 thousandths of a second, but a rule is a rule is a rule. That's the race leader, Adam Ballam, uh, by seven tenths of a second. From there, Morgan Tilbrook in the McLaren chasing on behind him. So starting lap 20, through the traffic they go. We've got a genuine lead battle here. Uh, the pair of them yet to serve their first of three regulation pit stops. And Adam Ballon in the Lamborghini then run by Barwell Motorsport, hustles onto Hangar Straight, contact earlier on in the race, and that possibly has hurt it to an extent. Looking back from Adam Ballon's car, and Morgan Tilbrook has brought the gap right down, 1.8, then 7 tenths of a second. Uh, yes, so uh, Bryn reporting for the pit lane that uh, Barwell don't think there's an issue with the car, they just think that Tilbrook is that bit faster, which, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm prepared to believe that, the rate that uh, Tilbrook has been uh, marching his way up the order. Remember, that uh, Enduro Motorsport car started 13th on the grid. Yes, others have had their issues, but we've seen him pull off some good overtakes, and here he is, less than a second away now from contending for the race lead. Back in the pit lane, that's uh, Sandy Mitchell watching on as he watches his car battling. Now, Sandy's got his helmet on. I know the drivers have to be ready at all times for pit stops, just in case, but Helmet on tells me that he might be jumping into this Barwell car before too long. Indeed so, it's imminent, I think, because also the last thing Adam Ballon needs is to lose time by defending. So if a battle is coming, pit, the only thing you have to be conscious of is not going over that maximum drive time. 100 of the 180 minutes is the most that either driver can do. So up towards the completion of the lap, lap number 20, Adam Ballon leads, but it could be that that green Barwell Lamborghini bails and Morgan Tilbrook gets a free ride in the Enduro Motorsport McLaren to the end of the lap. Let's see, Adam Ballon's pace, certainly not on a par with Tilbrook's, and if Adam Ballon tightens the line coming out of Woodcut, then he can anticipate the pit lane looms. It does not. He stays out for at least one more lap then. Yes, which I'm quite happy about because it means we get to see the battle on track. It would be a shame, wouldn't it, if Tilbrook caught him and then uh, the Lamborghini bail for the pit. So down to Cops Corner we go, on board with the Barbell car of Adam Ballon, looking back at the Enduro car of Marcus Klum. The inset is the onboard view from the McLaren. And this is our fight for the race lead. We are just beyond 40 minutes into the Silverstone 500. It has been an action-packed race so far and it shows no signs of letting up. This is how close it is for the race lead. And this is the part of the circuit where Clutton's McLaren really seems to work well. It changes direction through that Maggots Beckett's Chapel sequence. And that means that as he flashes the lights at Ballard down the Hangar Strait, he's almost close enough to think about having a go. But, 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 he's mindful that there are two hours and 18 minutes to go. So this isn't the lap for heroics. But if he can force a mistake out of that of Ballard, then an opportunity will present down through Van. You're looking back at the second place car looming large in the mirror in that video screen mirror of the leading car right on the tail of the race leader coming at the end of Vale into club now is Morgan Tilbrook it is when rather than if I think that McLaren gets by although the Lamborghini does break away by a length also coming through club corner yeah got really good acceleration there they both seem to hit the throttle at the same time but gradually the Lamborghini got away through the corners though there's no doubt about it the McLaren is quicker trouble is you can't drive through the car ahead you can have all the mid corner speed in the world but you're not going to be able to make the move unless you can find the gap on the inside it might be there at the loop it isn't there at the loop and so Ballon hangs on drifts a bit wide at the apex and now Tilbrook is surely going to think about the move down the Wellington Strait he's inches away from the rear diffuser of the Barwell Lamborghini but again the Lamborghini just pulls a few meters on him down the back straight Tilbrook to the inside line last of the late breakers no it's not the time for that as you said still over two and a quarter hours to go Ballon for now retains the lead. And while they're together, Alexander West in third base is lapping faster. So this is how it looked uh, as they came through Luffield. Ballon for the pits, in he comes. So Adam Ballon bails, and that means then that Morgan Tilbrook does take over the lead, our third different leader, and Adam Ballon comes in. And now it's going to be really interesting to see whether or not any damage was incurred in that contact with Malikin and whether that is a lasting legacy of the incident relative to the pace of the car. So in it comes. 
Yeah, it's the, uh, the left-hand side of the car that took the hit, isn't it? So I wouldn't mind having a look at that, uh, see if we can see any certainly visible damage to the bodywork. Out gets Ballon. Uh, Sandy Mitchell does not yet get in because nobody can touch the car whilst the refueling is in process. So there you can see the refueler sticks the hose in. They will pump as much fuel in as they need. And of course, you may as well fill it because there is a minimum pit stop time anyway. You gain nothing by short fueling. So they get everything in, they'll fill it to the brim. And only when that uh, fuel nozzle comes out, can they then begin changing tires and changing drivers. And changing tires is another element of this in as much as it is a new tire for this year. So all the data from the old tire and previous Silverstone 500s is redundant. Barwell arguably has an advantage because it runs that tyre in the endurance race that it did at Imola uh, and runs the tyre in the Sprint Cup. So they've been doing more races on this new tyre. But whether tyre wear has a, a major factor, we'll have to really try and unravel after each pit stop. It's hard to tell, isn't it, though? Because, yes, the pace at the end of that stint was slower than it was at the start, but that's because they're in traffic and they're battling for position. So, uh, yeah, hard to tell how much of that is down to tyre wear and how much is just the fact that it's a very busy racetrack. Uh, possibly the most important bit of the pit stop is completed now, cleaning one half of the windscreen on the Barwell Lamborghini so that Sandy Mitchell can see where he's going. And when Sandy can see where he's going, he's quick because he was the fastest in the pro element of qualifying yesterday. So Sandy Mitchell ought to have the pace now, perhaps to repel the challenge from this car. I feel a bit like a damage assessor for the next couple of sentences. <laughs> First news, uh, damage to the Barwell Lamborghini, just a small dink in the bodywork, according to Bryn. Uh, over at uh, Toyota Gazoo Racing UK, puncture, right rear, took out a brake line and diff cooler on the way back to the pit lane. Thought Jordan Collard looked rapid, but anyway, it was only a puncture, but it did ancillary damage right. coming back. So it wasn't suspension as we'd feared at the time, but uh, there were more things to sort out once the car had been brought back in, according to uh, team principal Christian Dick. Alexander West in for Garage 59, so that is his pit stop to hand over to Marvin Kirkhoffer. So uh, that was the car that uh, would have inherited second place had it not pitted on the same lap as the race leader. So now Nick Moss brings the Optima Motorsport McLaren into second, and Michael Igo in third place. I know other people pitting is flattering uh, the performance of the WPI car slightly, uh, but if you'd have told WPI that they'd be in a podium place within the first hour of this race, I think they'd have uh, been very, very pleased with that. There then goes Tilbrook in the background. Look, the orange McLaren, that is Nick Moss, now running second in the race, going up the inside of the Stella Motorsport Audi number 42, now in the hands of Sen and Fielding. Malik in as well to hand over to James Dolan. Of course, having already had to serve a stop-go penalty, so it's fallen down the order already. Uh, are we aware of anything that number 23, the Josh Miller, uh, Jamie Day, Aston has done? Because the team manager of that car is now being summoned to race control. As we look here at GT4 battling going on, number 9 is Tom Rawlings. 51 is the very experienced, very uh, underrated Ross Wiley, who is right on his tail. And then behind the pair of them is Marco Signoretti. So this is second, third and fourth in GT4. Uh, the leader of which has just come into the pit lane, in fact, Will Burns. So this is about to become first, second and third <laughs> in GT4. Uh, one BMW pits, another one will inherit the class lead unless it pits as well. But uh, here, Ross Wiley really taking the fight to the oh. leading BMWs as Andrew Howard in his first race in anything in this championship other than an Aston Martin since 2007 has had a rotation. His last race in anything other than an Aston was about three weeks ago in a mate's Lotus with the 750 Motor Club, but he's facing the wrong way as super sub for Kelvin Fletcher. I was about to say, it's a shame we haven't mentioned him yet. We probably ought to, but maybe not for those reasons. So he's uh, off the road or at the side of the road. I think that was at the loop, wasn't it? Uh, in the pits, as you saw there, was the number 90 BMW. Will Burns then uh, is in to hand over to Jack Brown. And uh, that uh, pit stop will be longer than the GT3 cars. The GT4 pit stops are uh, quite a bit longer, in fact, than GT3. Uh, so that minimum uh, pit stop time means that they will essentially lose a couple of laps, really. It's 165 seconds for GT4, 135 for GT3, plus the 14 seconds as well, because this is another one of those silver-silver driver combos. And there is the pit stop cycling through. So uh, Will Burns, the reigning champion with Gus Burson, gives way now to his new for this year co-driver, Jack Brown. And so it is Tom Rawlings, therefore, who will take over the lead of GT4. Ross Wiley behind him, and actually Marco Signoretti, despite a bit of damage at the back of that Mustang, a legacy of the opening lap of the race and the Contretemps Stowe corner, it's got itself back into the fray, hasn't it? And Marco Signoretti, who does not know British circuits terribly well, let's face it, first time here, he's doing a good job. It takes more than a little ding to kill off a Mustang, doesn't it? That car yes. is, is built tough, and it's clearly still going very, very quickly indeed. There's Kirk Arthur going up the inside of the uh, GT4 paddock uh, McLaren, as here the GT4 battle for the lead is interrupted 
momentarily by the arrival of Callum McLeod and the Rocket RJN uh, McLaren as well, which is now in the hands of James Kell after its first pit stop. Through goes Mercedes, McLaren should clear them down the Wellington straight, and as out wide goes the BMW of Rawlings, it's all going to get very busy because the McLaren is lapping them, but Wiley knows that that was one of his best opportunities to get alongside the BMW. There isn't room for all three of them into Brooklands. Oh, just about they avoid contact. The inside goes Kell. He gets through. Thank goodness, he thinks. The last thing he wanted to do was get too involved in this fight for the lead. And what a fight it is. BMW, Porsche, Ford Mustang, three more different cars you couldn't hope to find and nothing to choose between them. And if people say, what's the balance of performance all about? Why do we have to have it? There's the answer because they're so evenly matched as Sandy Mitchell now uh, gets himself up past Adam Carroll. So that is a change for seventh place. It's about to become sixth as well with the pit stop for number 32 red line Lamborghini. So if you're looking back from Sandy Mitchell's car through the traffic, Adam Carroll behind, winner of Alton Park. I know I was banging on in that race about how well Jules Gounon was doing, but credit to Adam for fending him off, actually. I mean, uh, he was the winner, after all, and he perhaps didn't get as much of the credit as he should, but right now, he's got a fight on his hands. Yeah, he was the only person that Gounon could not get past, Indeed, and yeah. Gounon tried and tried and tried and could not get past the Audi, so yeah, great race, and they both put on one heck of a show for us. A uh, graphic example there of the difference in pace between the pros and the ams, and also fresh tyres and old tyres as they caught Nick Moss's orange and blue McLaren there, which runs second in the race, but hasn't yet pitted so he's on his 25th lap of the race. He hasn't uh, changed tyres, of course, since the start, uh, whereas these two cars are a much, much fresher Pirelli rubber. And just had Betty Chen into the pit way to give way to Angus Fender after a trouble-free stint, which is good, after her travails at Alton Park. Uh, we are approaching the end of the first hour, and Morgan Tilbrook is the race leader by nearly 12 seconds from Nick Moss. Both of those, along with Michael Igo and Flick Haig, staying out a long time. Andrew Howard is up to fifth, and Sandy Mitchell, therefore, is the uh, leading stopper. So on the pit stops, that car, for the moment, leading. Uh, where is James Dorlin, in contrast? He's way back in 12th. So the red line car, delayed because of the stop go, has got a bit of work to do. Uh, yes, so he's going to be 20 odd seconds behind the Barwell car, I think, isn't he? When all is said and done. Right, GT4 lead battle, still in the same order. They're still threatening positional changes, but no one can quite find a way through, can they? The BMW uh, always has been good down the straights, which means that Wiley has a lot of work to do under braking. They've also got the race leader coming through, Morgan Tilbrook, to put a lap on them. And uh, is that Nick Moss? No, that must be one of the other. Uh, yes, it's the Fox Motorsport McLaren just behind Tilbrook. Tilbrook gets past one of the GT4 cars. He'll duck underneath Ross Wiley coming off Luffield Corner. And will he duck right to the inside and pit? No, stays out on track. So a long opening stint here for Tilbrook. Yeah. A real split here in strategy, as we sort of expected, with many of them seemingly going right to the end of the first hour before pitting. And a 10-second stop-go penalty is being given to number 23. So that is Josh Miller, Jamie Days, Aston Martin for causing a collision. It was being looked at, wasn't it, in context, I want to say, of, of Audi 42, but I might be wrong in that, because a lot has happened. But anyway, um, it has had an incident, it has been looked at, and so number 23, which is 27th overall, 8th uh, in class, 8th in GT4, is being given a 10 second stop go penalty. 8th in GT4, but they were in the top 3 before they pitted, so that is quite significant. That will really shake up the uh, GT4 running order then once that is applied. Down to Stowe Corner we go. That uh, has slightly separated the GT4 scrap for the time being, so a little more comfortable in the lead is Tom Rawlings, uh, with Ross Riley behind and Marco Signoretti in third. A mention for the fourth-placed car in GT4, Matt Topham, doing a good job here in the leading Pro-Am GT4 car, the car he shares with uh, Darren Turner. Topham is about six to seven seconds behind this battle on track, but remember, his pit stop, or that team's pit stop, will be 14 seconds shorter than all of the cars currently ahead of it within the class. So if they can stay within that 14 second window at every pit stop, their quid's in. That's right, because Pro-Ams don't serve the uh, 14 seconds. That's only applied to the silver-silver driver combinations, as Tom Rawlings is doing a very good job of keeping Ross Wiley at bay. But look who's on their tail now. Sandy Mitchell trying to work his way through the bat markers goes to the outside line, gets clear of Ross Wiley, who is uh, so good, he knows exactly what to do and where to put the car to keep out of the way of the GT3 traffic. Adam Carroll goes through as well. Tom Rawlings does likewise, gets out of the way. And so Sandy Mitchell unimpeded goes by. Morgan Tilbrook then, his last lap was a two minutes two. Sandy Mitchell's last lap was a one minute 59. So in real terms, as you see the Mustang go ahead of the Porsche there, Marcus Signoretti ahead of Ross Wiley. Sandy Mitchell is the quickest man on the circuit. Signoretti just about avoids wobbling off the road on the outside of Brooklyn's. So the Mustang now goes second in GT4. 
bold move that and he really took advantage of other people getting out of the way of the GT3 cars. Well yeah you mentioned that Wiley made life very easy for the GT3s as in comes Rawlings then into the lead, uh, into the lead of GT4 goes Signoretti out of the lead goes the second of the century BMWs uh, but yeah Wiley making the GT3 cars lives easy made his own life difficult he was compromised off yeah. the loop through Aintree and therefore slowed down the Wellington straight and Signoretti needed no second invitation. Rawlings in then Chris Salkeld will get into the car momentarily so both of the century cars pitting uh, before quite a lot of the other front running GT4 cars. And again just to reiterate Andy's point of earlier on two part pit stop so in it comes driver out refuel then you can do fuel uh, sorry then you can do I should say tires and the driver change and any other work that needs doing but uh, they are pit stops where you can do nothing while the fuel goes in so the drivers stand and wait until the signal is given that they can uh, go back to approach the car race lead gap is 18 seconds Nick Moss in second place dropping away because he last time did a two minute six so the second place car is certainly being caught by Michael Igo and by Flick Haig uh, but Sandy Mitchell right now is the quickest driver out of that leading group and of course having already served a pit stop the advantage is once again looking Barwell's way and Adam Carroll's in stride because is that a puncture the smoke coming from the back as though the car has sat down on a corner I'm hoping it's only a puncture and nothing worse than that because there's damage as well I fear that might well be a tire that's gone down and he needs to be careful not to do what uh, Jordan Collard did earlier on in the Toyota and uh make further damage to the car on the way back to the pit lane, dragging it back on that lowered right rear corner. So a uh, major drama then uh, on track for Valve Motorsport, almost some drama in the pit lane there as uh, I think that was Tom Rawlings nearly going for a tumble uh, over a, a tyre. So Audi in strife in GT3, the GT4 Audi for Stella Motorsport has already had trouble, but look, having made its first pit stop, so too has the BMW behind. But that's kind of the thing, the BMW is behind, so the Audi potentially, once this all shakes out, is going to be ahead of the rest of the GT4 cars, certainly the other uh, silver silver cars. That is a pretty decent job. Of course, they've had fielding in that Audi, though, the quicker of the two drivers, pounding around there, setting quick lap times, digging himself back up the order. But all of the time he spends in the car now means he can spend less time in the car in his second stint. So when do you maximise his stint time? Well, you're going to have to have him in at the end anyway, aren't you? Because of the way that it will go on the rotation. They'll all have the pros in at the end. Uh, so this might turn out to be a shorter stint and give him a longer stint yeah. at the end. So this perhaps is the one where he gets the car back into the mix, as you say. But then you let Richard Williams carry on the good work and give Senna a, a longer crack at the very end. Sean Valve's car, Adam Carroll at the wheel of it, is still limping back to the pit lane. That's the next one we need to focus on when it arrives in the pit lane to see the damage. But that Audi is about to drop off the lead lap as away now goes number nine, Chris Salkeld at the wheel of it. Yes, he does down the uh, pit lane then back into the fray and look behind these two again. So yeah. the I think these are going to be two of the... Um, uh, cars right at the front of the GT4 pack once this first round of pit stops, if you like, is done. A great example here of the difference between a GT3 and GT4 car as the GT3 BMW passes the GT4. A big speed differential, as you would expect. There's a, a pretty big speed differential at the front of GT3 right now. Morgan Tilbrook, 22 seconds clear of Nick Moss. At first, I, I was prepared to... Um, uh, put Nick's uh, slightly lower pace or slower pace down to simply traffic but it is consistent he's consistently four or five seconds a lap slower than Tilbrook who not only has raced hard to get up the field but has clearly looked after the tyres Adam Carroll in the team I understand a bit perplexed as to why that tyre has gone pot because all the pressures were good now whether uh, Adam may have run over something or run over a curb to slice it but there's more concern isn't there looking into uh, the area where the wheel was indeed partly to see what might have caused this puncture and also what damage it may have done uh, but the urgency stops for the moment so that's another front running car in strife so much of this race is about surviving it and absolutely we're not even an hour in and look how many people have either taken themselves out of contention or been taken out of contention through a bit of bad luck uh, and they're not going to really be able to uh, get that time back over the rest of the race. 76 back on track, by the way, so that's going to be you and Hanky at the wheel of the McLaren. Remember, that's had an extended stay in the pits to uh, get that rear wing properly attached. The Bentley comes through, car number three, which has, I believe, made its first stop of the day. Yes, Will Tregertha on board, and that car, again, is going to be on the fringes of the top five, I think. I go out of the WPI car, in will get Phil Keane, 
what a stint that was from Michael Igo to A, survive the drama on track, but then also to gain some ground. They're not actually going to be running inside the top three once the stops are done, but they'll be a lot further up the order than they started. Now, that's the Stella Motorsport Audi that runs in GT4. Effectively now, it has put itself back into the lead of the class. The cars that are ahead have yet to stop. Uh, so Senan Fielding is the best place of those that have made their first regulation stop, having now got himself ahead of the number 90 BMW, as Andy mentioned a lap or so ago. So uh, it's been advantage Audi despite earlier delays. And that is very bad news indeed. Car in a pit garage does not bode well. And the Balfe Motorsport Audi, whether it is there because of the cause or the result of the puncture, we know not yet. But the really sad sight is that the Alton Park round one winning car is in its garage. There's bodywork lying on the outside of the curb there. Look, coming out of uh, Aintree as well. So people are shedding bits that might actually have come off the Audi, you know, thinking about it. But bad, bad news for Balfe Motorsport. Right, Morgan Tilbrook, who's had a charm first stint, hasn't he? Comes through, building the gap all the time. But still, in terms of lap times, being caught by Sandy Mitchell. Yes, exactly, because Sandy Mitchell and most of the other pro drivers are in the two-minute zeros. Uh, Tilbrook's last lap was a two-minute 2.0, although that was slower than he has been going. Let's see what this one is. Yeah, two minutes, 1.3. So, yes, slower than the pro drivers, but not massively slow. And, of course, he's getting a big chunk of his driver time out of the way here in the opening stint. Marcus Clutton, we know, is a rapid peddler. Yeah. He will jump into that car, you would have to presume, in the near future. And then he can really, he can stay in the car again for another hour if he wanted to. And, uh, and perhaps uh, regain that advantage towards the end of his stint. So... You know, what sometimes looks like uh, a, a strategy that's losing you ground in the long run can reverse completely and it can turn out to be the winning strategy. Sandy Mitchell, you were on board with there a moment ago, going through the traffic. Now, he is catching uh, the cars ahead, no question about it. This is the leading car that has made a pit stop and a little bit of damage on that uh, left-hand side, a legacy of the Alex Malikin zealotry from earlier on. James Dorlin still chipping his way uh, back into contention as best he can and currently running in 11th place. But it's all going to shake out once the final GT3 cars serve their first of the three mandatory stops. As now Sandy Mitchell, Lamborghini factory driver, comes up towards the right-hander of Abbey. And the Flying Scotsman, another driver that started in single-seater racing before making that switch to GT racing. And very much one of the stars these days of Lamborghini GT3 racing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Sandy Mitchell, former champion, as you said, in British GT and a very, very rapid driver aboard one of these Lamborghini Huracan GT3 cars. And he's proving that now. His previous lap was a two minute zero, actually slightly slower than the two cars chasing him. Sam Neary, number eight, and Marvin Kirkhofer, number 88. Those two are together, by the way. Neary uh, Jr., that is, ahead of Kirkhofer. Um, remember, the, the Neary's were in early, weren't they? But uh, they've actually managed to get themselves ahead of Kirkhofer and potentially into a podium place here once all said and done uh, with the first lot of pit stops. Academy Motorsport in, so that's Signoretti to hand over to Matt Cowley. Good opening stint for Marco as well. Unfortunate to go off the road on the opening lap, seemingly not of his fault though, and the Canadian driver clawed his way into, um, again, a really strong position there inside the top three uh, before the GT4 leader started to pit. Should we get worried about the fact that the puncture for Jordan Collard and Adam Carroll was the same corner of the car? Um, whether there is something that they're running over, whether it's because now the temperature is going up, it's much, much warmer now than it was even uh, at the start of the hour when I was down on the grid. Uh, I can't believe it's heat-related because these tyres do races in, in, in much higher temperatures. But it's interesting, at least, maybe it's only a coincidence, that it's the same corner of the car. Well, it happened to both of them early in the stint, almost as if it was when they were on low pressures, a curb strike or something, you know. It's the right-hand side, though, which is the side that gets used the least here. It's a clockwise circuit. You turn right more, that wears out the left-hand side tyres. Uh, and so... Um, yeah, odd. You would imagine it's either running over debris or hitting a curb on low pressures. Which of those it is, we may never know. Uh, but yes, a, an interesting coincidence it could also be. Uh, on screen, we see the R Racing Aston Martin. Into the pit lane, though, has come Matt Topham. A long opening stint, that, for the Newbridge Aston Martin to hand over to Darren Turner. And we're getting closer now to seeing what the, the true picture of GT4 is post-pit stops. Indeed so. And ahead of that 23 Aston, second and third of the stoppers out of GT3. Uh, so you've got Marvin Kirchhoff ahead of Sam Neary. 
there scything his way through the traffic as well as the fourth of the stoppers which is Jamie Caroline who took over from John Ferguson so effectively at the moment it's Sandy Mitchell leading but Marvin Kirchhoff's lap times are going to be uh, interesting to see his last lap was fractionally quicker than uh, Sandy Mitchell and uh, there is the race leader Sandy Mitchell then although as I say you still got three ahead uh, yet to serve their first regulation pit stop but as they do so they will drop down the order because a pit stop is effectively a lap. Uh, it is, yes, indeed. So uh, Tilbrook then goes behind the Lamborghini on track, not for position yet, uh, but it's, it's almost hair in the tortoise kind of stuff, isn't it, really? Because, uh, yes, he's losing out to the Barwell Lamb Lamborghini now, but once they stick Clutton in, we know he's quick. He'll have fresh rubber as well, quite a bit fresher uh, than Sandy Mitchell's tyres will be because Sandy's been in the car now uh, for quite some time, hasn't he? So uh, yeah. he's got laps on the tyres. Clutton will get in with fresh rubber and will presumably start to get the gap down again. So Tilbrook leads then, number 77. Nick Moss second, number 28. Number 75, Flick Haig in third. Those are now the only three GT3 cars yet to make their first mandatory pit stop. Um, we are now into the second hour of the race. Sandy Mitchell there, the green Lamborghini, is fourth. First of those to have stopped. And there in the background, look, the blue McLaren. That is Marvin Kirkhofer. He's fifth in the race. Sam Neary, the green and black Mercedes, is sixth. And the white and blue of Jamie Caroline, seventh. They're all getting themselves together. Uh, of those three, though, it is very much the... Uh, Neary and Caroline uh, cars that have uh, been, been out there the longest since their, their first pit stop. Uh, we've had Andrew Howard in to give way to Martin Plowman, but I fear that he might that car might be coming back in because that was another that's being shown as being a bit short on its pit stop. So uh, I'm a bit concerned about the Paddock Motorsport McLaren. We'd seen Andrew Howard had a spin anyway, but uh, I'm not convinced the pit stop went according to plan as Johnny Adam is about to take over from Flick Haig. So that car comes in relatively late after effectively 30 laps. And Johnny Adam thinks, oh, this is all a bit different from an Aston Martin. Go back to 2010, and he was a, uh, a one-off Ginetta racer. And uh, that, that was his last race in anything, really, other than an Aston Martin. 96 races he's done in British GT, all of them in an Aston. And the 100th will come in this Mercedes, which a uh, race that he'll do later on in the season as the cars now drop down towards Brooklyn. Sam Neary chasing after Marvin Kirchhofer, but Marvin last time upping his pace this is going to be a real test of Sam Neary we know he's quick but uh, equally Marvin Kirkhofer is an absolute gun Johnny Adam goes for number 75 ready to hop on board and uh, we've got then more and more of the pit stops cycling through Morgan Tilbrook Andy has come in as well out of what was the lead on the road yes just as Sandy Mitchell sets a new fastest lap of the race a 1 minute 59.115 so really quick lap that for Mitchell and now Enduro choose to pit the McLaren so this is the 2 C's uh, motorsport car 2 C's of course who won this race a year ago with Martin Codrich and Hunter Abbott at the wheel of one of their Mercedes AMGs and uh, they are uh, in the pit lane in fact all of the top 3 cars momentarily will share the pit lane because uh, in already came Morgan Tilbrook and now Nick Moss as well pits from second place. So finally, an hour and six minutes into the race, we might actually have a clue what the real order is going to be. We know that Mitchell should take over the lead, but behind is anyone's guess. He's just done the fastest lap of the race as well, Sandy Mitchell. So now that that fuel load is burning off, now that the tyres are nice and warm, Sandy Mitchell is certainly upping the pace that maybe wasn't being evinced from that car earlier on but uh, in fairness Adam Ballon is the am Sandy is the pro and he's proving the point markedly isn't he now so Sandy Mitchell goes through Abbey he's currently on lap 32 he will get the lead of the race back officially at the end of this lap because all the cars ahead uh, will have pitted but just to prove the point he's done the fastest lap of the race that Morgan Tilbrook McLaren led when it came in but it will lose the lead now while it serves this pit stop because even if uh, they arrive close together. Sandy Mitchell's lap times have been quicker than Morgan Tilbrook, so he's been bringing the gap down anyway, so he should jump back ahead now. Yeah, but interested to see what Clutton can do on those fresh tyres. Into the pit lane for the second time comes the uh, Stella Motorsport Audi, so that was a short first stint for Senna Fielding. Which I did suggest might happen, just to you know, yeah, get him yeah. out there, bring it back into the game, low fuel load, quick car, and then you can put Richard Williams in, the team manager of the Paddock Motorsport McLaren to race control. Oh, I wonder was why. pondering its pit stop time, so that saga continues. But yeah, I think Stella might have, have, have been clever on the strategy here. So Senna Fielding, possibly, light fuel load, get it back into the game. It's taken over the lead of the class. Next pit stop for Richard Williams now that it's back in the hunt. It's almost like you've seen a few of these races before, David. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is what we love, though, isn't it? The freedom strategically that they have. They couldn't do this in a traditional one or two hour race, whereas exactly. now they can, uh, uh, as you said, not just pick when they want, but they can choose how much fuel to put in. So if they wanted to commit to that strategy, as you said, don't fill the tank, give them a light car, fresh mm. tyres, and let Senn and Fielding do what Senn and Fielding does the best, really, which is go out there and drive very, very quickly. And it's a car, just going back to that Audi for the final point, that has really been transformed with this new tyre. They are loving the way that the car operates on the new rubber. Now, number 77, Marcus Clatton at the wheel of it. That was the car that led on its way in. We'll see shortly where it feeds back into the pack. Uh, but Marcus Clatton, we know he's fast and he's going to be well worth watching in this next stint in terms of lap times relative to those of Sandy Mitchell. At number 28, McLaren, Nick Moss has now given way to Joe Osborne and uh, Joe could never be described as slow. <laughs> So it's going to be an interesting stint, this. It is, absolutely. Uh, Joe Osborne, who races uh, occasionally with Optimum in uh, the British GT Championship, uh, did a uh, race here, was it last year or the year before? I think it was 2020, wasn't it, at the Silverstone 500 with the very exciting Brendan Ereeb. And uh, there still races with him quite a lot with Optimum abroad in Europe. This then, the car that at the end of the lap will be officially given back the race lead. The timing screen will catch up with itself. And Sandy Mitchell well, will see what sort of gap he's got. The other thing to now look for, of course, Sandy Mitchell is a lot further into the stint. Yeah. So therefore, irrespective of what the lap times of the other cars are, it could well be that we have Adam Ballon in relatively soon, while, of course, you've still got a Clutton and an Osborne in the other cars, which will therefore change the whole dynamic of that leading gaggle again. Yeah, and Bob will need to be careful not to panic if they start seeing that gap coming down, because he is on much older rubber, so you would expect him now to be reeled in a little bit by those behind. The real question is what margin he has to start with. So uh, Sandy Mitchell goes through as the race leader now officially, through comes Marvin Kirkhofer, who sets the fastest lap of the race, a 158.304 first driver into the 158 there um, is not the McLaren that is a McLaren that is uh, Marcus Clutton coming through but Kirko for 6.8 seconds behind Mitchell and on the previous lap a full second faster Sam Neary is third then in car number eight three and a half seconds further back then it's 2.3 seconds back to Jamie Caroline for 2C's Motorsport but Jamie's been in that car for about 40 minutes already he gained a lot of that ground in the early laps of his stint and now perhaps might not be able to quite match the pace of those around him Martin Plowman in the paddock Motorsport McLaren a 25 second stop go penalty so they were demonstrably under the pit uh, time and so a 25 second stop go penalty is being given to car number 11 just to explain how this works there is a time that the GT3 cars must serve the pit stop to it is, and the same for GT4 it is timed pit in line to pit out line and as soon as you go through the pit out timing beam up comes your pit stop time and if it is under the regulation it comes up as an alarm to show the race director and he applies the appropriate penalty simple as that uh, yeah it is black and white isn't it you can't argue your way out of that one unfortunately so uh, paddock motorsport winners on uh, not on the road but winners uh, on corrected times if you like at alton park a few weeks ago uh, provisionally at least they are unfortunately in strife with a spin and now a penalty as well there's jamie caroline don't think we saw the best of Jamie at Alton Park. Had that off, of course, in the wet in race two, didn't he? And uh, Jamie Caroline uh, here, very much showing the pace that he's got. He did for uh, about 30 minutes or so hold the fastest lap of the race. On the previous lap, was a little bit slower than Sam Neary ahead. Traffic could have had something to do with that. The gap at the start of the lap uh, was 2.3 seconds. There is Sam Neary. There, Jamie Caroline. Two Mercedes AMGs run out of different stables, of course and uh, Jamie Caroline doing his best here to chase after a podium place. Well, we've been mentioning Morgan Tilbrook a lot over the last half hour or so, and now Bryn is in the pit lane to chat to him. A very long stint for you there, Morgan, but it went to plan for you, I guess. It did go to plan. I'm mean, obviously started 13th. Marcus told me I needed to get my elbows out and uh, drive assertively, and uh, I felt like, you know, after Alton Park, some mistakes that I made and the quality I struggled because I got stuck in traffic, I'd, I came out today with you know on a mission really. I just had to had to get something good from the last two weekends. So even if we don't have a great result, I'm still happy because I had a great drive today and went right to the end until the last lap. Red lights flashing for fuel. So we're going to play us play the long strategy. Was Alton Park playing on your mind because you really wanted to sort of <laughs> cast that demon aside, I suppose? Yeah, it was. Um, Alton Park was a disaster for me. Obviously, I missed my pit box in the first race. I think you guys uh, wrote up that an electrical issue in the second. I didn't have an electrical issue. I hit the uh, four course yellow button on my steering wheel. So I, I had two complete rookie errors uh, that destroyed potentially two podiums, you know, on that weekend. So, yeah, so I had, it, was, it was the worst weekend racing I've had, that's for sure. And I felt so bad for the team because, you know, they gave me a winning car and 
silly errors for me. It's a bit too honest for a racing driver. I think you need to come up with some better excuses. Look. And are you any concern over the tyres? We've seen a couple of rear rights going. Yeah, my tyres at the end were finished. I mean, the last corner, I was just having to go in there, rotate it, almost stationary, and then and then plant the gas. But uh, yeah, they were they were still drivable. Times weren't horrendous, but I was having to drive the car very differently to how I would have driven it at the beginning of the race. That's for sure. Well done. Before I hand back to you, Andy and David, just a quick one. I was talking to Flick a few moments ago, Flick Hagen. She was saying she was really struggling for grip out there, and she's now using the time, really, or was using the time to really learn the car. Not sure if it's tyres or the fact she hasn't raced for so many years, but I just thought I'd add that in the mix as well. Rin, thanks very much. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of the perfect storm in a way for Flick Hagen. She's not raced for a long time. It's a different car from that that she won the championship with, and it's a new tyre from what she would have raced on. So I think all of those elements are... are, are relevant when assessing her performance yeah absolutely and uh, a spin aside in qualifying yesterday she's not uh, done anything noticeably wrong really she's been doing a solid job out there uh, that car by the way is 12th position at the moment now in the hands of uh, johnny adam of course so uh, yeah they're just outside the top 10 they can definitely get themselves into that top 10 before the day is done right we've covered what's going on in gt3 after the pit stops what about gt4 well ross wiley has just pitted he was sort of the last one we were waiting for to make his mandatory stop so chris salkeld here car number nine could end up the race leader but right behind him is darren turner this is exactly the scenario we thought would play out darren turner took over that um, newbridge motorsport aston martin some way behind the leaders in gt4 but because the leaders were pretty much exclusively silver silver combos they have that 14 second longer pit stop and so now darren turner after the pit stops is right up there with him he's on the tail of salkeld as they head towards maggots and beckett's a couple of gt3 cars go through that's uh, joe osborne chasing after phil Keane. but this then is potentially the battle for first second and third in gt4 as turner looks to the inside there salkeld runs wide not quite knowing where the Aston Martin was going to be and all the time Matt Cowley trying to buy into this as well the three of them nose to tail as they head down the hangar straight uh, they are on their 33rd lap of the race and it's side by side here to the outside goes Matt Cowley defensive inside line taken by Darren Turner but Turner is a little bit restricted to his pace on that inside line by the BMW blocking him and actually Cowley could go right around the outside here get the inside down through the veil into the braking zone at club they've got the Century GT3 car in the mix as well and Cowley goes through. Great move. Well, Matt Cowley came from the School of Hard Knocks, didn't he? Formula Ford 1600 racing, so he knows how to race. Absolutely no question. Much underrated driver, Matt Cowley. Yeah. Uh, doesn't get the credit he deserves. Uh, he doesn't get the budget he deserves either, but he's a very, very quick driver and excels in this Mustang. So, yeah, good racing. He's got it up the order. Uh, the number 93 Sky Tempesta Mercedes, incidentally, has its pit stop being investigated. That might be for too many people working on the car or the wrong pit process so we'll have to come back to that one when more news comes as well but it's a bit snakes and ladders for lots of people isn't it you work your way up and then a penalty comes and you slide back down the pole again and try and battle your way into contention once more gt4 though here giving great racing matt cowley hustles on in the mustang booms his way down wellington straight that car makes such a good noise and there it is absolutely now glued to the back of chris solkel's bmw uh, now i did suggest that this could become the fight for the gt4 lead it is not, because actually Matty Graham came out of the pit lane some way ahead of this group. Yeah. So remember, the Porsche was battling with the Century BMW, the Academy Ford Mustang before the stops. But by staying out later, oddly, it has gained a big advantage. So the uh, Veluga Porsche number 51 has already been across the start finish line. And Matty Graham's advantage over Chris Salkeld is 4.3 seconds as they head towards Cops Corner now. There's Salkeld second, Cowley third, and Johnny Adam tried to put a lap on them in the Mercedes. What's impressive about Matty Graham is this is a new car to him. Uh, you know, he was was racing Carrera Cup, very, very different type of Porsche a couple of weeks ago, successfully at Donington Park, and here he is now dropped into something else and delivering very effectively. And he's being helped by not only this battle behind, which is getting in the way a little bit of Johnny Adam, who has to dive through now, picks up the place then on the road against Chris Solkeld. So Johnny Adam clears the traffic, but Matty Graham also uh, relying on his, his own racecraft as much as this battle, as I say, delaying those involved. Darren Turner tries to get onto the back of Cowley. Cowley on the back of Solkeld, but Johnny Adam, having cleared the traffic, the GT3 car demonstrably quicker, pulls away down towards Stowe. Into the right-hander, we're working lap 37 here. Not yet at the halfway point, still an hour and three quarters to go. 
and it is Sandy Mitchell, the race leader, and Sam Neary has just oh. pitted out of third place as Cowley gets into the back of Sol Kelp, but goes through at the end of Vale, and Darren Turner tries to line up for a move as well. Now, that was a Formula 4 1600 move. He sold the dummy to the outside, dived to the inside, got the place, and Turner needed no second invitation to follow him past, so they uh, pace potentially now the Mustang and the Aston Martin, will be unlocked. You got the sense they were maybe being held up slightly by Salkel defending. Now they've broken through. Look, already Cowley starting to escape and Turner, you'd imagine, would be hot on his heels. So they head into uh, Village once again. The Mustang then into second place in the class and uh, the gap that they have uh, to Matty Graham, who is second in that class, actually. Correction, because it is uh, Jack Brown in the number 90 car. 18 seconds in front in GT4 and then uh, Matty Graham holds about a four and a half second cushion over this battle for third position. So good move that from Cowley. Uh, and that is how you cleanly make uh, an aggressive move uh, into the uh, cl club complex. That was pretty impressive. So as they head through Brooklands once again, a reminder that Sandy Mitchell still leads the race overall. And despite the fact he's on older tyres than some of those chasing him down, still lapping well in the uh, low one minute 59s compared to Kirkhofer on the previous lap in the two minute sixes. So uh, Sandy Mitchell, two minutes 0 0.6 that is. So Sandy Mitchell leading the race, older rubber, but still extending the margin. And going back to GT4 for a moment, Richard Williams uh, is 12th overall in GT4, but a pit stop ahead of everybody else. So remember that he's doing his second stint. It was that short second stint in the car uh, for Senn and Fielding. Richard Williams now takes over his second stint, stint three, if you add it all up. Uh, the car a long way down, but of course we'll buy back heaps of places on the next round of pit stops for all of those cars that are ahead. Yes, exactly, and they will run now. They'll, they'll work out how many minutes they can plug Senn and Fielding in for at the end of the race, and that is exactly when they will pit Richard Williams uh, to get Senn in, I am sure. Remember, no more than 100 minutes can be completed in the race by any one driver. Darren Turner then aboard Scully, the uh, blue and black Aston Martin. Uh, just going back to your Valve Motorsport uh, Audi for a moment. Uh, it looks like it might be out of the race. Uh, with fairly severe wheel arch damage, the tyre took out the arch, damaged the cooler, hit the brake lines. Uh, Adam Proctor of the team says, I could go on. But it's very similar to the damage incurred coming into the pits for the Toyota, which had its puncture. Yes, although interestingly, the Toyota coming past us now on track. So they got that car out, clearly a little less damage done uh, to the Supra than was done to the Balfe Motorsport Audi. But that's a real shame if that is their day done. Uh, certainly a car that could have gained uh, a good result out of this Silverstone 500. Running on board now with the Sky Tempesta racing Mercedes AMG. This is Chris Froggart running in a seventh position. Solid race this for Chris, it must be said. Kevin Say, despite the spin in the first, this car still finds itself in the top ten. It's on its third track limit warning though at Cox yeah. Corner, this car. So they've got to be careful, especially with an hour and 39 minutes still to run. The last thing they need is a penalty for not adhering to track limits. Do they reset those track limits counts at the end of each stint like they do in some championships? I forget now how that's worked in I the past. I don't think they do. And I think right. they only reset in really long races like Spa at a given point, mm. like sort of on the six hour mark, for example. I, I think it's to the car over the race rather than individual drivers in individual stints, but I'll happily be proved wrong by a rule book. But I might get time to read before the end of the race, but there's so much going on, uh, I'm doing this from memory. Uh, you're riding on board in that little inset with Chris Froggart, who knows his way around Silverstone from his days here in the GT World Challenge Europe Endurance Cup. And it's good to have him in British GT. He is getting so much mileage in this car. Uh, and after years of racing Ferraris, of course, it's quite a big change from the Ferrari to a Mercedes for this season. Grupper M operating the car now rather than two Cs, which ran it at Alton Park. And Chris Froggen currently is seventh. His next target is James Dorlin. But actually, he's falling away a little bit. James fractionally quicker. And to finish my James Dorlin point, that means that after a, a stop-go penalty of earlier on, that car is in the top six. Yes, it has been one of those races already, though, hasn't it, where the list of uh, teams that haven't had strife is significantly shorter than the list of those that have. So I suppose it's almost to be expected that some of them will get themselves uh, back into contention. And it will be, I think, the team that has uh, the least drama over the three hours that probably comes out on top. But uh, fascinating insight here into uh, what it takes to get one of these big, heavy GT3 cars around what is quite a physically demanding circuit. It's a yeah. long lap, Silverstone, 18 corners, official 
really. Uh, most of them are pretty hard on the body. Either you're carrying high speed and picking up high G-forces through the fast corners, or you're having to wrestle it through some of the technical sections. And of course, uh, as the tyres wear out and you get deeper into the stint, that becomes even harder. Don't let anyone fool you into thinking that you don't have to be fit to be a racing driver. Tom Edgar then in the Speedwork Supra, about to get out of the way of the charging Chris Froggett. You saw him flashing the lights. They came down towards Cop's corner. The Toyota is four laps away from its next opposition after that lengthy stop to repair the damage of earlier on. Uh, and although we had that couple of cars with punctures, again, find something to touch that's made out of wood here when I say nobody else seems to be suffering from the moment. So maybe it was a coincidence more than anything sinister. Yeah, or debris on the track, as we yeah. suggested, might have been the case. Debris which eventually gets swept out of the way, naturally, as uh, uh, the cars continue to circulate. Over 30 cars on track. That's the best way to clear a track, is to have cars out there lapping it. So, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully that is the last we see of uh, deflated tyres or tyres off rims. Down towards uh, Club comes this little gaggle. There goes the Joe Osborne McLaren. Joe is ninth at the moment, 3.8 seconds behind Lewis Proctor. As you would kind of expect, given the fact that for the most part it's the pro drivers in these GT3 cars now, we're seeing much more evenly matched lap times. The top two, Sandy Mitchell and Marvin Kirkhoff, are both in the sort of mid one minute 59s, although Mitchell there comes through and does a two minute zero, which is now absolutely on a par with pretty much everybody else in GT3. So uh, no longer are we seeing cars gaining seconds per lap on each other. It's now uh, far smaller increments, so tenths, hundredths, even thousandths between the lap times. Uh, and uh, so therefore you can expect a lot of these gaps to stay pretty stable until the next round of pit stops. Uh, in fact, the next round of pit stops beginning very much in GT4 because we've got two GT4 cars in. The number 65 Team Parker Racing Porsche sees Seb Hopkins handing back over to Jamie Orton. Remember, they pitted very early uh, for their first stop, so a lengthy stint there, getting on for about 80 minutes or so uh, for Seb Hopkins. He is in, and so too is the car on your screen, the number 23 R Racing Aston Martin, for its second mandatory stop added to its stop go which is why that one fell away earlier on so tough race now johnny adam was lapping on his last lap through faster than the eight ahead of him he's happily under two minutes and relatively few of those ahead have been able to do that part of it is traffic related but the point in all of this is that although this is a new car to johnny adam you would not think it and he's absolutely flying isn't he out of cops corner Johnny Adam Mercedes, keep saying it, get it in your mind. Uh, up to the Beckett's S's he goes. So currently in his first stint, 11th, uh, the target ahead is his old rival from seasons past, Phil Keane. Uh, but the pair of them both sort of trying to push forward and chip up the order. Yes, the two winningest drivers in uh, British GT history, of course. That is definitely uh, a fight that you'd pay to see, isn't it? So uh, they're not quite together at the moment, but uh, yeah, that gap 7.9 seconds are coming down because there, Phil Keane on the previous lap did a 2 minutes 2.1 compared to a 159.9 for Johnny Adam. Again, as we have to say, it's the caveat every time. It's, it could be traffic affected, uh, but uh, nonetheless, Johnny Adam showing why he is a world-class driver, and there's no disputing that in my mind. It doesn't really matter whether it's an Aston Martin he's in or whether it's a Mercedes or whether it was a BMW touring car for a year or so, uh, about oh, 15 years or so ago. Now, that wasn't his uh, short stint in the British Touring Car Championship. He is always quick, whatever you put him in, and uh, he knows the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit very well, and I expect this car to be a little bit higher up than 11th place in uh, about 90 minutes' time. It's all Gordon Shedden's fault, because Johnny Adams started off in Formula Fords, and then the budget ran out, and Gordon said to him when they were instructing at Knock Hill one day, um, have you thought about touring cars? So Johnny gravitated towards one make in, in great success in Seats, for example, yeah. and as you say, had that year in the motor base uh, Ford, had a season of pretty much nothing, and then was picked up by Aston Martin, and the rest is history. Le Mans class winner, champion, you name it, four times a British GT champion, uh, and uh, although he, as he was saying on the grid, still has this association with Aston, uh, he's a bit of a, more of a, a free agent these days, and for the two C's squad, comes out of Luffield, so Phil Keane is there ahead of him, there's not much to choose between them in terms of lap times. Uh, Phil Keane, in turn, is chasing after Joe Osborne. The one that's probably vulnerable, really, is to an extent Chris Frogger, to an extent Lewis Proxer, because they're two minutes, two minutes, one. Frogger, two minute one last time. 
interestingly as well, Marcus Clutton, who he expected to be really rapid in this stint, has actually fallen away from the top three and has been caught by Will Trigertha yes, in the Assetto right. Motorsport Bentley, which pitted a lot earlier. So it's on older rubber than the um, Enduro McLaren. So for whatever reason, things not quite clicking uh, for Marcus. We do hear sometimes that teams maybe favour the AM driver when it comes to uh, setup work, make sure they're comfortable. Sometimes the pro then isn't quite able to extract the maximum potential out of the car. We'll try and uh, get to the bottom of that. But that is certainly a close battle for fourth place within GT3. Can I offer you that it's certainly, for the start of its stint, very, very heavy on fuel because True. Morgan Tilbrook did say that the fuel warning light came on right yeah. at the very end of his stint, so it will have been absolutely laden up with fuel for this stint. But you're right, it, it's a surprise that the lap times aren't coming. Yeah, I mean, he's not slow. Don't get me wrong, 2 minutes 0 0.8 is comparable. He's only losing a tenth here and there to, to, to uh, Trigertha behind. But, uh, uh, yeah, uh, expected maybe a bit more. I'm sure we'll find out. Brim perhaps can have a chat to uh, Marcus uh, when he does eventually hand back over to Morgan Tilbrook. Right, on screen, number 93, that is Chris Froggett. He is seventh place, but maybe not for much longer because he's got Lewis Proctor in the Greystone GT McLaren there, car number five breathing down his neck as they come down through Brooklands into Luffield. The big, burly front-engine Mercedes AMG, the mid-engine McLaren, and another one catching. That's the number 28 car of Joe Osborne. So three cars almost together now, fighting for seventh place. Which is typical British GT. Yep. In fact, GT3 racing per se. Battles all the way through the field. There is Chris Froggett going through. Lewis Proctor not that far behind him. Joe Osborne not that far behind. So you've got all of those covered by about a second and a half, those three. And we are just about getting towards now the halfway mark. Sandy Mitchell right now leads, but the gap is creeping down, isn't it? Four and a half seconds last time. This is Lewis Proctor you're looking at. Number five, the Greystone GT entry, charging on behind Chris Froggart's Sky Tempesta Mercedes. Out of Chapel Curve, onto Hangar Straight. Traffic up the road. The Ginetta, that is the car that Joe Wheeler is currently driving, sharing with uh, Freddie Tomlinson, and it's about to lose a place on the road and indeed a place in the classification because that was Bradley Ellis, GT champion of years past, getting up and past him. So Bradley Ellis goes 22nd overall. There's the Bentley that you were talking about. Will Trigertha at the wheel of it and almost on the back now of Marcus Clutton. So this is the fight building up for fourth and fifth. Uh, yes, it is. The Bentley always has gone well here at Silverstone, be that this current uh, iteration of uh, Bentley Continental or the, its uh, predecessor. Uh, we did have a Bentley win here, I want to say in 2016 for uh, Team Park Racing's Bentley Continental in the Silverstone 500. This isn't for the lead at the moment, but uh, clearly Will Trigertha getting on well with the uh, Bentley as he closes in on the uh, McLaren just ahead. They drop down onto the brakes into Brooklyn's corner. A couple of things I want to mention about uh, cars ahead of these two. Uh, Marvin Kirkhofer, nothing to get excited about just yet, but he is reeling in Sandy Mitchell. Over the last couple of laps, he's been a second or so quicker, so 4.7 seconds now is the lead margin for Barwell Motorsport. The other driver that I want to draw attention to is the driver in third, Jamie Caroline, car number 15. He's been in that car for nearly an hour now. He's been on those tyres, more to the point, for nearly an hour and just did that car's best lap of the race, a 1 minute 58.992. So Jamie Caroline, uh, who, given his fairly aggressive driving style, you wouldn't think would be particularly gentle on his tyres. Clearly, that's doing him a disservice. He's looked after the rubber well, and he is absolutely flying. He's actually quicker than the two cars ahead of him. Absolutely so, in that first sector. Yeah, he's doing a good job, isn't he, before he gives the car back to John Ferguson. Marcus Klassen then with a big, big flash of the lights of the traffic up the road. Will Trigertha, another much underrated driver, GT4 champion. Uh, Janessa Starr charges along behind in the Bentley there. Uh, the other gratifying thing about seeing this car in fifth place is, of course, Assetto Motorsport, new to running a Bentley, new to GT3. Yeah. And it's not that old a team. Jim Edwards Jr. and his son-in-law, Simon Traves, who races not only on circuits, but Formula One stock cars where time allows. Uh, they are the brains behind this. And they've taken the step to get into GT3 with perhaps, if you like, one of the older cars, but it's a good car on which to learn. And not only are they learning fast, they're delivering. Uh, now, team manager of car 23, that's the R Racing Aston Martin, being summoned to race control. They've already had one penalty given, and we never quite got to the bottom of what it was, although we had our suspicions it was contact on track. Uh, this one, I think, may be pit stop related. Bryn Lucas uh, uh, dropped us a message a while ago saying that at the end of their most recent pit stop, the car moved and then stopped for a few seconds and then went again, almost as if they were worried about uh, being underneath the regulation time. But there perhaps is a rule about going and stopping. I think it depends where it stops so if it was yes. in the fast lane that's a no-no if it's still in the slow lane 
goes, if you like, towards the next team's box, that might be acceptable. But if they've released it and it stops in the fast lane, that's the, that, that's the issue, I think. Or indeed is going really slowly in fast lane, as we've seen people do in the past, to yeah. try and time yeah. the time it rides at the end of pit lane. So uh, that is a pure speculation, but it seems odd that we were, we were given that information by Bryn Lucas, and then, lo and behold, the team manager summoned to raise control. More information as we get in then. On board with Marcus Clutton, running in fourth position. Uh, yeah, two minute 1.0 for him uh, on that most recent lap. So he is struggling for pace compared to those around him, although has built the gap up to uh, Tregertha to over a second. Somebody else that deserves a bit of a, a credit is James Kell, who's just done number two McLaren's personal best lap. It's still down in 12th place, but uh, James coming good now, having taken over from uh, the uh, Am who started in that car, Simon Watts. Now, into the pit lane has just come Chris Frogger, so the Sky Tempest and Mercedes has pitted, and Joe Osborne has got ahead of Lewis Proctor, so there's a bit of shuffling towards the bottom end of the top 10, as Clutton and Tregertha, with 11 tenths between them, go through Stowe and the Bentley quicker in the first sector of this lap as well. Uh, yes, it is. Again, not a surprise through the high-speed corners through sector one. It's perhaps these tighter sections where the mid-engine McLaren maybe is a little bit more nimble, just gets off the corners a bit quicker. You can see there the Bentley just struggling to get up and go, but as soon as it gets going, it is very, very quick indeed. So uh, Clutton holding on to four, Trigger the fifth, and just in the background, I caught a glimpse there of the black and red red line racing Lamborghini of James Dorlin, which has, of course, been into the pit lane twice, once for a pit stop and once to serve a penalty. James Dorlin may be 33 seconds off the race lead, but he's only three seconds behind these two and closing. And number 23, the uh, Josh Miller, Jamie Day, asked him it was a refueling infringement. Ah, okay. So uh, possibly too many people during the refueling process or work being done at the same time as refueling. So that is why the uh, penalty is, is coming for that car. Right now, down toward the, the investigation is going on, down toward Brooklyn, getting ahead of Ross Wiley, Matty Graham's car. Matty Graham at the wheel of it, the GT4 Porsche, that has to go for an apex and ends up splitting these two. So that's good news for a corner or two, at least for Marcus Clutton, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. There is the Sky Tempesta Mercedes just waiting for the uh, minimum pit stop time to be completed. So uh, it always does strike me as a very relaxed feeling down in the pits during these uh, uh, GT pit stops. They can literally just sit there and watch the stopwatch, let the seconds tick away. Uh, you mentioned there the 51 uh, Porsche of Matty Graham. He is quicker by a bit, actually, than Jack Brown, uh, the GT4 leader. When the, the pit stops were done and Matty Graham jumped into that car, he was about 18 seconds off the lead. He's nine and a half off the lead now, so not nose to tail by any stretch, but the gap coming down pretty quickly. Matty Graham really getting used to that cave of GT4, yeah. and, uh, well, if he stays in the car long enough, could catch the leader before his stint is done. Getting another one into the pit lane, Lewis Proctor. So having lost a place to Joe Osborne, he's now pitted uh, for fourth and fifth. Clapton versus Tregertha. McLaren versus Bentley come down towards Stowe. Remember, all of these cars with two drivers. So on each of the so-called regulation pit stop, a driver change comes. They are refueled, of course, and a new set of Pirelli tyres goes on. So uh, in a number of the cars, you've got the, the differing pace of the so-called Pro, the so-called Am, and that's why cars are rising and falling through the order accordingly. Out of McLaren number five gets Lewis Proctor. Dad Stuart Proctor will take over. This is the refueling part, so only the refueling can go on. Nobody else can go and touch the car or do anything on it. Got to wait and wait and wait until that hose uh, is withdrawn. And then the car controller can give the signal that the mechanics can come forward and change tires, that the drivers can come forward and complete their part of the pit stop, the driver change as well. But you can see how much fuel goes in, how long that takes. Uh, yes, and uh, to emphasize the point about not touching the car whilst refueling is going on, 10 second stop go penalty now for our racing's Aston Martin. That's their second penalty of the day. And we've only just ticked past the halfway point. So that really now does surely take them out of contention. On board with the Sky Tempesta car, then Kevin Say back on board. Jamie had that spin. Uh, in the opening stint because that car would have been right up there, I think, had that not been the case. Uh, but he continues on his way. Uh, Martin Plowman, the car that he is chasing. And also, just to mention, Sandy Mitchell responding now very much to the pressure from Marvin Kirchhoff but with a personal best lap. So 158.5 for Sandy Mitchell. Lead gap now approaching six seconds again. But, of course, we're heading to a point where Sandy's relatively due in for um, Adam Ballon. Marvin Kirchhoff, uh, who came in that car came in later, that means he can go a little bit further before giving way to Alexander West. So it could be that when Alexander West takes over, he rejoins in the lead anyway, because Kirchhoff's laps will have been against 
uh, Adam Ballon's laps. Yes, and West was fractionally quicker than Ballon in their first stint earlier on, so he would then have a decent chance of holding on to that advantage. So uh, you, you need a flow chart sometimes to follow these races, don't you? But I, I really do enjoy the strategic elements of them and the battles that sort of come and go as the race develops. Back on board with the, uh, the Mercedes here then. And uh, yeah, Kevin Say uh, getting to grips with Silverstone quite nicely. And let's see now where he is in relation to those McLarens that we've seen pitting. Number five, for example. Uh, there is five, so that stays ahead, yes, of the Sky Tempesta Mercedes. Jumps ahead on the stops. Uh, so Kevin Say drops back in the pack as a consequence of all of that, but uh, might now be able to bring the gap down whilst Stuart Proctor is getting himself up to speed. Uh, yes, I suspect he might well be able to. Out onto the hangar straight to go. Really good looking car, Alan. Do you like that uh, Sky livery on the Sky Tempesta Racing Mercedes? There, the Greystone GT car that he's chasing. Leader in, down the pit road comes Sandy Mitchell. So the race leader is in, and that is with an hour and 22 minutes to go. And Sandy Mitchell comes into the pit lane at the end of lap 47. That's going to put Marvin Kirchhofer into the lead of the race. And it means there's going to be a lot of shuffling as also in comes Jamie Caroline to give way to John Ferguson. So again, the team's reverse engineering this. How long can we keep our driver in, our, our star driver in for the last stint? Uh, that's what we need. So they now use the amp for the next part of the race. And as soon as they can get Sandy Mitchell, for example, back into the Barwell Lamborghini, that is what they will do. You see the mechanics there with the fire extinguisher while the refueling goes on. In at the other end of the pit lane, at the Ram Racing end, Jamie Caroline arrives for John Ferguson to hop in, another Formula Ford 1600 driver of years past. These two shared the Toyota Supra that Speedworks, remember, at the back end of last season, and now together in the GT3 Mercedes. So the uh, taller Jamie Caroline out, and the refueling now gets underway. They have to stand and wait before anything else can be done on that car. A really good performance, that from Caroline. Under the radar, maybe. We didn't see a lot of him, but his lap times, especially towards the end of the stint, were massively impressive, given the fact he was in the car for at least an hour, maybe 70 minutes. I forget exactly when he made his pit stop, but I think it was around the 30-minute mark. And now he finally uh, comes in to hand that car back over to John Ferguson with an hour and 21 minutes left on the clock. A uh, good look there, by the way, at the witness marks down the left-hand side of the uh, Barwell car. It clearly wasn't anything to worry about. Sandy Mitchell's pace in that stint uh, very much proving the point. So Mitchell out for Ballon, Caroline out for Ferguson. And as you said, Kirk Arthur, for, for the time being at least, takes over the race lead. Just going back to the refueling part, Bryn's been investigating all of this. It is uh, 3.05 litres per second on the flow rate. He uh, is pleased to tell us. Uh, he's clearly got too much time on his hands. There's uh, <laughs> not enough going on in the pit sprint, clearly. There, then, is 72. Adam Ballon back behind the wheel. He is ready to go. And, uh, again, this will be the final stint for him in the car. This, Marvin Kirchhofer, uh, driving in 88, the Garage 59 McLaren. That now takes over the lead of the race. Remember that some of these race-by-race race entrants, therefore, aren't eligible to score points anyway. Adam Ballon goes down the pit lane. So Kirchhofer leads. The order again gets shuffled through this next round of stops. So that is two of the three now done for number 72. So it's a pit stop ahead, notionally, of this McLaren. And when Marvin Kirchhofer comes in, I suspect he will have pulled away from Adam Ballon. And that's going to put Alexander West in a really good position for some of his stint before Sandy Mitchell gets back into the Lamborghini. So it's a real seesaw battle now, isn't it, between Lamborghini and McLaren? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, apologies if this has been mentioned already, but the GT4 leader has pitted at some point. So Will Burns now back uh, into the number 90 car. He's on his outlap now, so that happened very recently. And that means, uh, director reading my mind, I think here, that this car now, Matty Graham takes over the lead of the GT4 category. So the Vluga car was catching the BMW anyway, and now it is released into the uh, lead of the race in GT4. He enjoys a 6.2 second cushion over Darren Turner, who on the previous lap at least couldn't quite match his pace so Darren Turner there right behind the Johnny Adam Mercedes uh, inherits now second in the class and he's only five and a half seconds behind and he's therefore going to move ahead on the next round of pit stops yeah, because there are yes. 14 extra seconds for the silver graded partnership in the Porsche to serve so Darren Turner is going to move ahead was he within 14 seconds of the BMW that would have been tighter I think yeah. that, that may have been yeah. right on the bubble he's going to get so. one place certainly indeed yeah. yes uh, Phil Keane's just come in Darren Turner there is leading in the Pro-Am element of GT4 
but the overall scalps are just as important to them. He's about to go a lap down against Angus Fender in the GT3 BMW. Angus doing a good job. That car's in 12th place. The Neary's, by the way, we've not really touched on for a while. Uh, Richard Neary has taken over number eight again. They're 11th. Alex Malikin has taken over number 32 Lamborghini. That's uh, down for the moment in 10th spot. But again, the order becomes somewhat distorted with some of them serving their second regulation stop. Uh, yes, all side by side there. That's Kevin Sale at the inside of Stuart Proctor. So we anticipated that gap would come down. It did. Uh, and now I think it will go back up again because the Mercedes is in front. It looks the quicker of the two at this point of the race. And so Kevin Say picks up what is 13th place for the time being. Uh, they uh, have fallen a lap behind the leaders because of their second pit stop that they've made. But that Mercedes coming alive in this part of the race. His next target will be Angus Fender in the BMW. Uh, who is about 10 seconds or so on the road. Speaking of BMWs, they're the uh, number nine GT4 car. Wherever you look, there seem to be uh, BMWs at the moment. Uh, the number nine car, third place at the moment in uh, GT4. Somewhere adrift then of the uh, Turner and Cowley scrap for second. Well, there is Angus Fender I was talking about in the uh, GT3 spec BMW. And Matty Graham, the new GT4 leader, then comes down through Brooklyn. So the very, very tall northeaster comes up through Luffield sort of folds himself into the Cayman. Very, very busy bit of racetrack here coming down towards Stoke Corner. You've got there the uh, RJN McLaren that's gone back to Simon Watts. But 77, Marcus Klassen through the pit stops, now second. And ahead, you can see number six Mercedes. Ian Loggy has got back in the wheel of that car. But it's so, so far down the order, of course, having lost 20 minutes earlier on. The best they can hope for, as you heard him say earlier, is some points out of this race. That's about to be lapped in turn by John Ferguson, who is now ninth. And have we had the Bentley in as well? No, Will Tregurtha behind them is still on the lead lap. So actually, because of the traffic look, Marcus Clutton has been able to escape from the clutches of Will Tregurtha. I think of all the cars on the screen there, the only two that are actually fighting for position. They're all on different laps, this group of cars. The number two car of Simon Watts uh, is uh, potentially on... No, that is a lap behind, I think, the John Ferguson Mercedes. And of course, the pink and black Ram Racing Mercedes multiple laps down after its repair work earlier on. So Clutton breaks through the traffic and Will Tregurtha yet to do so. So this is definitely advantage Clutton uh, in the second place to Giro Motorsport McLaren. Uh, but yeah, his lap times and Tregurtha's in fairness continue to be in the two minute ones. Tregurtha to the inside of Ferguson, who's defending almost as if that was for position. They both got the inside of James Kell, who was concerningly slow there into Brooklyn. Whether he was just getting out of the way, I'm not sure, but a uh, uh, big speed differential there. It kind of is for position. I know they're on different laps, but when the Bentley pits, they're going to be on the same lap again, and the Mercedes was ahead of the Bentley. So if John Ferguson drops behind and his lap times are slower, he's losing more time for track position for when the next round of pit stops is done. So in a sense, he does have to defend to try and preserve that, even though at the moment they're on different laps, he needs to stay ahead as best he can to preserve the position for when the Bentley is pitted as well and they're back on the same lap. Uh, on board here, replay with Marcus Clutton, and that was Ferguson having a wobble uh, going into the club sequence of corners, ran a bit wide, Clutton saw the gap on the inside, and the gap very much disappeared. Ferguson was turning in there, whether Clutton was uh, alongside him or not, and uh, for the second time in this race, that number 77 car has to bail out going through club uh, as someone tries to uh, to shut the door in its face. An interesting point you make, actually, and you're absolutely right, of course, as uh, you usually are, uh, this may not be for position at the moment, but these two cars could potentially be fighting for a place come the end of the race. And it makes the marshal's job quite tricky, actually, because blue flag regulations start to get a little bit blurred here. You're not really supposed to actively defend from a car that's a lap ahead of you, as Ferguson clearly is doing, although he does now get overtaken uh, by Tregurthus Bentley. Uh, but given the fact they're both in the same class, they're on different strategies, different points of their race, it, I guess, is a bit more acceptable for Ferguson to get his elbows out and defend the place. Right, Sandy Mitchell down in the pit lane with Bryn Lucas. Bryn, what has he got for you? Well, Sandy, I just said to you, how was that stint? You went a bit lonely, really. Yeah, I mean, we were out front um, and had uh, Kirk Offer in the McLaren closing us down behind. So, yeah, I was just trying to, you know, keep the head and be as consistent as possible through the GT4 traffic and uh, try and avoid the pickup because there's a lot of marbles with uh, a lot of the cars on track. So, yeah, it's difficult out there. But, um, yeah, like I say, uh, we had a little bit of a gap, but these McLarens are looking pretty quick behind us. So um, I think it's going to be pretty close when we come out the pits uh, and it'll be a bit of a sprint race at the end. So, yeah, looking forward to getting back in and uh, seeing what we can do. We saw a bit of damage on the car a little bit earlier on. I mean, you got to sample it. It was only superficial, is my understanding. Yeah, there might be a little bit um, of damage just on uh, a little bit of aero, but um, 
you know, we've still got some pretty decent pace, so we're, yeah, we're still in with a fighting chance of doing well in this race, and uh, yeah, we'll see how we get on when, uh, when I next get in, and uh, yeah, Adam's doing a good job so far, so hopefully he can keep it consistent. Good stuff, good stuff. Cheers, thank you. So riding on board then, heading down Angus Strait, and uh, Adam Ballon at the wheel of the Lamborghini. Now that is currently sixth, but it's the best place of the two pit stoppers now. So Adam Ballon ahead on the pit stops. Now we've got a 10 second stop go penalty for the Sky Tempesta Mercedes. The Sky Tempesta Mercedes, a 10 second stop go penalty. Uh, the door came open during the refueling, I understand. So that's a violation of the pit stop refueling regulation and 10 seconds stop go penalty for car number 93 uh, therefore has to be served. So a spin makes progress, penalty, has to make progress again. Yeah, that is a shame. And of course, both of the delays coming in Kevin Say's stints. So he's not really been able to show uh, the best of himself in this race, has he? Uh, Chris Salkeld in then in the number nine BMW that's been contesting for podium places in GT4 all day long. Uh, also saw on that graphic that came up to tell us about the penalty for 93, that there is an incident between cars two and 77 under investigation. Car two is the Rocket RJM McLaren. 77 is the Enduro Motorsport car that currently runs second in the race and I think might be about to inherit the race lead because Marvin Kirkhofer brings the race lead in Garage 59 car into the pit lane. So the fascination now, having pitted a couple of laps later than Barwell, the gap was, what, the hovering between five and six seconds before the pit stops. What will it be when that car rejoins the track? I think the Clutton simon Watts incident, I think we saw it going up towards Village. The two of them sort of banged side to side. Uh, Marcus Clutton was getting through the traffic and Simon Watts was sort of in the middle of the road. And I think... Uh, there was a bit of confusion as to who had what line. It might have been that, there might have been something else, but we certainly saw that bit of rubbing. There might have been something else, but I don't think we saw anything other than the incident I mentioned. So yes, as you say, Kurt Kerfer is pity to give way to Alexander West. Marcus Clatton's going to get the lead back, but because that car is stopping later on the final pit stop, it will again fall behind the uh, cars of Barwell and Garage 59. Uh, Kevin Say is at the wheel of this car, which has got to serve this 10 second stop go penalty and there is Adam Ballon through the traffic look further back down the road you can see coming towards us number 77 so that is Marcus Clatton and this now is the second part of the pit stop for the car that led when it came in so Marvin Kirkhoff it gives way to Alexander West and it gets a new set of Pirellis so from a driver's point of view brand new tyres the car's going to feel absolutely fantastic yeah, best feeling in the world, racing drivers tell me that when they jump into the car and it's got brand new tyres on and they can just go for it. Of course, you've got to temper that enthusiasm a little bit in a race like this. You can't just go out there uh, and immediately start putting in purple sectors. Got to manage those tyres uh, for the whole stint. We've some, some, seen some people doing 60, 70 minute stints. You don't want to burn that rubber off uh, in the first few laps of that stint. So uh, got to manage that a little bit. Kirk Arthur then handing over to Alexander West, the pit stop about halfway through now, you'd imagine. Uh, where on track is the Adam Ballon car? It's in the third, oh, there it is, uh, coming out of uh, Aintree down the Wellington Strait. So in the next 30 seconds or so, David, we'll have a real idea of what this lead gap is. And indeed, at the relative pace of the two drivers, which is the other intriguing part of this, as down now through uh, Brooklands comes Adam Ballon down the pit lane, goes Alexander West, but he can't go foot to the board yet. But I reckon that car's going to come out ahead because now out of Luffield into Woodcut Corner comes Adam Ballon. Out of the pit lane will go the McLaren. So Marvin Kirchhoff has laps against Adam Ballon's laps have put that car in the lead. But equally, Adam Ballon is up to speed. There's the leader. So that's going to be, I would suggest, around about 10 seconds or so. And they were the other way round by about six seconds mm. before the uh, Barwell car stopped. So that's about a 15 second or so uh, gain, potentially. The uh, pit stop time, you would imagine, is not going to be uh, uh, in question. Surely Garage 59, a team of their experience, wouldn't make that mistake. Garage 59 quicker by seven tenths of a second, but both were legal in terms of the delta time. And seven tenths is neither here nor there, yeah. really. Uh, so I can only say it must have been Marvin Kirkhofer's lap times relative to Adam Ballard that gave the car that lead effectively. Wow, okay, so when this all shakes out, it should be this car that holds the race lead after the second round of pit stops. It uh, uh, currently, of course, is going to be a little bit further down the order, probably fourth on the road because 77, 28 and 75 at the front have yet to make their second regulation stop. Uh, but what an advantage they have over the car behind. Well, it was a brilliant stint for Marvin Kirkover, especially the final few laps of it. It's given him potentially the race lead and he's down in the pit lane now with Bryn. It really was a brilliant few laps there, Marvin. How did that feel for you? 
Yeah, so far so good. I mean, the race is still on, so still a lot of time to go. But yeah, car's feeling all right with it. Good improvements. Um, credits to the team. They've been really working hard to get that car in a good shape after qualifying. Wasn't very promising, but yeah, looking good so far. And you're really chasing or trying to chase down Sandy Mitchell, who's a pretty uh, rapid peddler, isn't he, around here? Yeah, definitely. I mean, he knows that track probably yeah, a bit better than me. I've been here also before, but probably not as much as him. But yeah, he's done a good job, especially yesterday in qualifying. Um, he was showing what he and the Lambo was capable of doing around here. So yeah, good job from him. What's the message that's gone to Alex as he's just headed out then? Is it just, you know, do what you can or? Well, we're both pretty relaxed. I just told them, yeah, car's feeling all right. Um, you managed the first and very good. Just keep on doing what you've been doing and I'm sure you will. Great stuff. Cheers, Marvin. Cheers. Thank you. So Marvin Kirko for stands and watches. Uh, of course, the one advantage that briefly Adam Ballon has is he knows what the car is doing. Alexander West uh, fresh into it, but the gap between those two was 11.2 seconds when they crossed the line. I was guesstimating 10. <coughs> A million miles away but it is a huge huge gap now um just to finish off a sky tempesta topic that penalty driver not responding because the radio is not working properly so the team is trying to get the message through this is where they have to be creative and go back to the old days of the pit board to say in 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 but the sky tempesta uh, mercedes now has a radio issue uh, and that's why for the moment kevin say is unable to get the, the message about the penalty and therefore come into the pit lane. Number eight there, Richard Neary pressing on. Ahead of him on the road is Johnny Adam, but Richard Neary is a pit stop ahead and therefore a lap down on the car that he's chasing directly. Uh, yes, indeed, the uh, black and blue 2 Cs Motorsport uh, Mercedes AMG, which was, a, of course, a black and blue Mercedes for 2 Cs that won this race last year. Not that car, though, actually. Apparently, that car is the... Um, the yellow one, the uh, the James Cottingham started car, uh, which unfortunately didn't get that far. Lewis Williamson not even getting a go in it. That is actually the chassis that won this race a year ago. Very differing fortunes 12 months on, that must be said. So down the uh, hangar straight they head. Richard Neary in 10th position uh, as he came across the line last time around. The car looks remarkably intact given the, the hit that it gave the Cottingham car on that opening lap. There's absolutely no visible damage to the front of it. It's like Rasputin, this Mercedes. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you do to it, it won't die. It just keeps on going. Uh, and I'll tell you what, Abba Racing, good Northwesterners, they build the car strong, don't they? And uh, Richard Neary bringing it back into the mix. Of course, bear in mind that incident from the first lap which took out number four Mercedes on the spot, which badly delayed number six Mercedes. That's the surviving car effectively, number eight you've just been looking at. That incident is going to be investigated after the race. So where it takes the flag may not be where it is classified. Excellent news. Right then, uh, <laughs> more confusion to add to the, oh. uh, the championship standings this year. And sorry, a black flag is now being shown uh, to yeah. Kevin Say because they've not responded to the penalty. They've had the three laps that you need to come in. And so now the race director, Peter Daly, has no option but to show the black flag. That's not exclusion. That means you must come into the pit lane. What happens after that is down to the race director's discretion. But of course, the driver is more likely to spot that flag and board coming out over the starting gantry because as a racing driver, knowing you've got a radio, you're no longer training yourself to look for a pit board as such, but a black flag or something. Yes, you're expected to notice that. So now he'll get the message to come in. And uh, that is really, really unfortunate. Kevin Say having no luck at all today. No, indeed. Uh, so Kevin Say is going to be shown the black flag, which means come into the pit lane, report to the uh, race officials. As you look at Darren Turner, who is currently leading the Pro-Am element of GT4 and is second overall in GT4. Only now 3.6 seconds adrift of Matty Graham in the Veluga Cayman that leads. So Darren Turner doing what you expect, the, the sort of USB style of Darren Turner, plug and play, in he gets and delivers fast lap after fast lap. There is number 93 Mercedes heading towards the timing line. A black flag beckons. The inboard is being waved, almost thrown at Kevin Say. One assumes this is the point where he thinks, I wonder who number 93 is. There's a flag <laughs> going out for that car. But uh, hopefully the message gets through to the Macanese driver because it would be a real shame if this were to go no further in the race because the radio has gone down, as I said a few minutes ago, and the penalty message has not got through to the driver. It's amazing how often that happens, though, isn't it? That a driver that's trying to be contacted desperately by its team uh, suddenly has a... a malfunctioning radio but uh, yeah I do hope they there there is the pit box I think the next step is to throw it at the car when it yes, gets across right. the line and yes. to see if that gets Kevin Say's attention hopefully it doesn't come to that this is uh, this is sort of what Kevin Say saw as he came through and yes acknowledges either the black flag or the pit board or both so I think he's got the message uh, should be heading in this time 
Yeah, so as we've been saying, the team coping with a broken radio, but uh, the old fashioned way of a pit board and uh, lots of gesticulations will hopefully bring him in, but let's hope it's not too late. Anyway, yeah. the car will be due in this time. Uh, it was due in last time and it was due in the time before, but anyway, it's coming in, I think we can safely say this time. And we're nudging our way, Andy, towards the start of the third and final hour of the race now. Uh, currently, Marcus Klassen is leading from Joe Osborne and the gap was down by a Nat Semi crotchet last time because those McLarens are very evenly matched. Johnny Adam is running third on the racetrack and then it is Alexander West who is being caught by Adam Ballant. So the gap was over 11 seconds, 11.2. It's now 9.6. So we do have a race on our hands between the AMs. And bear in mind, the pros get another stint. Uh, yes, this is the Ballant car. It's right behind the leading car, but of course a lap separating them for the time being, that being the blue and orange uh, McLaren of Enduro Motorsport. Marcus Clutton trying to uh, navigate some of this lapped traffic. In fact, that's the Paddock Motorsport car ahead of Martin Plowman. He's got himself into sixth place now, but does sort of owe us, if you like, uh, this uh, second mandatory stop on board then uh, with Adam Ballon as he heads through Abbey Corner normally pretty much flat out but with this much traffic up the road that's the uh, Newbridge Motorsport Aston Martin to be negotiated having to really back up the entry speed there to make sure they get through cleanly a big chunk of debris to the right there as they went into the loop and uh, that will be cause for concern don't want to be running over things like that they avoid it for now. They go past another bit of uh, bodywork on the exit of the corner. The uh, the side of the circuit rather telling the story of what was a bruising opening hour or so of this race. 93 you saw in the pit lane. So yes. uh, the uh, assorted communication methods have uh, been now successful. And the pigeon that was the next option has been stood <laughs> down. So the car is in and uh, hopefully that's going to be allowed back into the races. Now, Adam Ballon comes up towards the line and just look at this wave of cars that's ahead of him and his heart must sink because he's got to try and clear those as quickly as he can. Alexander West, I think, has already done so. That might actually be why the gap came down because now uh, West to Ballon is a slightly greater gap as they go through. But Marcus Klassen is the on-the-road race leader. For the moment, you've got Martin Plowman, in fact, as well, ahead of Adam Ballon, but he is out of sequence because that car's got another pit stop due. So although he's ahead on the road, it's not ahead in real terms. Marshall there at Beckett's waving the blue flag. Uh, good luck with that. There is not that much room at that part of the circuit, at least, uh, for these GT4 cars to get out of the way. Now onto the hangar straight, they can pull aside. Uh, in amongst this group is that Beluga Racing Porsche. You can see the number 51, which ducks out behind Adam Ballon, still leading in GT4 in anticipation of that car being back in the pit lane before much longer, though. Through Stowe they go. Several different lines being used through the uh, right-hander as uh, that was the uh, Janetta. Who's in that now? It's Freddie Tomlinson in the Assetto. Uh, Janetta number 56 runs a bit wide and uh, he is not fighting the Motus 1 McLaren, the green and white McLaren for position, so dives up the inside. He is, though, fighting the Aston Martin there, which is recovering after yet another penalty. It's second of the day and that is for um, position for about ninth place, I think that is, in GT4. So, busy, busy racetrack, as we say, and on the road at the moment, Marcus Klassen leading from Joe Osborne, the gap again down by a few tenths last time around. Johnny Adam is third and falling away a little bit in the traffic as there, number 27 then, turns through. The Aston Martin, which is the Darren Turner-driven car, 23, the much penalised Aston ahead. Now, the team manager of car seven to race control, that is the GT4 McLaren of Ed McDermott and Michael Broadhurst. That's under on its last pit stop, that's why. So that's a pit stop infringement that's coming for that car. And we get to the end of the second hour with the race leader having done 57 laps. And again, tempting fate, we've gone without interruption thus far. So as the leaders come up towards the completion of the lap through the traffic, being uh, respectful of the back markers, equally the back markers trying to get out of the way but not impede their own races. It's always that fine line, isn't it, as we were discussing earlier. And we saw, actually, in the context of GT4, how they order a shuffle. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, back into the pit lane comes Kevin Say. Now, he's already served the penalty, so this now must be the end of his seemingly quite short second stint. We've still got just under an hour to go. I, I forget how long Chris Froggart was in the car earlier on. Um, but uh, ah, we're hearing they may have been tinkering with the radio when it came in the last time, and now it comes in to serve the penalty then. So that's the, that's the theory. So the first time it came in, oddly wasn't to serve the penalty, and yes, it comes in and out of the penalty box, and now it's sent back on its way. I don't think that was 10 seconds. It was stationary for. That looked like a stop go, not a 10 second stop go. It was very quick. It, anyway, <laughs> we will see. Um, it, it stopped, uh, which is good. Uh, there is Matt Cowley bailing to give way 
to Marco Signoretti, or is it the other way around? Cowley brought it in. Yeah, no, so Signoretti is about to do his second stint, isn't he? Uh, so GT4 cars coming in a bit later than GT3. Fuel goes in. You can see the damage <laughs> sustained on the first. Now, I'm surprised, actually, that hasn't been required to be taped up. Uh, yeah, it is only a little bit of bodywork, but uh, yes, normally that's the kind of thing that uh, that would get uh, mentioned by uh, the clerk of the course. Uh, uh, interestingly, the look, the, the refueling method for stop. the uh, for Mustang is to open the boot. That's where the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the fuel goes in. I don't think I've ever seen that before in a racing car. That's uh, something unique. Well, the fact that it gets an awful lot of fuel, two churns, it's like coming yes. with an alcoholic, <laughs> isn't it? To sort of pour it in. Uh, you heard the voice in the background of race director Peter Daly saying a four step and uh, four second stop go penalty for number seven uh, for the pit stop infringement and uh, ready to go in the Team Brit garage is Aaron Morgan who would take over from Bobby Trundley on the next pit stop and that car actually is doing a remarkably good job in a really nice and solid 20th place overall having said that it's only done one of its pit stops and many of the GT4 contingent now have done two Yes, so they are uh, doing this the opposite way around to everybody else, yeah. really. They're going to have shorter stints at the end of the race rather than the start. But, uh, yeah, that's the first time we've mentioned them, all race. And I think that's a good thing, given the way this race has been at times. Uh, not being mentioned means you're staying out of trouble. And uh, that is a big, big part, as we've said all along, of uh, getting to the end of this race in a good position. So from third place in GT4, then Matt Cowley uh, pits for the Canadian driver, Marco Signoretti, to get back on board. The lead gap at the moment in GT4 between Matty Graham and Darren Turner. Now that's right down to 2.8 seconds. That is the smallest that margin's been uh, for quite some time as pro driver Darren Turner, very, very, very pro driver uh, Darren Turner, chases down the silver graded driver Matty Graham, who is quick by silver graded driver standards certainly, but uh, perhaps not as quick as uh, Darren Turner. So that gap coming down, but of course it's the number nine car now driven by Tom Rawlings that was leading the race before it made its second round of pit stops. That car is running several places further back. Look, seventh in GT4 right now. Uh, it will all come out in the wash, but we might have to wait a little time uh, for the uh, order to become uh, obvious to us. Track limits warnings are plenty, one of them for Joe Osborne, <laughs> which I'll be sure to remind him of next time he's in the uh, commentary box talking about people exceeding track limits. Joe, a uh, regular co-commentator on the British GT Championship, and he's not out there driving a McLaren somewhere around the world. On the screen, though, you can see the uh, John Ferguson driven Mercedes and there the Darren Turner driven Aston Martin so Turner 2.8 seconds behind Matty Graham at the start of this lap and uh, Matty Graham in the first sector was two tenths quicker in the second two tenths slower so they're matching each other uh, on this lap the 55th lap of the race for the GT4 cars to give you some idea of how many times they're being lapped here the overall race leader Marcus Clutton just started his 60th lap of the race so already the GT3 contingent slipping uh, so four or five laps down, as you would expect. But uh, these cars may be slower than the GT3 cars. They may not look quite as aggressive with all of the um, aerodynamic bits and bobs, technical term, uh, around the cars. But uh, make no mistake, they are still very, very rapid bits of kit. You stand trackside when these GT4 cars go past and uh, you know about it. They are still spectacular to watch. Very quick, much more production based, but certainly not a road car by any stretch of the imagination. And there you can see the much more aggressive aero of the two C's motorsport Mercedes, which tries uh, to get around the outside of Darren Turner, but has to wait for a corner exit. So back through Woodcote goes that uh, Mercedes, which currently runs third. Johnny Adams still yet to uh, conclude his opening stint. He is 23 seconds, though, behind Joe Osborne and not at the moment uh, lapping quite as quickly as him. But if you think about this, Johnny Adams got another stint to do and only 55 minutes of the race remain. So it's going to be a pretty short stint for Flick Hague when she gets back into that car, I would suggest, so that Johnny Adam can bring that to the end. So uh, number 75 still has a, a chance of a good result, I would have thought, out of this. Darren Turner, in the meantime, looking mighty as ever in GT4. So there is 77, which is Marcus Klassen. And that car has two uh, stops yet to do. You've got to do a regulation three. It has done one. So has Joe Osborne in second place. So has Johnny Adam in third. But fourth, Alexander West. Only one more pit stop to do. Adam Ballon, one more pit stop to do. John Ferguson, one more pit stop to do. And then Alex Malikin, he's got two more to do. Uh, well, Carl's got two more to do because the uh, third stop that it's been credited with was its stop-go penalty from earlier on. So the uh, teams with a third stop to get out of the way are looking good, whereas Clutton, Osborne and Johnny Adam needing to serve a second. Team Brit into the pit lane now. 
as they are. So that's uh, Aaron Morgan getting in. Aaron, who's uh, done quite a bit of club level racing, things like BMW Compact Cup before moving into uh, GT4 racing in a number of different categories. Brick car, for example, now on into British GT. So he will take over from Bobby Trundley after what was quite a, a lengthy stint there, as we've documented, that is only their second stop of the day. Uh, most, if not all, of the GT4 cars, with the exception of the leading two, have long since made that second stop uh, of the race. Still, though, as David said, awaiting for three of our GT3s to do so. One of them is on your screen now, and that is Joe Osborne. Again, pro driver, even on much older tyres, significantly quicker there than Adam Ballon. And through he goes, but Ballon, by AM standards, is still very competitive indeed. Into the pit lane comes the GT4 leader. Uh, so that will now give Darren Turner the lead of the GT4 category as Joe Osborne continues on his way. Joe Osborne, personal best lap on that last lap. Eight tenths quicker than the leader, Marcus Clutton. But the gap's not really coming down significantly, is it? Uh, Twelve and a half seconds, whereas really the McLaren standout has been Marvin Kirchhoff for hustling yeah. that car not only into the lead, but also doing the fastest lap of the race. There is John Ferguson's Mercedes coming on to Hangar Straight, and behind is Alex Malikin and then Johnny Adams. So Johnny Adam is a lap up, but it was Ferguson versus Malikin for position there. That's the next fight to look for uh, once we've got that GT4 pit stop out of the way. There, look, John Ferguson versus Malikin. The Lamborghini trying to fend off Johnny Adam, although that's a lap ahead, but also go after the other Mercedes. Johnny Adam ducks up the inside at the end of Vale. Job done. That's how you do do a pass there. Uh, yes, Malikin, of course, uh, was uh, in trouble for uh, that robust overtake on uh, Adam Ballon in his opening stint of the race. And now he might have to line up another good move to try and find a way past John Ferguson, who's proven in the past he ain't an easy man to get through. So, uh, yeah, that could be a good battle here once Johnny Adam uh, negotiates the uh, two seas racing. Mercedes, uh, sorry, the Ram Racing Mercedes, excuse me, uh, ahead of him to uh, Mercedes AMG's run out of different teams. Ferguson uh, isn't going to move out of the way again. Why should he? Uh, but he does run a little bit wide, actually, and unintentionally perhaps makes the job a bit easier for Johnny Adam. Adam goes through, and as Ferguson is wide through Aintree, that costs him momentum down the Wellington Strait, and this surely is Malikin's chance. He goes to the inside. Ferguson isn't going to leave many spaces. It's dirty down the uh, driver's left down the Wellington Strait as well. Never mind, says Malikin. I'll just go around the outside instead. Dead. That's brilliant driving. Oh, and he is shoveled off the road almost. I don't think they quite touched, but it was very, very close. And Ferguson, what did I just say? Not an easy man to overtake. And Alex Malikin would concur and now <laughs> comes into the pit lane. So that is to get his final stint done and put James Dorlin in it for the remainder of the race. And that could be significant because, again, James Dorlin will lack quicker than John Ferguson. So that on the next round of pit stops should put the Lamborghini ahead, I will offer you. This is what happened. He went to the outside line and I was in agreement with you. It was a great move. But John Ferguson ran him out to the edge of the road over the curve went Malikin and he jinked to the right and he backed out of it to avoid contact, which was sensible, especially if he knew he was coming in. Yeah, exactly. Because if you stand your ground there and the other driver squeezes you, you end up on the grass, you can't stop, you slide into them at Luffield. We've seen that happen so many times over the years and Malikin really heads up driving there. I think they've got half a chance of a podium still here, Redline Racing, yeah. certainly a top five because uh, to be up there uh, fighting away with this number 15 car, they both at that point had served the same number of pit stops as well uh, and that car we know is in podium contention so a really good recovery this after the early penalty. Neary's back in, Richard to hand over to Sam so this is their second pit stop um, being uh, no, their third pit stop being complete. So this yes. is the final stint uh, beginning for Sam Neary. So we're getting to that time of the race now where finally we can start making some sense of all of this. Final pit stops being made for some of our leading teams. So that is James Dorlin getting in to replace Alex Malikin in the red line racing Lamborghini that started on the front row. And I think you're right. There is still a good result in the offing for this car. James Dorlin is yet another of these very quick underrated drivers. Sam Neary, BRDC rising star, gets into number eight Mercedes. But again, that's got this post-race investigation looming over it. And we'll see what comes of that. Keep an eye to the British GT Championship website where all the news will be posted as it breaks. The team manager of number 68 is having to go and see the race director now. And that's the Team Brit operation, isn't it? So the Team Brit McLaren has done something. Uh, and the team required to go and see the race director as the screen is cleared for the Sam Neary Mercedes. In some cases, it's a bit of spit and polish. In other cases, they have these tear-off windscreens, a bit like tear-off visors that single-seater drivers used to have. So rather than having to clean the screen, you just pick up the corner and rip that film off, and then you've got a lovely clean windscreen underneath. But there's only so many of those that you can run, so uh, tend to be used really for the longer distance races, like uh, 24 hours of Spa, for example. 
Now there is number 90. That is the BMW that Will Burns is now back behind the wheel of. Two pit stops done. Uh, making his way up towards Village. So that car is uh, currently ahead in its class within uh, the GT4 category. But uh, as a result of getting ahead of the Beluga Porsche on the last round of pit stops. Yes, their race, the number 90, uh, is reminding me an awful lot of uh, the uh, Newbridge race here 12 months ago. I seem to remember Newbridge Motorsport, who went on to win the GT4 category, didn't lead that many laps. They were sort of playing their own strategy game, getting a lot of the stops out early, and they weren't actually at the front of the GT4 field for a, a significant portion of the race. But when it all sort of shook out at the end of the race, they found themselves in front. A very similar feel here for the 90 car. I'm not saying it's going to end the same way for them. I'm sure they will hope it does. Uh, but they, they may not have led many laps. They're certainly going to be in contention uh, when the chequered flag falls in 48 and a half minutes or so. There is uh, Ross Wiley, who dropped behind Burns on the previous lap because he's just come out of the pit lane. And as Matty Graham goes over the timing line into the pits, comes the McLaren of Marcus Clutton to give up the on-the-road lead. So that's now going to put itself back in the order, if you like, where it ought to be. Yes, so he was 6.4 seconds ahead of Joe Osborne when he did. There he is. I mean, you can see why they cleaned the windscreen. The uh, visibility is not ideal. Just going back to GT4 very quickly to say that the number 42 Audi has now done its three pit stops. Ah. So Senan Fielding has taken over and he will run to the end. So the Audi that's dropped off the radar a bit of late is about to come very much back onto it uh, because it's going to buy back a load of places as others serve their last pit stop in GT4. So that's building up nicely too. Yeah, it'd be a shame if they weren't in the conversation for the race win come the end of the day, given their performance yesterday. Uh, but uh, yes, that, uh, those issues early in the race, unfortunately, putting paid uh, to that. Car 68 has a stop-go penalty for a short pit stop. So Team Brit, short pit stop, that's the voice of the race director, Peter Daly. And while all that's going on, the team manager of the WPI Lamborghini has got to go to race control as well. Michael Igo, Phil Keane uh, for something. It's not a pit stop penalty as such, because in, in terms of being short on the time, because that's OK. Uh, we can see it's last stop time on our timing screens, and that was good. Adam Ballon, fifth on the road. That's going to change at the end of his next lap with others pitting ahead of him. Darren Turner's just come into the pits, by the way, the GT4 leader. Stop go penalty for Team Britain, as we've been hearing, and that's Marcus Clatton uh, in. And that car now is given back to Morgan Tilbrook. But again, he's got another pit stop not far away. Yeah, they're leaving it late here, aren't they? Those top three, we've had these very different strategies, 77, 28, and 75 staying out longer each stint. So they're going to have short stints at the end, uh, which means they can be light on fuel, I guess, if they're going to be doing shorter stints towards the end of the race, uh, whereas some of the others are choosing to, to go longer uh, through the second part, having done their short stints earlier on. So the pit stop nearly complete for Enduro Motorsport. Door comes back open, shuts again. That was Morgan opening the door from the inside. Perhaps he felt it wasn't shut properly. Worth double checking. The last thing you want to do is go out on track and have it open. And a mechanic just ran around the car just as we were cutting away. A mechanic yeah. went to the car. So it might be that there is an issue. Yes, look, because the door is back open and the mechanic helping. Now, OK, you've, you've got this delta tie, but you don't want to be too long in the pit lane. As now down the pit road comes the Adam Ballon that was coming back in uh, to give away maybe to Sandy Mitchell. Let's just double check in a moment. It was Adam Ballon. So, as we've been saying, short stints, the second stints for the Ams. And there's a problem here very clearly. Marcus Clutton, I'm afraid, giving way to Morgan Tilbrook. There's a problem. And Adam Ballon comes in to give way to Sandy Mitchell then as disaster seems to have struck. Does it not for 77? Is it that the car won't restart? Yeah, they've been in there now for getting on for three minutes. It should be about two and a quarter minutes, shouldn't it? Yeah. So there's, there is a problem. They're going to shut the door now. They're going to send him on his way. Or does or it go back into the, the garage? Box. Yeah. yeah. There's no movement at the moment. Back up on the jacks. Yeah, so it looks like they're going to have to take it back to the garage regardless. It does have all the hallmarks of a car that won't start. This car 18 has a 10-second stop-go penalty for refueling irregularity. The door was open. Car 18, that was. Thank you, Peter Daly. So it was good on the time for Keen and I go, but the door opened during the refueling. Everything has got to be, as we were saying, uh, closed. Don't touch the car. So Sandy Mitchell is on board. Adam Ballon's Lamborghini Barwell, you've got to say, has had a pretty horrible start to its season. Car in the gravel at Imola in Fanatec GT, way off the pace at Alton Park. Didn't race last week at Brands Hatch because of a poorly driver. Mark Lemmer's team deserves a bit of good fortune. And this really is the race where you put money on Barwell because they are so good at understanding uh, the 
strategy of all of this. And with Sandy Mitchell in this car, that's its last pit stop done. This now will run to the end. The only reason it would come into the pit lane again is with a problem and or penalty. Yeah, twice in the last six years, this race has been won by Barwell Motorsport. There's a reason that they have <laughs> such a, a strong hit rate when it comes to winning the Silverstone 500. Uh, they uh, started this race on pole position as well. And that traditionally, if you like stats, which I do, has been a good place to start because in the last 10 years, the GT3 race has been won from pole position three times from the front row seven times. And they were the pole position car at the start of the race. So uh, stats don't guarantee your results, but certainly the history books would suggest that this car is going to be hard to beat as it heads out now for its final stint. Indeed so. And Sandy Mitchell didn't get picked up by the Lamborghini factory because he had a nice accent. It's because <laughs> he's a very, very quick driver. So you can anticipate that car to be just as good for the remaining 43 and a half minutes as he goes back out onto the circuit. And as I say, this now will run to the very end of the race. Yes, it will. So uh, down towards Maggots and Beckett's he goes, trying to see who's around him on track, see if we can gauge where he is. Well, uh, unhelpfully, he's got the uh, multiple laps down round racing car just behind, uh, which is now 29th overall and ninth within GT3. So it would still score a handful of points with Ram Racing. So I guess the point that Ian Loggy made earlier on was a valid one. Get out there, finish inside the top 10 in class, and you will at least get some points towards your championship campaign. The team manager of the Sky Tempest at Mercedes is being uh, asked to go and see uh, the race director, which might be a legacy of not responding initially to its uh, penalty. We, it might be something else. We shall find out. But the day doesn't get any better for Chris Froggatt, uh, nor for Kevin Say. I do wonder, because we said we saw that it came in first to fix the radio, then to serve the penalty. I wonder if the little wave that Kevin Say gave was to his team not to acknowledge the black flags. The team were calling him in, perhaps didn't know about the penalty, because surely that should have been served first. Oh, that's what the black flag means. Come yeah. in, doesn't it, and see the race director. There's number 11 uh, going through, which is... Uh, Andrew Howard. Uh, this car had a 10 second stop go penalty from earlier on uh, because it was, sorry, a 25 second stop go penalty because it was under on its first pit stop time. So it has done three stops, but only two are regulation pit stops. So it's got two to go. And effectively, therefore, it's uh, running well out of position. So uh, that car, for the moment, looks like it's doing pretty well. But actually, because one of those stops was a penalty stop, it ain't quite as good as. Uh, it's, it's evidence suggests. 72, though, is looking pretty mighty. Out of Ballon and Sandy Mitchell coming now into Woodcock Corner through that fast right up towards the timing line, down towards Cops Corner. They're going through ahead is number 75, which is Johnny Adam that is now the on-the-road leader of the race. Now, that car has got two more pit stops to due car 93 in 40 minutes. A two second stop go penalty for a short pit stop. 93, two second stop go penalty for being too short on its last pit stop. Right, okay, so I was wrong. It was a different reason now. They're running out of reasons to penalise that car at the moment, aren't they? So uh, too short a pit stop. They can't blame that on the radio either, unfortunately, or lack of radio. So they have to come in and serve the two seconds, presumably, that they were short uh, in the pit stop. Johnny Adam leads the race. Haven't said that yet, I don't think, have we today? It may well be because of uh, the fact he owes us his next pit stop, his first pit stop, that car's second pit stop of the day, but he is leading the way with Alexander West in second place, so the race leader has stopped once, the second through to fifth place cars have stopped twice, and then you start getting into those uh, that have made their final pit stops with Sandy Mitchell in sixth and uh, Andrew Howard, although that's, uh, that has served two regulation pit stops and one penalty, of course. So uh, the order very much jumbled up still with 40 minutes to go. I'm really interested to see now how much time they give Flick Haig in the next stint because we, we don't have the data available for how much time Johnny Adam has spent in the car collectively, uh, but it could be that she only gets a couple of laps and, and therefore they absolutely max out Johnny Adam for the remainder of the race. Well, you would, I suppose, when you've got Johnny Adam at your disposal, you want to keep him in oh, the car totally agree, as yeah. long as you can. So uh, and that's absolutely no disrespect to Flick Hague or any of these AM drivers. We talk a lot about, you know, getting the pros in, getting the AMs out. The AMs against other AMs do a good job. They're all really quick uh, and they're all really capable of running at the front. But in a race like this one, where you have AMs sharing the track with pro drivers, you really do need to try and keep your pro in for as long as possible, because even by the AMs admissions, the pros are there because they're quicker, because they are the professional drivers. And so, yeah, Johnny Adam uh, will really, uh, they'll, they'll want to make sure that he does as much of the 100 minute maximum driving time that he's allowed. 
Now there is the 56 Porsche, which is the Seb Hopkins Jamie Orton entry that had uh, a early penalty. And this Audi, we mentioned a little while ago, but let's just make the point again, has done its three regulation stops. So Senn and Fielding here is good to take this car to the end and therefore places are going to fall its way as others have to uh, peel in and serve their stops. Uh, yes, so ninth in class, as you said, at the moment then, Senn and Fielding, 28th place overall. And he finds himself uh, about a lap and a half or so, nearly two laps behind the race leader in GT4. But again, they owe more pit stops. Final stop done then for Stella. And uh, where will they shake out? Even if it's not a race win, I guess they might be satisfied with a podium. And I think that's definitely uh, within their grasp come the end of the race. Pit lane for the time being is a relatively quiet place. We've got Chris Froggart in serving his latest penalty. Marcus Klutnin, of course, still uh, with this issue with the car. Uh, we have got our racing in, our racing who have been on and off uh, contending at the front of the GT4 field. But again, they've had two penalties uh, handed to them over the course of the race. And the number 23 car in this time, I believe, for one of its regulation stops. So that should be Jamie Day jumping back in. Josh Miller getting out on board, though, with the Stellar Audi. Blue Cops corner. It's just wide enough over the curves to carry the speed, but not so wide uh, that he gets pinged for track limits. Meanwhile, Johnny Adam has got the Sandy Mitchell Lamborghini behind. So again, a lapse between these two at the moment, but Mitchell is on much fresher tyres than Johnny Adam. Mitchell right at the start of his stint, Adam towards the end of his, and I wonder if in fact Adam's going to pit. Yes, he is. Takes a tight line out of Bluffield, so that was perfect for Mitchell. He caught the Mercedes, he was held up for a corner or two, and then Johnny Adam bails for the pit lane. So Flick Hay gets in, and as David quite rightly said, it may be a short stint here for Flick. Get within, they'll calculate how much longer they can have Johnny Adam in the car for get to that point of the race and then they'll plug him in again towards the end of the race itself. Alexander West is in with Marvin Kirker for getting in. Now this is this car's final pit stop. So car number three making its stop. This is going to be interesting. In a lap's time, where does this come out in relation to the Sandy Mitchell driven Barwell Lamborghini? Mitchell's back into the mid one minute 59s, whereas Alexander West, I think, has been in the two minute zeros, two minute ones. So Mitchell's had a few laps out there on fresh rubber. He's been getting his head down. The car he is chasing is now in the pit lane for the final time. And uh, when it leaves the pit lane, we'll have a genuine race then for what could well be the race victory. So uh, this is really a crucial stop now. Get everything right, uh, Muster Garage 59. No penalties. Make sure they don't um, break the minimum pit stop time. Same goes, of course, for 2Cs Motorsport, who are very much still contending for the uh, podium places, even if it's not the overall race victory. Sandy Mitchell, purple in sector one. So doing exactly what he needs to here. The team, I'm sure, will have been on the radio to tell him that Garage 59 are in. This is the lap, it's make or break now. Can he jump back ahead of the McLaren when it comes back onto the track? Through Village and then into the loop. There is the McLaren with Marvin Kirkhofer now on board. They've got everything done. They will send him on his way very shortly. Now we're into the final sector pretty much here with uh, Sandy Mitchell who comes down the Wellington straight. Purple in the first sector, green in sector three. So this is perhaps, of course, to be a new fastest lap of the race. What he doesn't need is uh, Nick Moss in the optimum uh, McLaren getting in his way. And that's exactly what happens through Luffield corner. That will have cost Sandy Mitchell quite a bit of time. He needs to clear the McLaren quickly. But of course, off the corner, they're both very evenly matched. Both GT3 cars. Mitchell almost pushing him down the start finish straight. There goes Kirkhofer. He's at the far end of the pit lane. And I reckon the McLaren might just stay in front here. Through Cops goes Mitchell. Mitchell, look up the road, he's past Nick Moss, and there in the distance, I think, is a dark blob, which was, no, he's, he's ahead, he's jumped him just about by literally a car length or so, it is Sandy Mitchell in front of Marwin Kirkhofer, that could not have been closer. But now the battle is on for 35 minutes, the mighty Mitchell leads Marvin Kirkhofer, and so on to Hangar Straight they go, uh, so again, good, good efforts, but you see how that situation is closed by uh, the efforts of Marvin Kirkhofer, so down they come to Stowe Corner. Let's have a quick bit of news from the pits before we get into this lead battle. Brent? Yeah, thanks, David. I was just talking to Morgan Tilbrook at Enduro Motorsport about what's going on with their car. Apparently the fire extinguisher went off in the pits and then they couldn't restart the car. Total loss of power. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Right, OK, thanks for that. So we were peering in, trying to work it out, but the fire extinguisher going off, uh, they don't just go off at will. It, it, somebody might have just tucked something in error, but thanks for the news. Big, big disappointment for a car that ran really well all day. Right, there is the leader. Second is behind. Remember, Sandy Mitchell is a little bit more up to speed on this set of tyres. Everything is performing for him. It might take Marvin Kirko for a lap, 
but this is going to be a really good way to end the race. 34 minutes between two styles of GT racing and in two different brands. Yeah, Lamborghini ahead of McLaren then for the time being. This is for fifth place on the road, but that already started to change actually because the 75 car is back on the road now having made its latest pit stop. The same is true actually uh, of the Assetto Motorsport Bentley, which is now in the pit lane for the third and final time. Mark Sansom handing back over to Will Tregertha. There is Ross Wiley. Uh, who will be getting back into the, uh, no, getting out of the Beluga Racing Porsche that was currently running second, no, third place uh, in the GT4 category. This, the car that leads in GT4, it leads by 10.7 seconds, having made its second pit stop, but the car behind uh, was, at the time, the number 90 car, which also is in for its final stop. So a flurry of activity in GT4. There is the 90 car being serviced for the last time in the race then. So Will Burns... We'll be getting out, handing over to Jack Brown. And uh, yes, that car, again, hasn't led for an awfully long time. But I've got a funny feeling it might be once all of these pit stops are said and done. But of course, for a silver car, add 14 seconds to it. So each time a silver pit stop happens, it helps Darren Turner and Matt Topham because their Pro-Am entry, which saves three times 14 seconds over the course of the race, gets back into the equation as there is 51. Matty Graham is getting set to go back out is he not because Ross Wiley brought it in so that should be his last stint done and dusted and we're getting towards the last half an hour of what is shaping up nicely all the time there is Flick Haig then back at the wheel of number 75 so that car uh, still has another pit stop to do they've got to get Johnny Adam back into it and so now you need to maximize Johnny's drive time. So therefore, with respect, minimize Flick Haig's time. It could be only a handful of laps. And as soon as Johnny Adam has got his breath back and the clock allows, put him back in the car to go to the end. But two Cs, again, as you have to in this race, playing around with the strategy and trying to haul the car up the order based on that alone. Yeah, and it's amazing. All of these different teams, all of them having slightly differing strategies. And yet at the moment, uh, we've got a second separating the two cars that we anticipate uh, will be fighting for the race victory come the end of it. But there are other cars that may well factor into that as well. So Flick Haig back out on track then. Two pit stops done. She rejoins in second place. So still ahead of those that have made their full quota of three regulation stops, of course. She is 15 and a half seconds behind Nick Moss, who now um, re-inherits the race lead in GT3. Now, it doesn't seem like that long ago that the Academy Mustang was in the pit lane. So again, this is uh, Marco Signoretti getting out to hand over to Matt Cowley, who's perhaps been a fraction quicker. Got a lot to choose between their pace, it must be said, but Matt perhaps slightly the quicker of the two. Get him in for the last half hour and see if they could also get into that podium fight. So the Academy Mustang sits waiting in the pit lane on track. Uh, Sandy Mitchell is waiting for no one because he's building yes. this margin over Kirchhoff. A one and a half seconds now, it's creeping up, but as we made the point earlier on, the pros tend to be lapping at much the same pace as each other. If Kirchhoff is going to take any time out of Mitchell, he may have to rely on traffic getting in the way for the Lamborghini, because right now there's not much to choose between their pace. Now that's Flick Haig in the two C's number 75 Mercedes. Johnny Adams' stint was an hour and 16 minutes and a few seconds, which therefore backdating that for the maximum you can do gives him a whisker under 24 minutes of the right. race remaining. So I reckon that Flick Hay can do another six minutes and a bit, give or take, uh, pit, and then Johnny Adam do it for the last 24 minutes, just under 24 minutes of the race of the chequered flag. Yes, okay, I'm glad you worked that out, David. Uh, yes, so uh, we expect this car in there, maybe uh, in the next five, six minutes or so, and uh, Flick Hay, uh, yeah, will have enjoyed a longer stint earlier on in the race, of course, which is what's allowed this. So you uh, take the pain, if you like, early on. Again, I don't like wording it like that, but you uh, lose ground early on to then gain it back towards the end. And uh, that, I'm sure, is a strategy that Flick will be very much on board with if it proves successful uh, come the end of the day. Off into Abbey Corner she goes. And, uh, I mean, her pace isn't bad, actually, to nope. be fair. Right. Uh, Flick Haig, uh, well, two minute two last time, but that was a first flying lap of the race for her. GT4, Matt Topham currently in the lead of the class as Adam Ballon threads his way past number 51 that's now gone back to Matty Graham. Uh, so you've got Matt Topham ahead of Tom Rawlings at the moment. And there, coming through, is the race leader with still 29 and three quarter minutes of the race to go. It's flown by, hasn't it, the time? Yes. So Adam Ballon goes, sorry, Sandy Mitchell goes by. One second to the good over Marking, Marvin Kirkhofer there. He's done the fastest lap of the race. That was set in his earlier stint. 
but for the moment, the traffic not really helping him get onto the back of the Barwell Lamborghini. A good news for Flick Hay, she may get to lead some laps in this fairly brief final stint of hers because Nick Moss has just pitted from the race lead uh, in the Optimum McLaren. So uh, remember, Flick was only about 15 seconds or so behind, and in fact, she is about to come through Woodcote Corner to take over the lead. There is the uh, Optimum cast. This is Joe Osborne getting in again, the final um, pit stop this is for the McLaren. So they are on, again, a slightly different strategy, really, to uh, the... Well, no, I suppose a similar strategy, in a way, to the Mercedes of uh, two Cs. We expect Flick Hague in within the next five minutes or so. And presumably she'll drop back behind, or Johnny Adam will rejoin, behind this uh, orange and blue McLaren. Uh, Optimum making a welcome return mm. to the Intelligent Blue British GT Championship this weekend. And uh, a top five finish, certainly on the cards. In GT4, Matt Topham has just come into the pit lane to serve his final stop in the Aston Martin that leads and does not have any extra time to serve there. So they come in as the leaders. That looks pretty promising, does it not, for Matt Topham and Darren Turner? Whereas Sandy Mitchell is going to have to make this car a little bit wider, I fear. Marvin Kirchhofer is almost there. Fantastic way to end three hours of drama, isn't it, with the top two separated by virtually nothing at all. Uh, of course, the order shuffles around them as the last pit stops are served. We've got Flick Haig due in in about four minutes. We've got John Ferguson due in to give way to Jamie Caroline as well. And Sandy Mitchell then running fourth on the road, but the best of the triple stoppers right now comes down through Brooklands. There behind is Marvin Kirkhofer, and 28 is ready to go. And that car's had a good, solid afternoon as well, hasn't it? Having largely steered clear of all the dramas, and Joe Osborne is ready to go shortly. Mind you, I just said something very similar about Team Brit, and then they got a penalty, so I'm, uh, I'm going to stop saying things like that about teams. So, uh, yes, yeah, so far, though, uh, you're absolutely right. Good day for Optimum. Through, though, goes the uh, what we anticipate to be lead battle come the end of the day, uh, which is only 27 and a half minutes uh, away now, the end of this enthralling third round of the 2022 Intelligent Money British GT Championship, the Silverstone 500, and again, traffic giveth, and then traffic immediately taketh away, because as Kirk has been catching Mitchell over the last few laps. He then catches the uh, Century Motorsport GT4 BMW in the wrong place. And just like that, a second or more is lost. Down hanger straight, clock ticks on down, 27 minutes to go. And you think, yeah, well, 27 minutes, that's a reasonable amount of time. But on a three mile lap like this, there's not a lot of uh, laps to be crammed into 27 minutes. Into the pit lane comes John Ferguson now to give way to Jamie Caroline for the last stint. It means now that Flick Haig leads, but has got just under three minutes, I reckon. So a couple more laps for Flick before she gives way to Johnny Adam. And we'll see where that car feeds in for the last part of the race. Because although, obviously, we're talking about the lead battle, there will be other battles that need to shake out over the last few laps. And some are in GT4 here, such as number nine, uh, that was Tom Rawlings that brought it in, so Chris Salkelt should take over that car as its last pit stop is served. Yes, indeed, uh, last year it was the second place battle that attracted all of the attention, really, between the uh, Barwell cars, wasn't it? So, uh, yeah, even if the race win is settled, which is far from settled, by the way, uh, you can anticipate there'll be lots of battling going right down to the wire. Tom Rawlings then assisting with the uh, final driver change here for Harriet's Chariot, the number nine century BMW. Uh, both of the Century cars have been in the mix all day, really, within GT4. Uh, that car was running second in class when it came into the pit stops. This car, though, of Matty Graham, has completed all three of its regulation pit stops. So, again, it's only a few corners away from the end of this lap and, therefore, only a few corners away from seeing where it comes out in relation to some of the others around it. Although Turner, I notice, has just left the pit lane already. So Darren Turner will, indeed, it would seem, retain that class lead. Yeah, and that's the three lots of 14 seconds saved over the course of the race that now really pay dividends for that car. Number 90 BMW goes through. So this is still in the mix, isn't it? Jack Brown at the wheel of it now. Number nine has yet to go. And actually, although number 42 Audi got rid of its third stop quite a while ago, it's a long way down. It seems to have lost a massive chunk of time in that third stint. So they put Richard Williams in relatively early. That might not have been the best solution. But having said that, there are more pit stops to bring it back up the order. It's gone over the timing line and it is getting back into the mix. So Seddon Fielding is 22nd overall. And in terms of GT4, that means he is now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7th. And there are more places to be gained. Yeah, I think a top five is doable, but they'll be disappointed, no doubt. I mean, when you qualify on pole by a second and a half, fifth place isn't really what you want to be fighting for uh, come the end of the race, is it? But, no, very true. Uh, you never know. Things could happen. We had a very dramatic first half hour of the race. There's nothing to say the final half an hour uh, won't also throw a few surprises our way. There is... Uh, 
the Darren Turner driven uh, Newbridge Motorsport Aston Martin. Then the final stop completed for the leading GT4 car, which is overtaken once again uh, by uh, the third placed GT3 car of Sandy Mitchell. Uh, but it may now be up to second place because the two, the uh, Ram Racing number 15 car has just made its third and final stop. So Flick Haig leads but owes us a stop and Sandy Mitchell should now inherit second place with Marvin Kirkhofer keeping this gap pegged at nothing more than a second and a half at any point. So uh, again, all he needs is a back marker to not make itself uh, all that useful uh, yeah. to uh, the uh, Lamborghini ahead and that second and a half can vanish quickly. Oh, it can indeed. Absolutely. Uh, equally, the balance of performance means that it's incredibly hard to yes. make up that last few tenths. Uh, because the cars, in theory, especially with the pros behind the wheel, are running at a, a, a comparable pace. And the Lamborghini and the McLaren, in terms of shape, in terms of drivetrain, very similar over the timing line than they have gone. And the gap between Mitchell and Kirkhofer is now one second. Flick Haig still ahead, but a pit stop is due for number 75 Mercedes, because you're now into Johnny Adams' allowable drive time to the end. I'd be surprised if she's not in this time then. It, yeah. I would, in fact, she's in the final sector now, so we'll keep an eye out the window as we watch on the screens. She's coming uh, in. Sandy Mitchell. Yes, See the car slowing right down at Lafayette. There it is, goes right into the pit lane. So, yeah, good prediction. In she comes. So you can see what the team are trying to do. Keep Johnny Adam in for as long as possible. And the co-drivers, to an extent, accept that. You know, they're not proud about the amount of driving they do. They want the result. Yeah, exactly. When they're lifting that uh, RAC trophy at the end of the day, they don't really care how many laps they did in the race. No. Uh, just the fact that they managed to win the Silverstone 500. So uh, Flick Hay, whoops, <laughs> a little bit too eager on the way into the pit lane, knocks over the pit board. That's all right, though. No harm done. And Flicks it out of the way, you mean? You could say that. Yeah. You really could say that, yes. So uh, Flick A gets out of the car and uh, Johnny Adam in for the final stint. There, the gap between the Barwell car and the Garage 59. Still about a second or so. Trouble is, for Johnny Adam, this is still a two minutes, 15 second pit stop. Yeah. So, you know, it's another lap gone. Uh, even though he's incredibly quick, as we know, the car will drop down just because of the regulations for the pit stops. It's the same for everybody. It's not that they're being singled out, but two minutes and 15 seconds is a lap and a bit. So the car will certainly drop away behind these two. And Sandy Mitchell, am I being a bit optimistic when I say, it looks like he's got the answer to what Marvin Kirchhofer is throwing at him because he's, he's being able to maintain that gap, modest as it might be, but he's not looking as though he's under the, the huge amounts of pressure that are causing mistakes to be made and, and the gap He's remaining pretty constant. I think he's got this taped. And they've had no traffic on this lap. So in a way, this was the first genuine clear yeah. lap where traffic absolutely wasn't playing a, a part in the, the lap times. And you're right. Well, let's see. Mitchell does a 58.9. Kirkhoff for a 58.7. No, you're not right. Kirkhoff was about a tenth faster in the end. Uh, but yes, very minimal indeed. And now they do start to uh, negotiate some of the GT4 cars. They've gone through. Meanwhile, Johnny Adam has not yet left the pit lane. Uh, so, yeah, you can see there, they're already down at Maggots and Beckett's, and still the 2C's car hasn't left its pit box. Jamie Caroline has taken over number 15, but was under on the pit stop by about half a second. So the team manager of number 15 is going to race control, and also the team manager of 56, which is the Team Parker GT4 Cayman, is going to race control. Well, that had a penalty very, very early on in the race. That was the first car to serve any sort of penalty. But the Ferguson Caroline Ram Racing penalty if there's one coming for being short on the pit stop is rather more serious because that car was in seventh place yes which is actually further down than i thought it would be because uh, it always seemed to be uh, in and around the top five until that point but again now only now with 20 minutes to go do we finally see exactly uh, how the strategy is going to play out so it is johnny uh, it is sandy mitchell that leads the way uh, by eight tenths of a second at the start of the lap over marvin kirkhofer in second place there is joe osborne now is joe osborne ahead or behind um Johnny Adam, that's the next question. He's 32 seconds behind the Mitchell Kirkhofer battle, uh, but Joe Osborne, I think, yes, he is. Uh, yes, he is into third, isn't he? In fact, if I, if you look at the timing tower, Dahl in his fourth, nearly fifth, so Adam there is only sixth place. So Joe Osborne at the moment on course for a podium, and he enjoys at the moment a 3.4 second lead over James Dawlin, who on the previous lap, he was quicker than. And that's kind of really where that 75 Mercedes ought to be because it was sort of bottom end of the top 10 earlier. This is the race leader, uh, which is Adam Ballon, Sandy Mitchell's car, Sandy Mitchell at the wheel of it. Marvin Kirchhofer in for Alexander West is second. So these, with 20 minutes to go, are the two leading cars over the line now. Breaking the beam, Sandy Mitchell then. He starts lap 77, 11 tenths to the good. He's crept it up a little bit. The gap has just stretched marginally. So that's second, Marvin Kirchhofer, 
The fast German driver goes through Cop's corner. Right, and then you wait and you wait and you wait because there's still not been a third place car over the timing line. This illustrates the pace that Barwell and Garage 59 have had in this race uh, and how good the uh, speed has been. Admittedly, they did break away early on uh, with uh, avoiding dramas down at Club Corner, but even so, they are well clear of, in third place there, the McLaren of Joe Osborne, and that is 32 seconds behind them in third place. So second to third is 32 seconds. In fourth place is James Dorlin in the red line Lamborghini. He is 4.3 seconds behind the McLaren and his last lap was a fraction slower. So it might not be a podium. There is James Dorlin just going up towards Beckett's. Uh, but the Lamborghini that started, there it is, fourth place car on the front row of the grid. Uh, fourth is still a really good effort, especially given that it made an extra pit stop for that stop go penalty early on in the race. Yeah, of those that have had troubles, they have done the best uh, to recover, haven't they? They're fourth, and then you could argue the uh, Neary's as well after their lap one contact. They're in fifth position, but of course, they uh, did not receive an on track penalty for that as that's being investigated post race. So, uh, yeah, really good effort this from Redline Racing. Uh, it may not be the win that they were hoping for, but, uh, you know, you spoke to them on the grid and they were really happy with the front row position. I think they'll be almost as happy if they can bring this home in fourth place. They are lapping comparably to this car, Sam Neary, who runs in fifth position, but 8.9 seconds is the deficit for Sam to try and overcome, and that's going to be hard to do over just 18 minutes left in the race. There then is Johnny Adam in sixth position, so the gap between Neary and Adam registered at five and a half seconds at the start of the lap but Johnny actually seven tenths slower than Neary in the first sector. He pulls a tenth of that back uh, with a green personal best sector two. Uh, but Johnny Adam at the moment uh, is, uh, again, going to be hard pushed, I think, to improve upon sixth position. The one that arguably is most likely to change is the one that matters most, the one at the front of the field, because Marvin Kirkhofer, again, three tenths quicker than Mitchell that time. The lead gap back down under a second. He's certainly not giving up. Now, that's Jamie Caroline, uh, as I say, who I rather fear is heading for the... Uh, pit lane again here because that car was under briefly like half a second under on its last pit stop which is bad bad news because it's been running pretty well and John Ferguson actually has developed hasn't he nicely this year he had yeah. a lot of bad luck in his GT4 uh, history in the Supra but going nicely here now let's look at GT4 for a moment because that currently is being led by uh, 27, Darren Turner. Stop go penalty has been issued to car 15 for a short pit stop. Stop go penalty, 15. Number 15, you hear, being given a stop go penalty for a short pit stop. That's what we've been talking about looking at the data on our screen. So, this is the leading car in GT4, the less powerful, the less aero uh, dependent GT style of cars. The, not quite entry level as such, but. Uh, more accessible GT class and it's Darren Turner leading from this car by 22.7 seconds Jack Brown in second place now he's going to win the silver part of GT4 but uh, Darren Turner well up the road and as we've been saying because the Pro-Am cars don't have to make longer pit stops under the regulations compared to the silver cup cars that really pays dividends late race uh, yeah ooh, pushing on there through the uh, Magnus Beckett Chapel sequence uh, then uh, there's a bit of a gap back about a 10 or 11 seconds back then uh, to the third place GT4 car there the Porsche of Matty Graham but the third place we could have a bit of a fight on our hands because Senan Fielding is only two seconds behind him and on the previous lap was two and a half seconds faster so the Porsche there in the background is the uh, Toyota which is a lap down but up the inside of it look is Senan Fielding in the Stella Motorsport Audi so they could still salvage a podium finish from this race which all things considered would not be a terrible result actually they've clearly got the speed they showed that in qualifying 15 and three quarter minutes to do it i think it's doable go along with that center fielding is certainly pushing on as the cars now come once more down to the end of vale it was so so good as you were saying in the qualifying sessions uh, plural yesterday both of them topped their respective elements for the grid that was based on the combined times of the two drivers along Lewis Hamilton straight then now comes the Stella Motorsport Audi and chasing the Porsche of Matty Graham which at the start of this lap was two seconds up the road and in the first sector actually the Porsche was quicker but in the second sector the Audi was quicker trouble is with 15 minutes to go and it's good for us to get to the point where yes you can catch but when you get behind the car again because they're quite evenly matched it's hard to get past so Senan Fielding is doing, if you like, the easy bit now, relatively, which is catching, but getting past that Porsche could be really, really tough indeed. Less than 15 minutes to go, and Sandy Mitchell still leads the way. Uh, yes, he does. By now, back over one second. They are trading lap times here. A tenth or so is taken off the advantage by Kirkhofer, and then Sandy Mitchell retaliates on the next lap and 
gets it back up again. Sandy Mitchell in the car that started on pole position. I said earlier on, pole position historically has been the place to start. I know that sounds like a fairly obvious thing to say, but uh, three times in the last 10 years, the pole sitting GT3 car in this race has taken the victory. The lowest car that a Silverstone 500. Has a 10 second stop go penalty, a refueling irregularity. Okay, another 10 second stop go penalty there then for the 56. Uh, sorry, no, sorry, not for the 56. That was uh, one of the GT4 cars with a 10 second stop go penalty. Uh, it was, uh, yes, car 56. Excuse yeah, me. the Orson Hopkins came. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, second penalty of the race, isn't it, that one? Uh, 56 is the Janetta. Oh, it? sorry, Freddie so, Tomlinson yes. and uh, Joe Wheeling, quite yes. right. Yeah, yeah, 65 is the Cayman. Yes, so the Janetta gets a penalty now also. It's easier to tell you who's not had penalties, I know, yes. isn't it, out of all of this? <laughs> that's been one of those days, oh, that's not wrong. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, to complete the point I was uh, making there, the uh, uh, the lowest that a Silverstone 500 winner uh, has ever started the race is 10th on the grid, and it was Barbar Motorsport who did it uh, back in 2016. Guess where Garage 59 started this race? They started 10th, so uh, one trend is going to come true here, whether it be the pole sitting trend or starting at the back of the uh, top 10, but still, I wouldn't put my money on either one of these. It, it could still go either way. Yeah, you saw Adam Ballon a moment ago in the pit garage watching on. Marvin Kirchhoff are having another go now. Uh, quite often you'll see drivers have a push. They can't do it, so they lift for a lap or two. Just let the tyres have a breather and the gap opens up and then they push again. And if uh, Kirchhoff's team are on their toes and Garage 59, the Alexander West, Andrew Kokodi, Chris Goodwin owned team, they are on their toes. Uh, they'll be saying, right, there's traffic up the road now. So push, 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 get back up with the leading car. See what you can do, especially as there, look, you've got the... the McLaren lapping the GT4 Mustang of Matt Cowley. Sandy Mitchell goes through, and Marvin Kirchhoff will be trying to strike now while there are these other cars around, all of which, even if it's only for a split second, serve to distract the driver lapping them. Absolutely. Through Village, up towards the uh, breaking zone at Village, in fact, we go through the tight right-hander. Nail-biting finish here. It is Barwell holding off Garage 59, and down at the Garage 59 garage with Alexander West, that uh, is Bryn Lucas. Well, Alexander, you know, you're fighting really hard, aren't you, there, out on track, and you've got so much to do, and yet, is there anything that you can do? Can Marvin, you know, get past Sandy at the end? I mean, Sandy is a very experienced and extremely quick driver, so um, we were a little bit unlucky with coming out a second or so behind him out of the pits, but, no, um, look, we're very happy. It, it's great to be here. I think it is a great event. Um, the weather's been good, and I think we managed to unlock some performance in the car from qualifying, which was disappointing yesterday, so the race pace today has been really, really good. I think the guys at Garage 59 have done a fantastic job, so. But at this stage here, I mean, I'm sure if you were told yesterday at this point you'd be in second place and pushing for first, you'd be more than happy to take it, but now you are. Would you take second or is first the only place? Well, actually, it's funny. We said that earlier. Yesterday, yes, I would have taken second. Now you're one second behind the first place, so yes, of course you want to win. If you would have been 20 seconds behind, it would have been a different story, but yeah, we will, we will see what what Marvin can do, but as I said, Sandy is a really experienced and really, really quick driver. It's only 10 minutes to go, so good luck. Yeah. Thank you. So the Swedish driver, Alexander West, who's a, a, a GT expert these days, races in endurance, in sprint races, and uh, has clearly enjoyed himself here. Now, uh, not enjoying himself quite so much aboard 51 Beluga Porsche is Matty Graham, because he's now got, right on his tail, the Audi 7 feeling at the wheel of it. Now, remember that this is for second in silver in GT4 and for third in GT4 overall. So it's an important battle. Uh, yes, it is. And it makes its way into the braking zone at Village now, having caught Senan Fielding uh, uh, now has the hard job to do. He's caught the Porsche, uh, but he needs to now find a way past it. Both cars that will generate their lap time in similar ways. You'd imagine they will both excel at similar parts of the racetrack. And so uh, finding that edge to get through is not going to be easy, especially if Matty Graham continues to defend. And as someone who knows uh, what one make racing is like, he will know his racecraft. He knows where to position the car. Send and fielding an optimistic. Look, you can take that early turn in at uh, uh, Brooklyn just to try and distract the car ahead. But Graham knew what was going on there. And uh, in the end, manages to hang on. He's a bit squirrely off the field, though. This is Fielding's chance. Carries the momentum off the corner. Tries desperately to get to the inside line. Graham has it covered and will now surely have to defend again down towards Cop's corner. Fielding on the attack. Not sure he can defend for 10 more minutes, though, as they head into Cop's corner. Senna Fielding in the Audi right there on the tail of the Cayman. He's going to try and tighten the line coming out of Cop's, but he rattles up the kerb. And the race leaders, the overall race leaders, have just gone through. And that gap has come right down to three tenths of a second. So it's game on for uh, the 
second place in silver in GT4, but not that far behind on the road. The overall race leaders are separated by next to nothing at all now. So great fight going on here onto Hangar Straight. And of course, they're being caught by the overall race leaders. There they are in the background in the Beckett's S's. It's green ahead of blue, which means it's still Mitchell ahead of Kirkhofer. Senn and Fielding tries to line up for a move, but look how close the GT3 cars are in the background. Senn and Fielding tries to go right round the outside of the Porsche there. This, remember, is for position. Can't do it, gets sideways, runs wide up the kerb, slots back in behind. Yes, he does, down to the end of Vale. Great stuff, this. Yeah, on the brakes, into the left-hander. Graham is driving around the inside of the track here, just to try and keep the place, almost gets run into there. So slow was he uh, through the transition from the left to the right at club. This for the overall race lead, though. Sandy Mitchell trying to become the first driver ever to win uh, more than one Silverstone 500. This would be a really great achievement. Of course, Barwell have won it before, but with different driver combinations. Sandy Mitchell trying to uh, add to his win for Barwell with Rob Collard two years ago in what was a championship winning drive in the end, the final round of the 2020 championship. And now he is just a few laps away, but only a few car lengths clear of Kirkover. Still very similar story as well here in the 5 for 3rd in GT4. And look at this, bearing down on that GT4 fight, it remains Mitchell ahead of Kirkhofer but I said sometimes the driver drops back and then has a push. Well, Marvin Kirchhofer has certainly pushed and is almost on the back of Sandy Mitchell, whose heart must sink now because, look, he's got to get through this traffic. And, of course, they're battling for position as well. So Senn and Fielding's aim isn't to get out of the way. It's to get past that Porsche. So Sandy Mitchell now has got to time this to absolute perfection. Make sure the back markers have seen and then commit to the line. Get the move done into Woodcut. They all pour. The blue flags do wave. And round the outside of the traffic goes Sandy Mitchell. He's got one, he's got two, he's got past both back markers. Alexander West watching on. There's nothing in a straight line that Marvin Kirchhofer can do. And it's still three tenths of a second. Adam Ballon can barely breathe. <laughs> Adam Ballon watching on nervously in the garage then. Yes, seven and a half <laughs> minutes to go through Maggots and Beckett in the background. I think, yeah, uh, the centre fielder was almost alongside Matty Graham. Couldn't quite ma make that one work. Bit of a slide there for Mitchell, and you can see that that costs him speed through Chapel onto the hangar straight. They negotiate the GT4 paddock McLaren. This, I would argue, though, is the closest that Marvin Kirkhoff has been at this part of the circuit, down towards Stoke Corner. This is a prime overtaking opportunity. Mitchell will have to defend the inside line, which he does. Might that now compromise his exit speed? The next braking zone down at the veil is also a good place to overtake. The teams can barely watch. We want to see what's going on into the braking zone. It is still Mitchell hanging on just about. But right now, the slightest misstep here for Mitchell will surely cost him the lead. Absolutely. And this is the toughest that he's going to face all day. The pressure is intense. It's not only because he's got a car bearing down on him, but it's right at the end of the race. And he's got a co-driver's hopes to uphold as well in all of this. And he's got traffic all around him. If Sandy Mitchell can come through this without making a tiny slip, he'll have done remarkably well. Because again, there are back markers. Again, Kirkhofer sticks his nose up the inside as best he can. But anything he tries, it's repelled by Sandy Mitchell. This is why you can see Lamborghini took a huge interest in Sandy. It is why he's so well regarded in GT3 racing. But this is an absolutely standout drive. And standout driving there from Phil Keane as well. Pulls right out of the way in the lapped WPI Motorsport Lamborghini. Doesn't just get out of the way of the other Lamborghini either. Let's yeah, Kirk yeah, off a go right. too. Doesn't interfere at all with the fight. That is why Phil Keane is a class act. He pulled right out of the way and now he'll sit. He might well fill the mirrors now of Marvin Kirkhoff as McLaren, just uh, on the off chance it distracts him a little bit, but he wasn't going to actively get in the way, and that is really heads up driving. We're just with six minutes to go, and wondering whether we're going to get three, four more laps out of this. There go the race leaders through. They turn half a second between the top two as they round Cox corner. But yes, we're into, as I say, the last five and a half minutes now, as behind the leaders overall in GT4, Senn Fielding has made his move against Matty Graham. So that puts the Audi second in silver in GT4. Yeah, he did that at Luffield. I think he'd been around the outside of Brooklands and then got to the inside at Luffield and made the move. So uh, Stella Motorsport back into a podium place within GT4. The overall lead gap goes out slightly right. Surely there can't be more action out on track. I can't handle any more. Five and a quarter minutes to go. And yes, sure enough, this is a battle for fifth place. Sam Neary in the Team Abba Racing Mercedes. Johnny Adam in the Two Seas Motorsports Mercedes. Nose to tail for a spot inside the top five. And Johnny Adam then inching up onto the tail of the Abba Racing car. Look how much they shorten the line through Woodcote. Way the wrong side of the kerb on the inside of the road there. But every fraction of a second counts, doesn't it? As the leaders now come towards Club Corner in the first sector of this lap, Sandy Mitchell quicker by a couple of tenths of a second. 
Exit Club. He's quicker by just under one tenth of a second. So again, it's the slightest advantage in the direction of the Lamborghini on this 84th lap of the race. As Adam Ballon nervously looks on, we've seen Alexander West's reaction. It matters less in a way to Alexander because they're not here to score points. They're not really in it for the championship. But Adam Ballon most definitely is. Yes, and if this were any other race, I would say that uh, that uh, Sandy Mitchell may not race Kirk over too hard, given the fact that whether Mitchell and Ballon finish first or second in this race, it matters not. They will still take the maximum 37 and a half points provisionally pending this uh, uh, appeal ongoing of course but uh, it, it, since this is the Silverstone 500 you want the win you don't yeah, want second good. place in the points for the win you want that RAC trophy so uh, yeah regardless of whether that's a race by race entry filling his mirrors Mitchell ain't gonna get out of the way no you want to be remembered as the winners don't you so there they turn into Abbey and up now through the left of farm so overall, going through, it remains Mitchell from Kirkhofer. Neary versus Adam. It was three tenths at the start of the lap. So we've got time for this lap and one more, I would suggest. Yeah, I think so. Nearly two minutes a lap, about three and a half minutes to go. So uh, yes, this will be the penultimate lap of the race. It's going to be an 86 lapper then, uh, this Silverstone 500. How many times are we going to see this race go right down to the wire? We've seen it so many years. Last year dominated by two Cs, but almost every other one of these races, certainly that I've done, yeah. it has always come down to a final few lap shootout between at least two cars at the front. And of course, we've seen it decided by traffic in the past. Johnny Adam taken out a few years ago uh, after contact whilst leading the race. So it ain't over until you see that chequered flag. That's right. It was the epic Johnny Adam Callum McLeod yeah. battle, wasn't it, that was resolved at Beckett. Johnny committed to get past a back marker. It didn't work. Contact, a spin. And there, the leaders come out of club corner. So with one more lap provisionally to run at the end of this, Andy Mitchell still looks like he's just about got the edge, but it's the, it's the narrowest of margins. It really is, and it has been so for all of this stint. Whatever Barwell did him at the end of this race, Sandy would have deserved it because the pressure, the concentration levels, to be added absolutely to your intense. Race time. 76 uh, team manager being told to phone the uh, race director to discuss something that's happened to them in uh, recent memory, but that doesn't trouble the race leaders who make their way out of Aintree. Now, that car ahead is possibly the last of the lapped cars that these two will have to negotiate. It is the car that's leading uh, in the GT4 category, Newbridge Motorsports' Darren Turner, and it looks like history is going to repeat itself because 12 months ago, it was Stella Motorsport on the GT4 pole position, but it was Newbridge Motorsport that took top honours in the race. We had Stella on pole after qualifying yesterday, and now with a lap to go, it's Newbridge Motorsport out in front in GT4. Through goes the overall race leader, Sandy Mitchell. And this time, I think the gap is a fraction over one second. No, it's a point over. They set identical lap time. Sandy Mitchell and Marvin Kirk after the penultimate lap of the race. And to the thousand, they can't be split. So last lap and the gap is eight tenths of a second. It's really Sandy Mitchell's race to lose, isn't it now? He's got just about enough in hand. He's only got small hands. This is the problem, you see. It's a small gap. But joking apart, he's done an absolutely outstanding job. And the Flying Scotsman leads onto the last lap of the race. And Sandy Mitchell then, as long as he doesn't make a tiny error, the diminutive Scotsman is on target for a win for him, for Adam Ballam. And then the gap down by 68 thousandths a couple of laps ago. And then last time through, they match the lap time to a thousandth of a second. It's going to be a great result, this, if it hangs together for Adam Ballon, for Sandy Mitchell, but also for Barwell Motorsport, that's had a really tough start to its championship year. Yeah, through Vale, through Club, half a lap to go. And uh, are Barwell going to do it and get uh, their second victory in this race in three years? Their third in the last ten, but Sandy Mitchell second, and that would be record breaking he will officially become the first driver to win more than one silverstone 500 but about 10 or 15 seconds later darren turner and matt top will also have won their second silverstone 500 in the gt4 category second in a row as well after a brilliant effort here last year right then into village in the loop Kirk Offer just not quite close enough at that crucial part of the circuit. The run through Aintree down the Wellington Strait. One last lapped car to be negotiated. And it's the 23R racing Aston Martin. They're going to catch it through the final couple of corners. This is Kirk Offer's final opportunity. Mitchell delayed through Brooklands. Watch for the McLaren. Up the inside goes Mitchell. Surely that's job done. He slides past the Aston Martin. Out of Luffield corner comes Sandy Mitchell in the Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini that he shares with Adam Ballon. It's Sandy Mitchell 
Nigel second. It's Adam Ballon's first win in the Silverstone 500, only just by half a second at the flag. It is Barwell Motorsport that take the race victory, and it's the biggest one of the year for them, that is for sure. Marvin Kirkhoffer comes home in second, and in GT4, it is also a second Silverstone 500 win for Newbridge Motorsports, Darren Turner and Matt Topham, and they win it in back-to-back -back years. Brilliant, brilliant job from them. Uh, flying under the radar a bit there, certainly towards the end of the race, was this car, but it's going to be a really popular third-place finish for Optimum Motorsport. Joe Osborne in the car that he shares with Nick Moss, comes out of Woodcote Corner, sees the chequered flag, and rounds out the podium finishes uh, within the GT3 element of the race. He may have been 35 seconds off the race lead, but given the fact that car started uh, deep in the field, it had to avoid a couple of incidents early on, still a really good result. Second in GT4 goes to the white and yellow number 90 BMW, uh, which comes across the line in the hands of Jack Brown, Will Burns, his co-driver for the race, and then just behind you caught a glimpse of Sen and Fielding, who, after a fighting drive to get bounced back from the spin in the opening few laps for Richard Williams, his co-driver, gets that car onto the podium. <laughs> just like that, three hours go by in an absolute flash. Brilliant, brilliant stuff, as always, from what is always one of the highlights of the year, uh, not just because of the fact that it is the Blue Ribbon event, the Silverstone 500, but because year after year, it just seems to have a habit of producing these nail-biting finishes. And that's precisely uh, what we were treated to here today. Sandy Mitchell, uh, his nerves will be shredded. I'd imagine Adam Ballon has uh, no uh, nails left on his fingers after the final half an hour or so that he spent watching that unfold in the garage. And a half a second winning margin. I'll have to go uh, back through the uh, previous results from earlier years, but I reckon there's a good chance of that being the closest winning margin for this race uh, in its uh, long and storied history. But Sandy Mitchell and Adam Ballon it is who come out on top uh, with Marvin Kirk Arthur and Alexander West second and Joe Osborne and Nick Moss rounding out the top three. As far as some of the other classes go, by the way, well, in GT4, I mentioned that Turner won overall, uh, Turner and Topham won overall. They, of course, also win the Pro-Am element of the race. And there they are, the number 27 car, uh, which takes an overall and class win within GT4. Second place went to that uh, Century BMW of uh, Brown and Burns, and they will win the silver category. And in the end, they finished 29, let's call that 30 seconds adrift of the Newbridge car. But bear in mind, that car, like all of the silver uh, cars in GT4, spent three quarters of a minute longer in the pit lane over the course of the race. That's pretty good going. Marvin Kirkhoffer pulls up alongside Sandy Mitchell. Kirkhoffer will have enjoyed that, uh, perhaps a bit more than Mitchell. A, because he was the driver on the attack, was Kirkhoffer, which is always more fun than defending, uh, and also because he doesn't have to think about a championship, whereas Mitchell and Ballon are very much in this to contend for the title. So a breathless three hours of racing go by in a flash, but after 86 laps, it is victory in the Silverstone 500 in 2022 for Adam Ballon and Sandy Mitchell. Sandy's second victory in this event for Barwell Motorsport. Alexander West and Marvin Kirkhoffer were second for Garage 59, whilst Optimum Motorsport make it two McLarens on the podium with Nick Moss and Joe Osborne doing the honours. Fourth place was a pretty close battle in the end, but a fantastic recovery from an earlier penalty for Redline Racing's Lamborghini of James Dolan and Alex Baliakin, with the Neeries likewise after contact on the opening lap, which will be investigated after the race, but for the time being, Richard and Sam Neary can celebrate the top five finish. Johnny Adam and Flick Haig were sixth in their two-seas motorsport uh, Mercedes with the Bentley of uh, Assetto Motorsport, Wilco Gerber and Mark Sanson in seven. Eight for WPI, not bad from the very back of the GT3 grid, Mike Ligo and Phil Keane. The Proctors for Greystone GT were ninth, and then Paddock Motorsport, Martin Plowman and Andrew Howard on his return to the championship, scoring a point for that team. Then Sky Tampesta Racing, who had multiple penalties, were next ahead of Rocket RJN and the rest of the GT3 field. That, though, is the man of the moment, Sandy Mitchell, taps the roof of his Lamborghini Huracan in celebration and uh, he will be celebrating I'm sure tonight along with the rest of that Barwell team a well-earned and a hard-fought victory in British GT's biggest race of the year the gloves will come off the helmet in good time the first thing he will probably reach for is a bottle of water because it is rather warm here uh, at Silverstone it was quite fresh this morning but then the clouds cleared and oh, that's nice to see. That's uh, Marvin Kirkhofer walking over 
to give the handshake. And there is Adam Ballon, who now gets to celebrate properly with his co-driver. Uh, a really great partnership this is. Two really good drivers. Adam Ballon, these days, one of the more experienced AM drivers on the grid. Sandy Mitchell uh, making the move up from a silver-graded driver a few years ago to now be an out-and-out -out pro, uh, which is absolutely right. I mean, he uh, showed all weekend long that he's one of the fastest drivers in the championship. Barwell, we don't really need to talk about them, do we? We know how good and experienced Barwell are, how much success they've had in British GT, and uh, in recent years in particular with the Lamborghini Huracan program. And uh, they played it perfectly. They were fastest in qualifying, which we said uh, after the qualifying session yesterday wouldn't necessarily guarantee a good result. But uh, if you can back good one lap pace up with uh, strong race pace as well, then uh, that surely is going to make you a, a hard to beat combination. Alexander West wandering over to chat to our race winners there, Alexander West and Marvin Kirchhoff, are both there chatting with uh, the uh, race winners and then Joe Osborne as well. Uh, so we only need Nick Moss and we've got all of our top six drivers um, in one picture, but uh, Joe Osborne who, above all else is a fan of GT racing, a fan of this championship, and I'm sure he will uh, enjoy watching that one back and enjoy being a part of it to finish in third place for Optimum Motorsport. So Lamborghini takes the victory. For all of this talk about the Mercedes perhaps being the dominant car, it's uh, Lamborghini's very much to the forefront. Let's hear then from our Barwell Motorsport winning combo of Sandy Mitchell and Adam Ballon. Well, what do we say? How about that? Last year you did quite well. This year, one better. Let's go to you first of all, Adam. You had to start the race. Yeah, yeah, we've got a great start. I didn't quite see what happened, but people seemed to disappear behind me. And it was like just two of us out there. And uh, we're getting some good lap times. And I was thinking, OK, this is nice. Um, and then when I brought it in, um, handed it over in a good place. So I was just, yeah, really pleased. A little bit of damage on the car when you took it over, Sandy. You kept it clean after that one, but you really had to fight because Marvin, I mean, pushed you all the way. At one point, it was down to three tenths. Yeah, I mean, the McLarens were looking super quick. Um, you know, they, they didn't have a, as good a day yesterday in qualifying. Um, so, yeah, Adam got a great start and went away at the front. Um, but they really started to close us down uh, in the mid part of the race. And then, yeah, it was just a battle to see who was coming out the pit lane first. And, uh, yeah, I think I had three or four laps on the on the new tyres just at the last pit stop. And, uh, yeah, that made all the difference to, to just get ahead. So, yeah, really pleased. And, um, yeah, Silverstone 500 has been good to us in the last uh, two or three years. So, yeah, it's a, a great race to win and we're really proud. How important is it for you, Adam, that you can banish Shorten Park and get straight back to this one here and also win the Silverstone 500? Yeah, no, it's super important. I mean, we had a rubbish weekend at Alton Park, and so, so this is the best way to blow it away, you know, to, to, to start on pole and bring it home. So, brilliant. Congratulations, both. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It's always nice when you can bounce back from a disappointing event uh, to then come and essentially dominate. I mean, they obviously didn't spend the whole race in the race lead because of the different strategies, but of those on their particular strategy, Barwell were almost always at the front. And uh, uh, with the exception of those earlier laps where Alex Maliakim sort of muscled his way past Adam Ballam, uh, they were always at the front of the field. Right then, uh, second place for Garage 59. They're down there as well with Brim. So I said to you a little bit earlier on, Alexander, that yesterday, if you were told that you'd be in second place with 15 minutes to go, you'd have taken it. But then, of course, when you're in that position, you want to win it. Marvin, you had your work cut out there with Sandy ahead. Yeah, it wasn't easy. I mean, the track positioning was, uh, yeah, the main thing. Um, unfortunately, it was super tight on the pit exit. Um, he just had a better run. And yeah, from there, I just tried to get an opportunity with the traffic, but no chance. But anyway, pretty happy with it. After finishing only 10s and qualifying combined, I think we can be pretty happy with the process we made. Do you know, you were saying, or you look very pragmatic, very relaxed, Alexander, watching that one there. I don't think I was as relaxed as you were. No, I wasn't relaxed. I mean, it's, it's nerve wracking. I mean, obviously, Marvin is very, very quick, but so is Sandy. So it's. Uh, but look, um, I think we're very happy with, with the second place. So obviously, you want to win, but I mean, as I said yesterday, I would have taken a second place without any hesitation. So it's great being here. Uh, it's been a fantastic event. So well, you really treated us there. So thank you very much. Well done, second place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, huge well done to Garage 59, and great to have them in the championship as well. They've made the odd appearance in the past, usually here at Silverstone, um, a team that uh, dedicates most of its time now to racing very successfully across Europe. Uh, to have that calibre of team on the British GT grid is great because it proves how tough it is to win in this championship, um, and that's what uh, Barwell were able to do. Right, in GT4, same as it was last year, it's Newbridge Motorsport on top, and Darren Turner and Matt Topham are with Brim. Last year, 
when you won. I thought you can't really do much better than that. So what do you do? You come and do the same thing. I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable, isn't it? I'll start with you, Matt. What a performance from you two out there. I mean, it was unexpected. Um, the start was chaos everywhere, and I, I got in a little bit of space and just said, I'll do what I can, see where we come. And this happened somehow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're starting sixth, Darren. Did you have any expectation that you'd be able to punt your way to the front? <laughs> Not really. I mean, I thought we'd be like uh, maybe in the back end of the podium or something like that. So to be able to come through and uh, challenge for the win at the end was really good. But it was, I think we were probably the only team that had a pretty clean race the whole way through. No dramas in the pit stops, no penalties or extra time. So yeah, it was really nice to be able to go out on that last pit stop and then hear the radio click open and go, you got a 20 second lead. You know, it's not often you get that type of radio call. So for us, it was a, a great weekend with the Aston Martin Fantasy. So uh, yeah, great uh, to sort of bounce back after the first race at Wooden Park, a win and now another win. So yeah, looking forward to the rest of the season now. The Silverstone 500, it's not a bad habit you'll get into, is it, with the wins? That's a habit I like to keep, that's for sure. <laughs> well, well done both. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, really impressive effort for that uh, team, Newbridge Motorsport, who have proven before they know how to win this race. And uh, they won it last year from fourth within the uh, GT4 grid. Uh, this time around, started a couple of places further back, started sixth on the grid uh, and were able to come and take the victory. And it continues this strange little trend that uh, only once in the last 10 years has that race been won from pole position. Right, back down there to our third place GT3 finishers. Do you know what, Joe? You talk at the races a fair bit with us, don't you? And it's nice to see you back behind the wheel. And how about that, a podium? Yeah, really good. Yeah, it's all, all very good practicing what I preach, so uh, otherwise I wouldn't have much credibility when I get back up there and make all the wrong comments. But yeah, it's a one-off for us, so a lot of unknowns. It's been a big weekend for us learning the Pirelli. Uh, and to be honest, getting on the podium, super happy with. Uh, neither of us had any experience uh, on the Pirelli, so Nick's done mega, the team have done mega at Optimum, so literally I'm really, really happy with a podium, surprisingly. Yeah, absolutely, a mega off the start because, you know, you had, you had to work your way through, didn't you? Yeah, no, the, um, the chicane was pretty hairy. There's a sort of pile of Mercedes sort of careering round in all sorts of different directions, so I was lucky to, uh, to not hit any of them. Yeah, well, go and get your trophies, well done. I think that's well earned. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Joe Osborne and uh, Nick Moss then getting third place. Uh, as I said, a little under the radar, given how much focus, rightly so, uh, was given to the overall winners. But a brilliant uh, effort that to get third place finish. In GT4, as I said, Turner and Topham take the win. Jack Brown and Will Burns were second for Century Motorsport, the number 90 car uh, that they share. And uh, they had uh, an all right Alton part, didn't they? They had got a, a second place in race two, but they were only sixth in race one. So again, some much needed points added to their tally, although all of this provisional will wait for the hearing uh, to uh, finally settle the final Alton Park result, which will then have this knock-on effect uh, for Silverstone. But it's, uh, what it did give us, that whole situation, is a pure race with no success penalties. Uh, may the best team win. And uh, it goes to show that uh, although I, I do enjoy these success penalties, don't get me wrong, but uh, even without them, we can uh, provide really close finishes here in the Intelligent Money British GT Championship. Half a second is about as close as they get. So a good uh, crowd assembling underneath the Silverstone um, podium. There is a, a lull in on-track activity uh, for the time being, so they're allowed to fill the pit lane to watch the podium. Uh, on it will be Jack Brown and Will Burns now with Brim. Well, a different teammate for you this season, but a familiar result, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, um, Jack drove a great stint at the end, so we managed to get second place. It was a bit of, um, well, it's been a long three hours, to be honest. Um, we've just been going around and around and just managed to set the pace and um, just... I think we were first, but obviously Turner and his um, pro and parent just managed to um, beat us. So, um, yeah, good job to Jack and uh, good job to Century as well. Jack, what was it like for you out there? I mean, it was a hot day, wasn't it, as well? Yeah, it was a hot day. Just uh, tried to pull myself together. I wasn't around much traffic throughout the, throughout the race, so it's kind of difficult to judge, you know, the pace and stuff. But I think we're doing all right. Uh, Will got off to a great start. Um, I think that's where that's where it will happen really for us. Um, and then, yeah, I think, uh, I think you know, everyone did their job well, really well. So, yeah, thanks to everyone. Nice work. Second place. Congrats. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers guys. Thank you. Century Motorsport really doing what they did so well last year on the way to the GT4 title. And Will Burns knows all about that uh, because uh, it was Will who made up part of the championship winning driver lineup for Century last year alongside Gus Burton. They won three races, but they were only off the podium twice. So if you can't win, 
get yourself into the top three and at least you know the points are going to take care of themselves then so we're almost ready then to get uh, drivers out onto the podium to start celebrating and we start uh, with our overall gt3 top three and in third place optimum motorsport nick moss uh, Joe Osborne, who claimed the third place prize. Second place goes to Garage 59, Alexander West and Marvin Kirkhoffer. But your 2022 Silverstone 500 winners are Sandy Mitchell and Adam Ballon, and they will climb onto the top step of the podium, and uh, they will receive their trophy from Nick Burrows, who is the uh, private client's managing director of Intelligent Money, the series sponsor, and a good opportunity to thank Intelligent Money once again for their continued support of the British GT Championship and title sponsorship uh, in the uh, UK motorsport scene is a fairly rare thing. So great to have Intelligent Money on board again. And the trophies, the very nice Silverstone trophies presented there to our top three, but this ultimately is what it was all about. We have the RAC trophy presented by David Brabham, presented to Adam Ballon and Sandy Mitchell, your 2022 winners of the Silverstone 500. Well, celebrations galore on top of the podium, celebrations that will go on for quite some time. Now, you may have noticed I've been chatting to myself up here for a little while. That's because uh, David Addison has realised all of the action is in pit lane. And so he's headed over there to have a chat uh, with Bryn Lucas. And guys, so much to talk about after what was a thrilling race. Just so much to talk about. I did wonder whether you were just talking to yourself because we know what you like, Andy. You do like to, <laughs> to talk a good race, don't you? And that was a good race, wasn't it, Addison? I can't wait to watch it back. I mean, so much happened in all of that, right from that first lap with the, the carnage, if you like, between the Mercedes, which ultimately led to three completely different stories. One car out on the spot, the Williamson Cottingham car, Ian Loggie and Callum McLeod badly delayed, and now another task is to go and look at the timing screen and see whether they did enough laps to be classified and therefore get any points at all. And yet the nearest Mercedes, despite the damage, soldiered on, and there they were in the top three in their class. You know, the, the thing's just amazing, that car. But what that then did was trigger, of course, the fact that the top two got away and we had a, a different kind of race on the back of that. So there was so much going on. Yeah, we really did. It was an incredible race in GT3. GT4 wasn't bad as well, and they've got their podium happening right now. In, uh, well, in a moment or two, we've got the Silver Am element of GT3 going on at the moment. So third place, you can see there, Assetto Motorsport. That's Mark Sanson uh, alongside Will Tregertha. Second place for the Neeries, uh, son Sam and father Richard. But the race win in the Silver Am uh, element of the GT3 uh, part of the race goes the way of James Dorlin and Alex Maliakin for Redline Racing, uh, despite the penalty early on. Of course, they led briefly after that robust move made by Maliakin against Adam Ballon down at Club Corner, where the two made contact. The black and red Lamborghini went through, but was later given a penalty. They bounced back really well, not only to win the Silver Am class, uh, but to finish fourth overall. I hadn't spotted, to be honest, just how close that was, though. Dorlin and Maliakin finished fourth overall, won the class by half a second over the Neeries. So both the overall and Silver Am element of the GT3 class separated by half a second at the flag. That really is remarkable and some good championship points will go the way uh, of all three of those teams. Assetto Motorsport as well, a real feel-good story. After the trials and tribulations they had at Alton Park, uh, where they crashed the car, Mark Sansom had an off um, in the, the early stages of the weekend. In fact, it was pre-event testing. They had to borrow a car from M Sport, which was actually the old Paddock Motorsport car and uh, managed to uh, come back and race that weekend. Um, not uh, had any track time on the Saturday. And here they are back in their own car and back on the class podium. Uh, right, back down then to uh, Bryn and David uh, as they join the crowd underneath the podium. Yeah, I thought we'd talk GT4 way before the podium. You know, that was planned, by the way. That was entirely planned. But <laughs> Topham and Turner, they're making this a very, very good habit. They are, and what's interesting is given Matt Toppen's relative lack of experience, how quickly they've gelled as a partnership. You know, Darren Turner has been around the block many, many times. You know, he's been there, he's done it, he's got the T-shirts, plural. And yet he has helped Matt Topham develop. They make a really good combination of drivers. Matt doesn't make very many mistakes. Darren just gets in, does the job perfectly. And again, you've had that fascination in that race with that Pro-Am car not needing to serve the 14 seconds each time and how the GT4 race changed after every pit stop, rising, falling. It really has been fascinating. But again, so evenly matched are the cars in GT4 now. It's a really fierce fight. 
You know, Johnny Adam told me last year, you're only as good as your weakest driver is your am. And I say weakest in inverted commas, really. And that is proving to be the case with Toppen and Turner because he doesn't seem to have much of a weakness because he is so consistent. But looking up there and Stellar Motorsport, they came third, but they are looking really solid this season. Yeah, I mean, again, it's one of those slight imponderables. Why has the car suddenly become so good? And they're putting it down to the tyre. That race, I think something went awry about two-thirds of the way through for Stellar Motorsport because they had good pace at the start, good pace at the end, but the car did seem to lose a big chunk of time. So either there was something with the tyre that didn't come alive or maybe they went wrong on the strategy so they had a, a, a slower relatively slower driver in against quicker ones and they couldn't overcome that time again like we say you need to watch your back in a way but so much went on in that race and and the fact that you had the changing fortunes in gt4 just as, like i say it underlines how strong that category is yeah so you can hear the cheering as well as the podiums continue you've got the team brit guys coming out now yeah. i mean they are an inspiration aren't they really when you look at uh, aaron morgan and, and bobby trundley uh, inspiration to so many people yeah, and the team manager had to go to the race director because of a pit stop drama. But we weren't talking about them being slow. We weren't talking about them making mistakes. And when I say them, I mean the team as much as the drivers. So it's a team that's come into racing at the highest level of GT racing and straight away in that GT4 division has, has looked like it belongs here. And, and I mean that in terms of the drivers, the people operating the car, yeah. the whole thing. It's a real asset to the grid and it's great to see them doing so well and up on that podium. Absolutely. Uh, now, I did gloss over the second place in GT4 with a Century car. Will Burns, we're used to seeing him on the podium yeah. last season. And he's got a different teammate with, uh, with Jack, but they are looking like a good unit, aren't they? A solid one. Absolutely. And again, you know, it's a win in the Silver Cup within GT4. So they didn't win GT4 overall, but they got the points that they need in their category. Um, and of course, partly that result is one of the quirks of a three-hour race like this where the silvers have to make those extra pit stops so many times you know over a one-hour race pit stops come once over three hours you've got these mandatory three pit stops so inevitably you're on the back foot a little bit normally that wouldn't matter the, pr the problem if that's the right word as far as the silvers are concerned is that darren and matt are so good we need to now come up with a different word i was saying this earlier for the ams because they're they're not really ams they're um the lower graded driver or the other the other driver in the car you know they, they are not amateurish in any sense no, I completely agree. And actually having many conversations with drivers up and down the grid, the pro drivers, they say exactly the same thing, that when you compare the times, it is so close, really, and the AMs are, are so solid. They say the big difference, really, with your pro driver coming up against an AM, sometimes you're not sure what the AM is going to do. True. But we have been treated, I think, to just a, a, an incredible Silverstone 500 once again. Indeed, you know, we said it at the start of the race, it's a great circuit, it was a great entry, and we had battles all the way through the field, changing fortunes of different cars, it kept us guessing right to the very end, and if at the end of three hours of racing you can have cars covered by, you know, under a second, it's absolutely fantastic stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Now, we've got a lot of people trying to crowd past us right here, so I think from us we should say goodbye from Silverstone, but before we do, up to Andy once again. Yeah, thanks, guys. Well, what a race, what an afternoon of entertainment. We promised you three hours of non-stop action, and I think we delivered on that. There was always something to talk about in that race, be that at the front, back, or the middle of the field. But ultimately, it was Barwell Motorsport that came out on top to claim yet another Silverstone 500 victory, the second for Sandy Mitchell in three years, and the first victory in this Blue Ribbon event for Adam Ballon. The two were able to celebrate after the race, uh, having won it by just half a second brilliant brilliant stuff well uh, if like me you are excited about that race and i'm sure newbridge motorsport were excited as well about their results uh, in gt4 with matt topham and darren turner claiming the race victory in the gt4 element again for the second year in a row actually uh, that they were able to come home victorious in the gt4 category uh, yeah fantastic racing all around in gt4 but yes if like me and the drivers and everyone else here you enjoyed today's racing well don't forget that this is far from the end of the season we're back for another of these three hour epics on the 29th of may that will be the fourth round of the intelligent money british gt championship and the three hours at silverstone will be tough to live up to but donnington park we know has a habit of producing high drama in the british gt championships so and the 29th of may is when we'll be back for round number four of the championship for now though from the silverstone grand prix circuit and the silverstone 500 thank you very much for joining us we will see you again next time